Thank you. So anything we need to attend to before we just dive right in, Anna? Okay, all right. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's uh, committee meeting, Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. This is an information session, not a work or a public hearing session. Uh, you can follow our uh, proceedings on the YouTube channel for this committee by going to the legislative website at maine.gov uh, or legislature.maine.gov and using the drop down to choose HHS. Everything's recorded, so if you can't stay for all the session, but want to hear uh, or go over it later on, you can. Um, so please be patient with us. We have some planned and some unplanned technical glitches happening on a regular basis. And so if you'll just bear with us while we sort those things out, the committee has been good about leaving their phones on mute and um, not putting any content in the chat that isn't related to the flow of the committee's work. Uh, no, no room for content there. We'll be uh, hearing first from um, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Office, and uh, then we'll be hearing from the uh, uh, from Oates uh, with some input from there. And so why don't we then begin by doing introductions, and we'll start with Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sam Zager, uh, honored to represent the district uh, uh, in Portland, District 41, which is uh, a neighborhood steering center, Daring Highlands, Woodford's Corner, Libbytown, parts, uh, Oakdale parts, uh, the Rosemont parts, and the UMaine Law School neighborhood. Thank you, sir. Representative Lemelin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Lemelin. I represent House District 88, Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield, and half the Nobleboro. Uh -huh. Representative Stover. Good morning and thank you. My name is Holly Stover. I proudly serve the people of House District 89, including the towns of Booth Bay, Booth Bay Harbor, Southport, Edgecombe, Westport Island, and part of South Bristol. Representative Perry. Good morning. I'm Ann Perry. I represent House District 140, which includes the communities of Indian Township, Baileyville, Barron, Callis, Charlotte, Robinson, Perry, Pembroke, and Pleasant Point. Representative Griffin. Good morning. My name is Abigail Griffin. I represent House District 102, which is Glenburn, Levant, and Pedeskeg. Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I'm Margaret Craven, and I represent House District 59, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Madigan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I'm Colleen Madigan. I represent House District 110, which is part of Waterville and part of Oakland. Representative of Senator Moore. Good morning. I'm Marianne Moore, and I represent Senate District 6, which is all of Washington County, as well as Goldsboro, Winter Harbor, and Sullivan in Hancock County as well. Representative Meyer. Good morning, Senator Claxton. I'm Representative Michelle Meyer, serving Southern Maine's House District 2, which is Elliott, where I live, and parts of Kittery and South Berwick. And I'm Ned Claxton, honored to serve in Senate District 20, which consists of Auburn, Minot, Mechanic Falls, Poland, and New Gloucester. Um, we are ably joined and supported by uh, the uh, staff, and I'll let Anna introduce herself. Hi, I'm Anna Broom. I'm one of the two legislative analysts for this committee. Um, you'll see Sam this afternoon. Um, and I work in the nonpartisan Office of Policy and Legal Analysis. And Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Thomas. I'm the clerk for the Health and Human Services Committee. Should you need any assistance, please email me at hhs at legislature.main.gov. Thank you, Senator. Thank you uh, for all for being here. Uh, someday, if we have a light schedule, will everybody read all the towns that they represent? Because we'd have to set aside some a long time for uh, Senator Moore and uh, Representative Javner. Um, so, uh, and Representative Perry, of course, uh, from down east, far east. Okay, um, so uh, we have a, a representative joining us from the Ombudsman's office. So I'm bringing in uh, Bridget Quinn. 
and um, I see that Molly Bogart has joined us too, and I assume she'll be leading off when we get to the ODES reports. Welcome, Molly. Welcome, Bridget. Good morning, thank you. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself and go right ahead with uh, whatever you'd like to share with the committee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Bridget Quinn. I am the Associate State Director of Advocacy and Outreach for AARP Maine. Um, unfortunately, Brenda Gallant, the long-term, or the state's long-term care ombudsman is unable to join today. So I am helping out by filling in. Um, I believe that we had sent forward a uh, PowerPoint to uh, be a part of my presentation today. Um, would you like me to pull that up or? It's entirely up to you, Bridget. I'm sorry, Anna. okay. It's entirely up to you. I can bring it up or you can bring it up. Just so you, you don't know. mind, Anna, it would be really helpful if you could bring it up. I, I just, you know, I know I have it, but just to help out. There we go. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning. Good morning, Chair Senator Claxton and Representative Meyer and all members of the Joint Committee on Health and Human Services. I'm really excited to be here to present the report from the stakeholder group to identify the needs of long-term family caregivers to you today. Um, I have been very gracious and um, grateful to work with our stakeholder group to develop our report that I am here to present. I believe that I will also be joined by Karen Mason, Associate Director of Aging and Long-Term Services and Supports from the Office of Aging and Disability Services um, a little later if there are any questions, but I'm happy to jump right in. Um, I do wanna start our, my presentation by thanking all the other convening stakeholders of our group. This includes the main Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Aging and Disability Services. I just also wanna say thank you to all of our stakeholders who joined us to complete our work and the Bingham program in Maine who provided funding to engage a facilitator for our support. I also wanna recognize Representative Craven for your work on LD 1624 and for your work in the stakeholder group and to everybody on this committee for your work on LD 1624 and your continued efforts to support Maine's family care partners. Um, I will jump a little bit more into um, our work. So family caregivers and referred to in our report as family care partners are truly the backbone of the long-term care industry. Maine is home to approximately 181,000 unpaid family care partners. These care partners provide support and aid to loved ones. However, too often, the needs of family care partners go unrecognized, which can have lasting impacts on them and their loved ones. Recognizing the need to better support our family care partners, last June, the Maine Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program was charged to convene our stakeholder group to consider and make recommendations for the implementation of an assessment system to address the needs of family care partners as required by LD 1624. I'm gonna start uh, just giving a little bit of more information on the national landscape, starting with the Recognize, Assist, Include, Support and Engage or the RAISE Family Caregivers Act of 2017. Um, the RAISE Act established the Family Caregiving Advisory Council, which were charged to advise and provide recommendations to the US Department of Health and Human Services on recognizing and supporting family care partners. And on September 22nd in 2021, the Advisory Council delivered its initial report to Congress. In the report, there were recommendations on initiatives that can better support family care partners that can be taken up by state, local, and federal uh, administrations. The specific recommendations on the assessment program, which is what we're talking about today, is recommendation 2.2. This reads um, that, there is an opportunity to engage family caregivers through the use of evidence-supported and culturally sensitive family caregiver assessments to determine the willingness, ability, and needs of family caregivers to provide support. The rationale behind caregiver assessments is to have a better understanding of family care partners and how to better support them so they can support their loved ones. Maine's own Brenda Gallant, our long-term care ombudsman, was a member or is a member of the National Family Advisory Council. Through her work in the group, Brenda learned of the family care partner assessment tool called T-Care. T-Care is an evidence-based uh, screening assessment and tracking system used in more than 30 states to address family care partners' needs. Oh, thank you for changing the slide. This system is designed to identify care partners who are at risk of burnout 
and intervene with a tailored care plan to better support that care partner. Other states have been utilizing T-Care to support their family care partners. And T-Care reports positive outcomes ranging from delayed nursing facility placement and reduced care partner burnout. As a part of recent federal grant opportunities, the Department of Health and Human Services and ODES will be rolling out T-Care in the five area agencies on aging in spring of 2022. Um, and then I could go to the next slide, thank you. That brings us to our stakeholder group and what we were doing for the past year about. The group comprised of 37 representatives who were able to join at least one meeting. The stakeholder group a total of, met a total of four times between September 23rd and December 17th. Our group included family care partners, staff from the area agencies on aging, providers, advocacy organizations, staff from the convening entities, staff from U.S. Senator Collins' office, and staff from U.S. Senator King's office, and Representative Craven. Our group was supported by Pat Rivard as a facilitator and Linda Miller from T-Care. The list of members uh, for our whole stakeholder group was attached to our report, um, but if anybody would like to see that list again, I'm happy to send it forward if needed. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Um, so in our meetings, we covered a number of things. Our first meeting was held this, uh, September 23rd with 34 stakeholders uh, able to join. The focus of the first meeting was to provide the goals and objectives of the stakeholder group and to hear about the state of Washington's efforts to assess and address the needs of family care partners. Um, and also to learn a little bit more about the T-Care system. We were able to have representatives from the state of Washington come and join us to talk a little bit about how they have implemented a caregiver assessment program and the successes that they have seen in utilizing an assessment program to support their family care partners. The second meeting was held October 21st. In this meeting, we highlighted the RAISE report and had presentations from the main office of aging and disability services about their plans to roll out T-Care in Maine as a part of their grant program in 2022. We then had uh, pretty significant discussions in subgroups focused on the use of a, a screening tool before an assessment, the assessments and how to implement them, and outreach to communities across Maine to inform care partners of the assessment program. Some of the highlights of our discussion include needing a plan to adopt a screening program prior to assessments. This would help target uh, those who get assessments and effectively utilize resources available. We also highlighted the need to ensure that screenings are provided online, over the telephone, and face-to-face. -face. This is especially important due to the lack of internet access that some Mainers could experience. So we wanted to ensure that we had equitable access to the system. We also addressed the importance of access and awareness of the program. Not every family care partner is connected directly with an area agency on aging and may rely on getting their information elsewhere. So we discussed the need to have a broad coalition of providers and others who could get out information to family care partners. We discussed the possibility of engaging a wide group of professionals who can direct care partners to the assessment programs, including but not limited to healthcare providers, employers, insurers, and hospitals. So ensuring that anytime somebody is visiting a healthcare provider with a, fam, uh, with a family care partner, that if that provider senses that that care partner needs support, they are directed to the right place. Um, too many people are not going to access the area agencies on aging who will be able to administer the uh, assessments, but we wanna make sure that everybody is aware and getting to the right place. And in, our, uh, in the next slide, please. Our third meeting, the stakeholder group um, was on November 18th, where we were joined by Greg Link, Director of the Office of Supportive and Caregiver Services with the Administration for Community Living. Greg joined us to share his insights into the RAISE report and to review the recommendations that aligned with the focus of our stakeholder group. Linda Miller, Vice President of Government Programs for T-Care, also attended the meeting to give a demonstration to stakeholders on how to use the online T-Care system. Our fourth meeting uh, took place December 17th with 27 stakeholders, and we were able to share the proposed implementation plans with the stakeholder group and to hear their feedback. And then um, we can go to our next slide. So that brings us to our proposed implementation plan, biggest piece of today. 
Um, before I jump into the implementation plan and our phases, I did want to share this quote from Jane Conrad, who is a family care partner who was a part of our stakeholder group. Um, so Jane shared with us that being a caregiver for a loved one is profoundly challenging, both physically and emotionally. It is very difficult to find the time or energy to identify resources to alleviate the burden when you are juggling many demands of caregiving. I'm very grateful to the Maine legislature's wishes to connect caregivers with resources to lighten the load, which will benefit not only the caregiver, but also the person who needs care. I appreciate the opportunity to have served on the stakeholder committee to identify the needs of family caregivers. We're as a group very grateful to our family care partners who were able to join us to help us guide our to help guide our work and to make sure that we had the best implementation plan as possible. Um, okay, and then the next slide, please. Thank you. So in the work, um, we decided that phases for implementation make the most sense and identified two phases. The first to begin in early spring of 2022. First, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Aging and Disability Services will work to identify staff responsible for coordinating access to the T-care system for the five AAAs. So they will identify the staff who can uh, give out the assessments once um, the system is in place. They will also develop T-care policies, procedures, and protocols. Um, DHHS will also work to develop outreach materials in collaboration with community partners to educate family care partners about T-care and the available assessments. We also ask that DHHS and ODES work to establish data elements to be collected and analyzed and presented to internal and, sta and external stakeholders. The data collected should include number of screenings conducted statewide, number of, of assessments conducted by the AAAs, and percent of family care partners uh, assessed that accessed identified resources and services and programs post-assessment. Um, means area agencies on aging will work to conduct the T-care screenings to identify family care partners who could benefit from the T-care assessment as part of the AAA's Aging and Disability Resource Centers. The area agencies on aging will also train and certify T-care specialists to receive referrals from community partners and aging and disability resource centers based, uh, staff based on screenings, and then they will conduct the T-care assessments. Further, they will provide access assistance to assess family care partners and appropriate community services to T-care policies, procedures, and protocols developed by DHHS and ODES. We also ask that the AAA submit monthly reports to DHHS and ODES um, and other organizations and partners included uh, work will include the main long-term care ombudsman's program who will refer family care partners to the AAAs for screening and assessment as a part of its advocacy for individuals searching for long-term services and supports, as well as those already accessing long-term services and supports. DHHS and ODES and the Maine Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program in AARP Maine will continue to explore partnerships with community-based organizations that serve underrepresented and marginalized populations, uh, marginalized populations to ensure equ equitable access to T-care screenings and assessments. And then our next slide. For phase two, beginning in late spring of 2022, um, we asked that DHHS and ODES and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program and AARP Maine to continue to explore collaborating with single assessing service agencies with the consent of the individual to conduct T-care screenings to identify family care partners who could be benefit from the T-care system or T-care assessments. We will collaborate with the service coordination agencies, of course, with the consent of individuals to explore the possibility of conducting T-care assessments for family care partners of individuals receiving long-term services and supports, including and to include family care partners in, the, in planning. We will explore partnerships with interested hospitals, home health care agencies, and other health partners and provide T-care information developed by DHHS and O's to expand the implementation of the T-care screenings during the care planning process with the consent of the individual and identify family care partners who could benefit from T-care assessments. We will seek to collaborate with hospitals um, as well as to get this information out to more uh, family care partners as well as other um, primary care doctors. 
Um, and then finally, we will work in partnership with community-based organizations that serve other family care partner populations to expand T-care screenings and assessments across the state. We will, uh, DHHS, ODES, and the Long-Term Care, on Pro Long -term care Ombudsman Program in AARP Maine will continue to collaborate with T-care staff to connect with other states who are using the T-care system to hear about lessons and best practices from other states. We'll work to identify gaps in resources and needs to support family care partners in Maine and work to address those gaps. Um, in closing, there are approximately 181,000 family care partners in Maine. All too often, these care partners struggle alone without the information and support that can make all the difference in providing care to a loved one. This report and our stakeholder, stakeholder group's plan for implementing the T-care assessment system is an important step in building an effective approach to recognizing family care partners across Maine. Um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but that is my presentation. Thank you for that. Sounds like there was lots of uh, energy in the group. Representative Zaker. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Ms. Quinn, for the presentation. Um, I'm pretty excited about this um, endeavor. Um, I, I was in, at the hearing, I was um, excited, especially here about the, uh, the evidence uh, that was uh, the, the data that was collected in Washington state showing uh, decreased rates of depression uh, among caregivers, uh, saving Medicaid dollars and uh, delaying nursing home placement um, because people could remain at home for up to two years longer. I, I assume I didn't see that those sort of data points um, among the things that were being collected. I assume as this rolls out further, we're, we're keeping track of those kinds of things as well to, to see how it's going. Um, I don't believe that was discussed in our report specifically, but I absolutely agree it should be included um, that we want to uh, to determine how well these assessments are working in Maine as well and that that should be information collected. Um, but I don't believe it shows up in the report as um, specific data points other than what we have identified as collecting information of how many assessments are given and what follow up those care partners receive. Okay, um, just a follow up, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, I, my, my only request um, was that if, if it's not in, in plan, in, in the current plans going forward, I recognize this, these things take some years to, you know, to observe, but um, that, that, that those sort of things be included if they're not already. Absolutely. I think that's a really wonderful suggestion and should be included. And I think Representative Zager uh, raises the issue of the data from the pilot. And anytime you can provide the data from a specific attempt, it only supports the ongoing effort. So I think that might be an addendum to the report. Uh, any other questions for Bridget Quinn? Thank you for stepping in for... Uh, uh, did, Senator Moore, did you want to comment on the, the pilot or anything? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for stepping in and covering this morning. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll be interested to hear, see how this plays out as phase one and two really get started and uh, rolling uh, this spring. All right. Thank, thank you, you for, for being here. Me. Have a good day. So I see we've been joined by Senator Baldacci. Would you care to introduce yourself, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Joe Baldacci. I represent Senate District 9, uh, which is the city of Bangor and the town of Herman. I had the pleasure of, of cutting the ribbon this morning at our new BMV office with Secretary Bellows. So I apologize for being a little late, but Bangor has a bright, beautiful new Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and we're very happy. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Javner. Good morning. I'm Representative Kathy Javner, and I represent House District 141, which is located in Penobscot and Washington counties. Okay. So next, I think we're supposed to go to Molly and hear from Anna. Did you have your... Um. Yeah, I, I'm just going to pass on uh, what Brenda asked me to tell you about LD 1427. So mm -hmm. this was um, an act to encourage family care of aging adults. Um, this bill was um, in, 
it was intended to, aimed at making it easier for family members to be paid under main care um, for taking care of a family member, uh, allowing an exemption in estate recovery for that and allowing for a lower standard of proof in terms of transfer to qualify for Medicaid. And you asked the long-term care ombudsman to see if the topic could be included in the 1624 stakeholder group, um, which you just heard the report for and you could see how it didn't really fit in with that because that's about unpaid caregivers. Um, and if that it wasn't within the purview of that group, um, whether, whether she would have any other recommendations um, that might work. And she wanted me to tell you that she had already started a work group because it didn't fit within LD 1624. Um, that is including the likes of um, Disability Rights Maine and the legal services for the elderly and so on. Um, she said that the sponsor is pleased um, that that is going forward. And she asked me if I would pass that on for her that she had planned to tell you that today. Um, but that's her answer to your letter for um, LD 1427, which was an ought not to pass with a letter bill. Any questions about that or follow up requested? I don't see any. I see we've been joined by uh, Director Sosier and I see Molly with us. So I'll defer to you, Molly. Good morning. Um, yes, I'm Molly Bogart, Director of Government Relations for DHHS. And um, I think uh, Kim Moore in the waiting room is also um, gonna be joining Director Sosier for the uh, presentation. Um, so if you wouldn't mind bringing her over, that would be great. She's coming. Great. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I think that Ted Darling is next and I think he has to be somewhere. So I just, um, I'm not sure about that, but you may wish to bring him in and I'm pretty sure that he had somewhere to be and he's covering for um, Brenda as well. See, I think we were ready for 11. So uh, whatever you need to do before right. that, feel free. Okay. All right. I didn't know that there was competing schedule. Welcome, Mr. Darling, Ted Darling. Did you have- Yes, good morning. I'm activating my video here. Thank you. I appreciate uh, uh, your inviting me to this session today. Uh, I am covering for uh, Brenda Glant of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Uh, thank you, Chair Clark Clarkson and members of the committee for um, allowing me to, uh, to present some findings on a main direct care professionals focus group, um, book, series of focus groups that were conducted in November through January. Um, is it okay for me to share my screen and begin? It is. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, um, this uh, report is available in full um, on uh, submitted it um, yesterday. So it is available for the committee to review. Um, there is a lot in here. I am going to provide a, a top line summary and keep my remarks to about 25 minutes. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, funding for this engagement came from uh, the Engage and Empower Direct Care Workers Initiative. And it was provided by the Maine Health Access Foundation as well as the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Aging and Disability Services. Um, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program implemented this project and my, my company Ethos, which is a multi-platform branding agency in Westbrook, Maine, uh, with a specialty in behavior change marketing, was commissioned to conduct a series of 10 focus groups with Maine direct care um, and support professionals. The primary purpose of this Engage and Empower initiative is to help direct care and support professionals define and express their collective voice so that they may have an impact on Maine's workforce planning and policy making. The initiative is designed to provide opportunities for workers to use that voice to inform those who make decisions about their jobs and to know what is important to them. Um, it is anticipated that sharing the work and findings of this initiative with all three groups will inform strategies that ultimately will boost recruitment and improve retention of direct care workers and support professionals. These focus groups were an initial step in the process of develop, uh, identifying primary issues confronted by this group and their important line of work. So as, you, as the committee is likely aware, Maine's direct care and support professionals are certified nursing assistants, their home health aides, their personal support specialists, personal care attendants, independent support services staff, direct support professionals, and mental health rehabilitation te technicians. They're employed by nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, 
assisted housing programs, adult care homes, programs for people with intellectual disabilities, programs for people with brain injuries, home health and other home care agencies, as well as individuals who supervise their own long-term services and support, long-term services and supports. So we, um, in terms of methodology, um, we began with a group uh, of stakeholders um, and we called this an immersion or discovery session that was conducted on October 12th. Um, we had representatives from the Maine Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, PHI International, as well as the Maine Health Access Foundation. And the purpose of this meeting was to identify key messages designed to recruit focus group participation, as well as to develop specific learning objectives for the qualitative research. Um, we proceeded to uh, work with the Maine Long-Term Care on Budman's program to recruit participants who were um, compensated with a $50 gift card uh, for their input into these sessions. Our research objectives um, were approximately eight. We wanted to understand why Maine's direct care and support professionals chose the profession that they did. We wanted to understand that what they consider to be the positive attributes of a quality job uh, and of a direct care employer. Um, also wanted to understand why they um, stay in their current jobs or switch to a different job. Uh, understand what's most appealing about their work and con conversely, what also led to job dissatisfaction. Um, we wanted to understand drivers of the choice between full-time, part-time, and per diem work, uh, identify any barriers to undertaking the work, and then to understand the best ways to communicate with this workforce, uh, as well as to determine whether or not participants see themselves as a voice for change and leadership characteristics. Um, so we conducted a series of 10 virtual focus groups um, on Zoom with a total of 58 direct care and support professionals um, with statewide representation across all long-term services and support sessions. The groups were conducted between the 11th of November and January 5th. We had uh, 52 women, six men, and of that group, we had seven new American participants. Um, all of the groups were recorded on Zoom and trans transcribed for subsequent review um, and preparing our report. We did promise participants that we would dis destroy the um, uh, recordings following the creation of the support of uh, this report. I also want to note that focus groups are qualitative research studies. They're effective at engaging general sentiment of um, direct care professionals, but they don't have statistical significance. So these findings are directional rather than statistical conclusions. So I'm gonna, this um, report includes an executive summary, which I would encourage you to review. And it also includes a detailed summary of findings, which I'm going to run through um, the essence of that um, now with highlights um, to each of those. So first and foremost, we, we wanted to know why Maine's direct care workers chose the profession that they did. Um, and the, the prevalent theme was that um, they did so out of a desire to do meaningful work that had a positive influence on the lives of others. Many had shared that they had a family history in direct care support or nursing, or found meaningful um, meaning taking care of a sick one and subsequently um, discovered direct care as a potential career. Others left retail or hospitality jobs or returned to the workforce after children to pursue a career in healthcare. Um, New American direct care workers indicated healthcare histories in their home countries and discovered direct care employment here in Maine. So um, one of the big ideas that we heard, and it was a consistent theme across all 10 groups, is that there was some level of uh, multi-generational healthcare history within um, as far as part of a, a, the reason behind choosing the profession. So I'm gonna just read a few quotes as I go along. Um, these are all verbatims. Um, and we tried not to modify um, the words of these so that you know, you've got a better um, sense of um, what uh, people actually said. So I, I'm going to not read them all. I'm gonna just highlight a few of those. So I pretty much grew up in a nursing home. Both my parents worked in a nursing home. So I think it's all I've ever known. I took the CNA when I was in high school and that's all I've ever done. And I really enjoyed it. I wouldn't do anything else. Another uh, person said, I started out in fast food when I was a teenager and I wanted to help people and do something that had more meaning to it. 
And eventually I got to the hospital to be a housekeeper and they had a CNA program. And I was quick on that. I was quick to jump on that opportunity because I wanted to impact people's lives. It's just an urge to do something of higher importance that got me out of the KFC environment and into a personal support specialist role. We asked participants what they regarded as a quality job um, of a direct care support employer. Uh, participants pointed to fair wages and benefits, adequate staffing and support um, for the needs of the residents, proactive communication by employers and among employees, as well as the development of consistent standards among employers and comparable direct care positions. New Americans pointed consistently to the uh, importance of teamwork. Um, this is group of people, these workers, um, these professionals, they're not in their chosen line of work for the money. Um, however, most participants believe that their current rate of pay was not commensurate with the difficulty and importance of the work they perform. Um, a quality job is a living wage, good hours, flexibility, and above, above and beyond communication and room to be a human being. One of the themes and the dominant theme and the biggest concern area, um, and I'm sure this committee is all too familiar with it, um, is that adequate staffing was partic of particular importance to participants who pointed to increasing worker shortages and impact on their personal lives, as well as a potential negative effect to residents they care for. Not having enough staff to properly care for these guys and give them everything they deserve is really hard. I definitely think the short staff and the staffing crisis is the top of the list because of the burnouts happening. It's really hard when it's only you and another person and say like 30 residents. How are you supposed to do that by you know two people? How are you supposed to keep them all safe? Another theme that we heard um, from the group uh, about a quality job was around better communication not only between them and management, but also um, fellow, their fellow workers, uh, particularly about the needs of a resident or a patient um, as, part of the, as part of their work environment. One participant said, I know things are hard right now because everybody's so, so short staffed, but just to be brief, it doesn't need to be a book, you know, just like the highlights of your shift and like this has changed or a person requires this to give you some kind of input. So you're not just going in blindly. Another theme was around consistent standards across employers, as well as across direct care um, job types. Uh, a participant noted what is accepted in routine in one place is not necessarily the standard of care in another. Make it so the training is universal, so you don't have to keep repeating the same rights and procedures and stuff like that. Every time you go to move to a different job, because to me being in the field, uh, field for 20 years, a PSS does personal care, a DSP does personal care, as does a CNA. The only difference is the waiver and the setting and the amount of pay you get. As far as training is concerned, other than the desire for training around consistent standards, the demand for uh, professional training among participants was not particularly high nor consistent among groups. However, individual participants did mention the need for the following types of training. Leadership training to help fill a void of leadership among workers, human relations training in dealing with on-the-job conflicts, resident-centered care and understanding patients' rights, as well as mental health training and how to deal with others that were experiencing mental health-related issues. And then, of course, um, this group of people performs particularly difficult healthcare and personal assistance tasks uh, and, for, and for those who can't take care of themselves. Some express the desire for acknowledgement to create a positive work environment. If you really wanna make a good company, you have to work really hard to reward hard work and employees and keep the tone positive as much as possible. Um, among new American direct care workers, there was a, a, a really a desire for uh, teamwork and making sure everybody was pulling their own, own weight. We have to be a team. If you're not a team, you've destroyed everything. In my new job, we work as a team. We always understand each other. If there's a problem, we take it to the manager and the manager who understands us. Some other thoughts in terms of a positive uh, work environment. 
um, was around um, flexibility with hours and help with personal situations as they arise. So if an automobile car was not working, just having some flexibility around that, um, needs from home, things of that nature. Um, offering consistent hours and predictability, um, having adequate supplies on site, and then also uh, a theme around ev evaluating employees on an individual basis on their particular merits rather than as a group. Um, why do they stay in this profession? Um, despite numerous challenges, um, they stay in their job because of the love for the work and the people they serve. Increasingly, um, workers are staying out of their jobs, in their jobs, out of a deep sense of obligation and commitment, even if that decision impedes their own career growth. One participant said, I love care, I love care, uh, caregiving. It's just in me to want to, to take care of people. It makes me feel good at the end of the day as well, knowing that you help someone meet their needs to give them a quality of life. I just think I get very connected with the people I'm caring for, and it's hard to leave them even when you're getting burnt out. Taking care of people, working for them, and helping um, them has always been important to me. This is a group of deep and compassionate human beings um, that want to take care of others. Um, so what, what, led, what leads to job satisfaction? Um, clearly, it has to do with the attributes of what a positive work environment is, fair wages, adequate support, proactive communication, and consistent standards. When those things aren't present, that creates a level of job dissatisfaction. However, the number one concern about participants was the worker shortage that's risen over the past decade and has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Some participants offered their insight into the worker shortage that is at or near crisis levels. And this was really solid input from the group. One participant said, I think part of it is on the resident or consumer demand. You have the baby boomers retiring, coming into this kind of need. I think we're at the gap where there's more people needing long-term care and more people retiring from the field than there are people coming in into the field um, to keep that balance. There was a lot of discussion around COVID-19, vaccine mandates and the like. Um, and uh, people were saying that they were afraid of COVID-19 or they have family members that, are tr that they're trying to keep safe. Um, others kind of disputed that this was really about uh, the pandemic and pointed more to it being such a difficult job. When the first, when the one participant said, when the pandemic first got bad, I was working at a car cardiopulmonary um, rehab as a CNA, you know, and once it got into the facility, it killed about 50% of our patients. And then I took a couple of months off of, after, of healthcare after that. And I'd say, you know, really at least five or six of my coworkers probably left healthcare over that. It was just too much. It was a lot. So I think that plays a part. I think people are stressed, you know, and feel this pandemic is hard. So we asked participants uh, about uh, the kinds of barriers that they encounter undertaking their line of work. Um, and they pointed to the difficulty of maintaining personal boundaries, uh, the impact to their personal lives, um, some of the state of Maine regulations, um, and another one uh, new American pointed to um, racism as a potential barrier to work. So regarding personal boundaries, um, participants uh, indicated that sometimes I get a little too concerned, uh, connected to everyone I'm taking care of. I, I think not intentionally, but it really, really hits, hits me when a patient passes. Sometimes the employers are sacrificing, um, sometimes employees are sacrificing their personal lives, their personal memories are being taken from, uh, from them because of how invested you become in this line of work naturally. Another offered that holidays don't exist in mental health. With the staff shortage, I feel guilty about trying to do better because I'm way too attached more than I should be to my clients. Another big personal challenge for work life and home life uh, because we're so burnt out giving every giving everything to all our residents you know because they're stuck in their rooms or you know we're on shutdown lockdown covid those regulations have broken other challenges uh, included concerns over state of main rec uh, regulations and racism as i mentioned um, State, the, the state of Maine makes our jobs extremely difficult. They, 
feel like they keep putting more restrictions on how we need to do our job and how clients need to use their time and effort when they're with us. As far as the choice between full-time, part-time and per diem work, most focus group participants were engaged in full-time employment with many working more than one job or overtime to make ends meet. Others engaged in per diem work for the higher wages and flexible schedules offered. Some also chose to do part-time work to suit their lifestyle or to augment income. So one participant doing per diem says that it gives me flexibility, but then, you know, I risk not getting like the benefits and stuff. I work part-time because, uh, uh, because a little bit of uh, both as choice. I, I have two home businesses I'm trying, I'm working on building and I just wanna start part-time, but I know at any time if I wanna add clients and add hours, I'm able to do that as, uh, at, at any time because my agency has all kinds of clients that they need help for. We spoke to participants about how they um, like to be communicated with. And of course, um, the, the choices um, offered were many, the, the selections were few. Um, email or text were the primary um, tools for communicating across all of the different, um, across all of these groups. Um, as a final question, we asked um, focus group participants um, what they would advise or tell policymakers and employers about direct care work if given the opportunity to do so. Um, the overriding advice was to walk in our shoes for a day to see what we do. So um, one participant said, put themselves maybe in our shoes. I don't think they realize either what we do out there and they should. I wonder if they got sick or if their family member got sick, I mean, they'd want a good caregiver. And I don't think they really realize really what we do in the home or in the facilities. I wish they could go out once in a while without their checklist and just follow a CNA for a couple of hours or do a home visit and see if they're able to keep up. There were other, um, other advice um, offered here that I would encourage you to take a look at if you have a moment. Um, this was, this um, uh, quote was offered by a new American and she said, in my situation, I would like that our employer and our managers to understand that the job that we're doing right now is very hard. It's hard on our body. We cannot take care of 10 people. 10 is too much. Maybe we, uh, they could consider hiring more people to give us a quality job. Even if they increase the money, they give us more money. But if the job is hard, it means that you're going to lose more. People will just try to go and find an easier job because a hard job, in my case, like you do, you, you take care of the resident, you give him medication and you do his laundry, you do everything for the resident. It's too much for one person. So um, we did um, provide some implications and recommendations um, from our report. Um, and uh, I wanted to share a few things um, with you. Um, so background everybody understands this i'm sure but um these the, the these group of professionals take care of our loved ones uh and they take care of us when we're unable to take care of ourselves this group is compassionate they're kind and loving and they often sacrifice their own personal lives to take care of others they're paid at the low end of the wage scale and with covid put themselves in harm's way each and every day um, like other workers around the country and great engaged in the great resignation many are quitting their positions and leaving fewer hands to perform more work. Arguably, the direct care shortage has reached crisis proportions with potential del deleterious effects to those requiring higher levels of care. Um, it's somewhat beyond the researcher, uh, the purview of this researcher to provide policy-based recommendations, but we do consider the following to be positive steps in the right direction. The main long-term care ombudsman program is in the process of forming. A direct care and support professional advisor, advisory council to provide a voice for Maine's direct care professions on uh, important issues affecting their jobs. So this is a, a really positive step. And we had a lot of people um, in, the, in the focus groups that were interested in participating on the council. We think that it, it's important to elevate the status of direct care and support professionals in the eyes of the public, as well as employers, policymakers, and payers with the objective of increasing wages and benefits over time potentially create a walk in my shoes documentary 
of a day in the life of Maine, Maine's direct care professionals that highlight the difficult work they perform and the challenges they encounter. Um, continue to standardize and professionalize the various job descriptions that encompass the field of direct care and professional support work. Provide empl employers who are eager to hire direct care professionals, and I know that because I work with a number of them, with feedback about how direct care workers think about a quality job and a workplace. Um, promote entry level direct care as a means of starting a career in healthcare as a stepping stone to a, a brighter future and then potentially partner with Maine's community college system and employers to develop programs that enhance the skills and values of direct, uh, value of direct care professionals and increase that value over time. So that is it for uh, my presentation and I will stop sharing my screen and answer any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Darling. I apologize for getting you out of order in the process, but that was a very thorough report. I see a question from uh, Representative Javner. Thank you, Senator Claxton. Thank you very much, Mr. Darling, for this report. It was excellent, um, extremely important information in here. I have just a couple, um, just a couple quick things. Um, is it even possible for us to job shadow a direct care worker? It, it, it's potentially possible, um, and we're looking at that as a possibility. The, the, the issue is, of course, HIPAA um, compliance issues and things of that nature. But with approvals, I think we could probably do that. And with appropriate video, we could probably you know, not show patients or residents um, being served and really focus on the, on the care provider. OK, great. And I'm assuming you'll let us know if that ever is a possibility. Yes. Perfect. And then one more, if I may, Senator Claxton. Please. Um, so you mentioned the great resignation, and I know this has affected many of our um, different workforces. And so specific for direct care workers, um, what's the origin that you that we think of as why this is happening for direct care workers and then what the consequences of what is happening? Yeah, I think the origins, I mean, this has been this has been a, uh, a group of people who have, um, been short, it's been short staffed for a long period of time. I don't think that the um, career itself is held in particularly high uh, esteem uh, and ironic given the difficulty and quality of the work um, that this group of people does. Um, so I think that that existed um, prior to COVID, but it was clear to me that COVID had a massive impact in terms of um, the nature of the work and people sought alternative um, means of work or different lines of work, given the difficulty. I think you know a number that were perhaps part of multi-income uh, households um, opted for stay at home um, to take care of kids if they were impacted that um, by that. And I have to say that we didn't speak. We only spoke to those who were currently employed or engaged. We didn't speak to those who were uh, had left the left the field, which I think would be an interesting. Uh, follow-up study. Senator Baldacci. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Darling, thank you very much. I just want to echo the comments of Representative Javner. This is a very important report. It's important for us to hear it. It's important for us to really appreciate the information and the people doing it. Um, I don't know if this is a question for Mr. Darling or for, for who directed through the chair that I think it would be helpful. We need, we approved bills last year to increase funding for wages. And at some point, I think we should get a, a progress report um, in terms of where the, those are, how, how the administration's funding them to get some particulars and making sure that people are getting increased wages. Um, I ask that as there's been several episodes of different programs that we've approved, not just this committee, but other committees where we've approved certain things and the funding has not shown up yet. So I'd like to get a, at some point, Mr. Chairman, a progress report on where we are and actually getting the money to the direct care workers. Because obviously wages and benefits is probably one of the number one ways we show our appreciation 
for people's hard work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Darling, for the uh, for, for the for the report, and um, from somebody that has worked in the field of drug care uh, for years, uh, I really appreciate the report and hope it's not going to sit and gather dust like a lot of the reports that that we get do, um, because I think it's so important at, at this stage. Um, I don't know if I have a, if I have a question uh, other than, you know, what will the process be to um, move your report forward and how, um, how is it, I mean, I don't know if there's something going to be implemented, but, but, but for example, talking about uh, having the community colleges um, create curriculum and that sort of thing that's, that, that, that puts it on a, on a career track, you know, I, I would love to hear a bit more about the next steps for your report. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we have um, recommended are exploring uh, in conjunction with um, some of the sponsors of this report, um, particularly um, the Maine Health Access Foundation is doing, uh, creating this video um, that would help create awareness around the type of work that, um, that uh, direct care professionals are, are undertaking. Um, I believe the long-term care ombudsman program would like to bring some media attention to this report in the form of a press release about it now that it's been publicly released. Um, so those are a couple of the first steps. Um, and beyond that is, is, as a researcher, it's somewhat beyond my, my purview as far as, uh, as, as the next step uh, with respect to recommendations for the committee. From what you said, though, it sounds like the council that's being set up might be a source of some recommendations through the long-term care ombudsman program. That's a, that's a great uh, point, um, uh, Senator Claxton. The, um, the, uh, direct, uh, the main long-term care ombudsman program has or is in the process of forming this committee, and this committee will be providing advice and guidance um, on an ongoing basis um, to, uh, to policymakers and employers. In terms of future work, it might be good to hear back from them about how that's coming, hopefully before we adjourn uh, for this session. So that might be one of the other follow-ups that's out there as a request. Would that address some of your question, uh, Representative Craven? Yes, yes, thank you. I, 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 with all the work that they've done, I just don't want it to be ignored and for it not to go anywhere because I think I think that uh, those direct quotes uh, from uh, from staff was just really powerful and and so truthful and um, and so important. So maybe we could invite Brenda Glant back at some point. Uh, when we get closer to the end of our committee work to have us give her, uh, have her give us an update on where things stood with the council formation anyway. And uh, too early to get recommendations, but a good place to start. Are there any other questions for Mr. Darling? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what, is there a shape to your continued involvement or was this a a research project and your, uh, you've completed what you were uh, uh, signed on to do? Um, yes, I would say that we have completed our assignment as far as um, the work that, um, we, uh, that we're doing. Um, I do represent, uh, have represented a number of different um, organizations, um, nursing homes, assisted living centers and the like. And certainly, in providing feedback to them about what employer, what what the, these groups of employees are looking for from their um, from their employer, and I think that is really important because I know how desperate uh, uh, business businesses and nonprofit organizations are to hire these groups of people, uh, and yet um, there's there seems to be a dearth of them. So um, I, that that's what I'm doing at present, and perhaps can continue um, in terms of a consulting role if needed. Yeah, I think as much as we can spread these findings, they won't really, in a lot of ways, surprise anybody, but it's nice to have a more qualitative sense of the data. Uh, it's somewhat more persuasive than, um, than just talking about the issue. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you for that. Um, 
I don't see any other questions. So I'll thank you again for taking the time to present this study for us. Um, and we'll follow up with Brenda Gallant in the next month, couple of months to find out how things are progressing. Excellent, thank you for your time. Thank you again. So now it's time in the calendar, when I pulled up a different calendar, to uh, defer to uh, Molly and uh, the and uh, Director Saucier. So I will leave it to you, uh, you Molly, to kick things off. Thank you. Um, and I, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Molly Bogart, Director of Government Relations for DHHS, and I'll ask Paul and Kim to introduce themselves uh, once they get going. Um, but uh, I think the timing is perfect for this. A lot of your questions just now were, what are we doing about this? And um, I think this report gets to a lot of that. Um, and, a, and a lot of the, the work that we're about to present has happened in partnership and with consultation um, of, uh, with stakeholders, uh, including and perhaps especially um, Brenda Gallant and her team at the Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Office. So um, I will let Paul and, and Kim take it away and I'm ready with slides when you are, Paul. Great, thank you, Molly. Um, I'm Paul Sosti, Director of the Office of Aging and Disability Services. Um, and we've been partnering with uh, Department of Labor and other departments, but primarily with Department of Labor um, in the past year on a number of initiatives to implement pieces of the uh, Long-Term Care Commission's work. And so, yes, this is uh, perfect to come after Mr. Darling. We, um, we were uh, participated in that work and we're thrilled about it and are really looking forward to having the uh, Worker Council as a form of, of continuous input uh, going forward, make sure the worker voice um, stays in this discussion. Um, we are uh, doing both some short-term work to try to stabilize the workforce right now. As you all are very much aware, um, things are really tough out there. Um, and But we're also really pleased to tell you about a number of longer-term things that we're working on uh, that we uh, hope will strengthen uh, the workforce for the future. So um, with that, why don't we jump in um, Molly, if you can put the slides up. Um, great. Uh, let's go to the overview. Just to put this in context for folks, I think everybody understands this, but uh, Molly did uh, deliver the uh, annual report to you yesterday, and this essentially goes over that report and gives you an update of what's been happening since the Long-Term Care uh, Workforce Commission met in 2019. They issued their report in 2020. And then last year in part quadruple A of the budget, you did a couple of things. You um, implemented a rate recommendation uh, from uh, the commission and you also uh, put in an annual reporting requirement for the next five years. So this is the first of our five annual reports. Um, and there'll be one mechanism to, uh, so to help us all stay focused uh, on this work. Um, we've, we, uh, we were tasked uh, in quadruple A with putting the report together, but as you'll see, it really reflects work that we are doing in partnership with, um, with labor and education and others. Uh, let's go on, Molly. So I'll start with uh, reimbursement. And essentially, the, what you'll note in the report is that it follows the, um, the organizational order of um, the original Long-Term Care Commission's uh, report. Uh, reimbursement uh, was first there. Um, when the pandemic started in 2020, um, we accelerated some rate increases that had been scheduled for later in that year. Uh, pandemic essentially hit in March here, and in April, we um, accelerated attendant care service, PSS, other, um, other related uh, increases. Um, and we also, uh, during 2020, uh, implemented temporary rate increases for uh, home and community-based services uh, of all types. Uh, residential care and nursing facility providers. That was sort of the first wave of uh, temporary assistance, if you will, uh, for, for providers to, uh, to help them with the costs of the pandemic um, and also to try to maintain their workforce. 
uh, this year in August, uh, Corona Relief Funds were awarded to nursing homes uh, PNMICs, which um, are the type of PNMI that has people with significant um, needs that are most closely related to nursing home needs, and then also adult family care homes. Um, in September, the department shared its schedule for implementing rate investments associated with the first phase of the main care rate system reform, um, and the administration announced supplemental COVID payments for nursing facilities, residential care facilities, adult family care homes, um, and uh, effective retroactive to January 1, 2022. Uh, um, the rate increases that were implemented in part quadruple A uh, will be implemented then. The 125% uh, of minimum wage um, ends up being more than what was budgeted at that time, uh, partly due to inflation. Um, and also ref um, recognizing that inflationary pressures are um, hurting providers right now. Uh, the department announced that it will also um, accelerate uh, the cost of living adjustments that were part of the rate system reform proposal back to January 1, um, and that COLA will be higher than what was originally anticipated. Um, the details of this, uh, we, we've, we've been asked reasonably so by providers for um, details on what those rates will actually be, and Main Care sent out a provider communication last night that uh, is linked to uh, three pages of, of, uh, of rates that will uh, be published so um, the providers will understand um, what those uh, rates will actually be. And then this month, um, we will be making supplemental payments to home and community-based service providers uh, for uh, bonuses to direct support workers and supervisors. Um, we received the third uh, and final approval that we required from CMS uh, last week to do that. And so um, those payments will be going out very soon. Um, it's also been announced that uh, the governor's budget will include a supplemental wage add-on um, proposed for nursing homes and PNMI subject to legislative approval. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Kim Moore, uh, to, uh, to uh, present the next couple of slides. Great, thank you so much, Paul, I appreciate it. And good, after, or good morning, <laughs> Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, uh, members of the Health and Human Services Committee. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I am Kim Moore, I'm the Director for the Bureau of Employment Services at the Maine Department of Labor. Um, so my first uh, item on this uh, presentation is to talk a little bit about the campaign to promote direct care careers, um, which is the first of a three phase media campaign that uh, will connect with and recruit people of all ages and communities into frontline healthcare careers. Uh, funding for this particular campaign was secured through Governor Mills' uh, jobs and uh, main jobs and recovery plan. Um, and we're really proud that the campaign um, has been informed by a really diverse group of stakeholders, including representatives from the Maine Long-Term Care and Budsman Program, Catholic Charities, Maine, uh, Leading Age, the Maine Council on Aging, Maine Healthcare Association, uh, Maine Association for Community Service Providers, and the Home Care and Hospice Alliance of Maine. All of these stakeholders have provided really essential input on key messaging and have assisted us and our partners with DHHS uh, with reaching other stakeholders through surveys and other methods to increase our understanding of motivations, barriers, and aspirations of our current and potential direct care uh, and support workers. Um, and a recently launched survey re uh, received responses from over 700 direct care workers, including those who were considering the career. We anticipate that the campaign will begin to launch in uh, late February, and it's uh, designed to include traditional and social media, a website, um, and really uh, specialized worker recruitment events. Um, and the campaign messaging will be customized to really speak to some of those targeted communities, including men, people with disabilities, older workers, younger adults, new Mainers, and communities of color to make sure that we're increasing the number of individuals in direct care jobs uh, among those target audiences. 
Um, our goal is also to make sure that we are increasing overall awareness of careers and then really elevating the perception and appreciation of these essential careers. Uh, the campaign impact will be measured, of course, using traditional market, marketing metrics. So website visits, people coming to fairs, impressions, um, and then also um, through targeted employer satisfaction surveys. And like I said, that is the first of our media campaigns. So I'm going to pass it back over to Paul from here. Great. So we're going to, we, we have uh, budgeted some of our um, uh, FMAP funds, the, the um, enhanced um, uh, financial, uh, federal financial funds uh, for LTSS to do additional media campaigns that will build on the one that D DOL is leading now. All of these campaigns, by the way, have really already been informed by the work that the long-term care ombudsman uh, did with workers. And so that's been very exciting. Um, the themes that we uh, DOL saw in their survey are very consistent with the themes from the focus groups. Always nice when you get that kind of validation. So I think we understand um, what is appealing about the work and um, uh, we'll, we'll do um, targeted campaigns for um, people who work with older people, people with intellectual uh, uh, disabilities. And then Dr. Pollard at OBH um, also has funds earmarked to do a targeted campaign around behavioral health workers. Um, so all of this uh, should um, really uh, stimulate a lot of good um, public uh, campaign uh, over the next several months. Um, a few other things uh, on this slide that I would just touch on. Um, the Maine Healthcare Provider Loan Repayment Pilot Program, uh, uh, FAME uh, was the lead on that, also coming out of the governor's uh, recovery bill. Um, and that um, it, the, the rules were adopted and that's up and running. Um, there is work being done to make available Bridge English as a second language. Um, this has been a long time issue in Maine as more new Americans have been working in the field and this will help them uh, get the certifications that, uh, that they need. Um, we uh, put together an online recruitment and retention toolkit for providers this summer um, and that is online there and you've got the link um, it's really a compilation of the many, many types of resources that are available to employers uh, to uh, recruit and retain workers uh, in this area. I think we can go to the next slide. And back to you, Kim. All right, that's me. Um, so again, um, funded by both Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan and some specialized federal apprenticeship grants that we have received over the last year, DOL is focused on expanding healthcare pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs for the sector at large, with an emphasis on increasing representation within apprenticeship programs among communities that have been disproportionately uh, impacted by the pandemic. So current healthcare registered apprenticeship opportunities include um, occupations like medical assistant, CNA, nurse assistant, lots of specialized nursing occupations uh, with employers including Northern Light Health, Clover Manor, Lincoln Health, Maine Medical Center, Maine Med Medical Partners, uh, Maine General, St. Mary's, Penn Bay, and Penobscot Job Corps. Um, we are very excited to have just launched a uh, request for application process um, that is currently open to interested employers, industry associations, labor unions, education and training providers, and community-based organizations that are interested in expanding our current um, healthcare apprenticeship opportunities and pre-apprenticeship opportunities. Um, so increasing those wages among participating apprentices, making sure that we're keeping an eye on how apprenticeship, uh, we know apprenticeship um, helps with retention uh, with the employers, um, and then uh, the key is that we're also uh, focused on increasing the number of overall apprenticeships in Maine with a specific focus on increasing representation in apprenticeship programs among Black, Indigenous, and people of color, women, justice-involved individuals, and people with disabilities. Um, and again, uh, Maine Apprenticeship Program is a registered Maine Apprenticeship Program, um, is a well-established program um, that uh, reports quarterly on program participation, completion, wage growth, retention, demographics, 
Um, so we're really excited to measure um, and evaluate the effectiveness of these really new innovative approaches um, to brand new uh, pre-apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs. I'm gonna pass it back. Oh, no, that's me still, <laughs> a little bit. Paul, oh, is this one me? <laughs> yes, yes, yep. Excellent, all right. So this one I think is a nod to um, what we're now fondly calling healthcare training for me. Um, which has been a really great way to tie together the related work of Department of Labor, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Education and the Adult Ed uh, Department, Maine Community College System, and the UMaine System. Um, so healthcare training for me creates that centralized location for both employers and job seekers to be able to access training and training supports offered across the state. And most of those are right now offered at no or low cost thanks to federal and private funding. So this is really that no wrong door approach that connects employers and job seekers to training opportunities across the system. And it's um, using a quick information gathering process. Um, so this partnership has created a, a shared team that triages inquiries, those, that information gathering process. Um, it makes direct connections uh, to employers and job seekers to talk about training offerings, funding sources, and supportive services that are essential to meeting those training needs. Um, we're also integrating information about career pathways, related labor market information, um, and that allows for self-exploration and connections for those who require the information, but maybe not want, don't need that one-on-one -on -one assistance. And I'm going to keep on going here, I think, um, because uh, healthcare training for me um, provides a front door for something else that we're really excited about, and that's um, formally called the Training for Incumbent Healthcare Workers. Uh, we call it the tuition remission program. So we have uh, been designing our systems uh, for a launch late February, early March um, for a program that's gonna help healthcare workers gain skills to advance with their employer through financial support for advanced healthcare career uh, credentials. Um, so the tuition remission program is designed to work directly to address training needs of employers across uh, provider types and sizes and it includes physical, oral, and behavioral health. Um, the target is focused on working with employers to connect those incumbent uh, healthcare workers to entry-level jobs with training funding to support attaining the credentials to move up that career ladder. Um, so again, you're supporting retention and advancing the quality of care. Um, it is not exclusively fo focused on direct care. However, priority occupations for training uh, funding support includes CNA, CNAM, CRMA, and home health aid, among others, um, that are particularly relevant to these, uh, the, this direct care workforce. Uh, the initial focus of the training support will be on technical training, um, though that leads to recognized credential, um, though as needed, we can expand into support for foundation, foundational skills in education, which we understand um, is a great need among a lot of our direct care workers. Um, so that could include contextualized math and English, including English language learning. Um, the initiative is in, designed to increase participation in and completion of upskilling credentials, increase the average wage among healthcare workers, and increase worker retention in the field. And then the last one's on, my, on the slide too, um, and that is our healthcare career navigators. Um, so it's great when individuals know exactly where they're going and how to get there. Um, that sometimes is the exception rather than the rule. So healthcare training for me also connects individuals who've struggled to connect with or to re-enter a healthcare career pathway through uh, the help of two healthcare career navigators. Now these folks are gonna be embedded in the career centers, um, but they'll also be um, on the triage side of uh, training for me so that they're able to connect with individuals who create the, uh, who complete the intake process and need that one-on-one -on -one assistance to create, create that person-specific employment and training plan navigate through those uh, training opportunities. Um, maybe uh, uh, they might need uh, some evaluation and translation of uh, prior credentials, um, or maybe they need just need that one-on-one -on -one connection to the healthcare job and apprenticeship opportunities that uh, currently exist, including those earn while you learn uh, opportunities that um, a lot of our individuals, our job seekers are so excited about. Um, so these navigators focus their work on incumbent workers in healthcare settings, struggling to move up, those who are interested in entering the field, foreign trained healthcare workers looking to become credentialed or move up into a related healthcare occupation, and on employers who are interested in connecting with those workers. 
Um, and of course, we're our, it's all about um, connection to training and jobs for that one. So we'll be capturing and measuring um, those successes using our main job link case management system. I think that's it for me. In terms of qualifications and training, there are a few things here that Kim's alluded to already, um, working with um, a wide range of provider associations to get uh, more input um, and assess what their needs are, um, and also the, uh, the no wrong door uh, approach that we're to uh, training opportunities and funding that uh, we're doing with the Department of Education, the university system, and the uh, community college system. Um, the third bullet on this slide, the Worker Portability and Advancement Initiative, um, you've heard before, um, this is now underway and we'll be uh, doing three public stakeholder meetings to get uh, more input about it. Uh, but you also heard from Mr. Darling just a few minutes ago that this issue came up in the focus groups, which was a nice surprise to us that workers are, would actually like to see uh, a more universal entry level credential that they could obtain uh, and then um, advance from there. So uh, we continue to be focused on at a minimum uh, creating a, a base credential from the uh, PSS, personal support specialist and direct support professional DSP um, and uh, Office of Behavioral Health is also participating with us and we're looking at the um, MHRT1 to see if it also makes sense to roll that into um, a base credential. So moving on to uh, the next slide, um, natural support systems and consumer direction. These are both, uh, these are sort of related, slightly different. Um, uh, and they, they both seek to um, expand the workforce essentially through uh, family members and friends. Um, so in, one, in the one case, natural support systems, you know, the, the caregiver work that you heard about at the very start of the morning uh, with the ombudsman, um, helping to assess needs of caregivers and support them so that people don't uh, necessarily need to enter the formal care system and or uh, uh, it can be uh, supplemented um, and or their entry can be delayed. Um, so uh, we uh, are doing some work on that. In terms of consumer direction, um, this is where uh, the services that you would otherwise get from an agency, uh, we can pay a family member or a friend or someone uh, that you identify to, uh, to, um, to provide the care. This has been, um, in the programs where we already have it, this has been more popular uh, during COVID, probably uh, for a couple of reasons. One, certainly uh, increasingly difficult to get agency staff uh, to provide the care, uh, but also in some cases, people feeling um, safer with family members or uh, people in their bubble, so to speak, providing the care rather than uh, people coming from agencies. Um, in any case, this is a big thrust for all of our programs. Uh, we have expanded self-direction on an emergency basis for um, Section 18, that's brain injury, and Section 20, other related conditions, and we've just submitted another uh, emergency uh, K uh, amendment to our waiver to um, allow for self-direction in section 29. Uh, that was something that um, the Developmental Disabilities Council uh, did some preliminary work on a couple years ago. Um, we built on that with a, a work group in the past year. Um, there's strong support from um, uh, a group of families that would very much like to do this. So we're gonna try it with section 29 um, as we work out some of the more difficult issues uh, with section 21, but we wanna do it there as well going forward. Um, next slide. Um, public assistance, a couple of things happening here. Um, there is an Aspire pilot uh, that has begun in which participants are screened for interest in healthcare programs. And then they're enrolled in the uh, healthcare careers on-ramp program. Um, so with a, um, some preliminary uh, uh, training, they can do some work uh, right away. It doesn't, it doesn't get them a CNA, but it, it allows them to work 
uh, and um, and see if it's something that they're interested in, and then we'll help hook them up with um, with the uh, more training and and uh, permanent certification uh, for those who uh, want to continue. A lot of interest in uh, people being able to look at uh, the um, what's the impact on their uh, public assistance benefits uh, if they uh, work more hours, for example, um, and look, being able to look um, farther out for, um, you know, if you advance in the field and your earnings go up, um, how you can actually um, uh, benefit financially over time by, uh, by working more hours. And so that benefits cliff tool um, in partnership with Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta uh, will be uh, piloted um, later this month. Um, the department did extend transitional main care from six months to 12 months uh, for individuals who lose main care due to earnings um, that happened in 2020. And that's a permanent change. It's not, a, um, not a, just an emergency policy. Um, and then OFI has regular ongoing engagement with its partners um, so that it can uh, make sure that people have access to these new tools and, and understand what the current policies are. Um, so finally, just looking at some um, limited data that we have um, for, you know, reflecting what's going on there in the market right now. Um, this is residential care capacity overall, uh, so all types. And um, the first uh, group are um, assisted housing facilities. And and that's the broad licensing categories that includes, you know, what we know of as residential care, PNMIs, waiver homes, assisted living. Um, this group actually grew a bit um, since May of 2020. You can see there that the number of facilities has gone up and the number of beds has gone up by about 728 uh, in that time period. So that um, uh, offsets some of the losses that we've had in uh, nursing homes during that same period of time, where you see um, the number of nursing homes has dropped from 93 to 88, and the number of beds has dropped by a couple of hundred. Um, so, um, you know, this is just interesting to see the offset. Um, and um, it is part of a long-term trend that Maine and lots of other states have seen um, of uh, less demand for nursing home care and more demand for other residential alternatives. And um, so we have seen that in the last couple of years uh, in Maine, uh, for sure. Going to the next slide, um, we have occupancy rates only for a couple of types, and those are the ones where we uh, occupancy is part of the reimbursement system, and so it is, um, it's tabulated uh, monthly as part of payment rates. Residential care facility level four, these are PNMICs and others that are, as I uh, was explaining earlier, these are um, folks that tend to have pretty significant needs uh, who might otherwise be in a nursing home. Um, and uh, the occupancy has started to creep back up in the past year in this category. Um, so from, you know, 82 to 84% uh, over the past year. But in nursing homes, um, nursing homes had another tough year in terms of occupancy uh, in November. They were at 73%. Uh, and that's undoubtedly linked to um, inability to to uh, to get sufficient staff because, among other things, the the um, the staffing requirements and ratios are higher in nursing facilities um, than they are in other types of residential care. Uh, looking at home care uh, quickly. Um, this first group of um, home care and related services are those that we provide through the main care program. Uh, no wait lists here. Uh, and for two of them, um, section 12 and 96, those are state plan services, so they would not be subject to a wait list. Section 19, our waiver, we could impose a wait list, but we haven't had to, which is good. 
Um, and uh, you can see that the two larger programs uh, both uh, served more people year over year, uh, which is good. Now, the downside here that is not on this slide, but it is in the report, um, is the, the percent of these folks who are partially uh, or fully unstaffed. In other words, they, they have a spot in the program, but we uh, aren't able to meet all of the hours in their care plan. Um, and that is creeping up uh, for the first uh, program, section 12, uh, went from 7% who had at least partially unstaffed hours to 9% of the, of the group. Uh, in section 19, it went from 30 to 34%. Uh, and in section 96, it went from 44% to 48%. So uh, those numbers definitely moving in the wrong direction. Um, next slide looks at our uh, state funded programs. We could go to the next slide, Molly. Thank you. Uh, and these, as you know, are these are general fund programs. And so when we reach the uh, limits of the appropriation, we, uh, we have a wait list and uh, wait lists are growing in these programs, as you can see here. Um, and also, again, the percent of um, participants uh, who are partially uh, or uh, not staffed uh, has been um, uh, growing in a couple of them. It's, it's about the same as it has been in section 63. It had been 45% uh, with partial staffing and it's 44 a year later. So essentially no change. Um, with the independent support services, this is the, um, the homemaker program. Some of you know it as um, that Catholic Charities operates. Um, unstaffed uh, participants has grown from 16 to 20% there. Uh, and the personal assistance program uh, is 2% uh, to 4%, so um, not, not significant in that program. So those are um, some highlights from the report. Um, there's more detail on all of these um, items um, in the report. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions now or later. Thank you for that. And uh, why don't we start with Representative Perry? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, just questions in terms of the uh, state funded programs. I noted that the uh, people, the number of people we're serving is decreasing. Uh, and yet, um, I, I guess the, the two things I'm wondering is some of that due to the ability to staff is some of that due to a decrease in funding? Um, it, we have not had decreases in funding, just to, uh, to be clear. We've, uh, we've had, um, in Section 63, for example, we've had flat funding for a number of years. As the, the waiting list um, sort of sits there, and so the dynamic in Section 63 is that we've had um, folks' acuity increase over time. And so uh, the number of hours, you know, if, if for example, the, uh, the average number of hours that uh, folks needed uh, in one year was 12 hours and the next year it might go up to 15 or 16. So the cost per care plan is increasing as the acuity rises. Um, that's not a bad thing necessarily uh, because it means we're able to keep people at home longer as their needs progress. Uh, but it does mean that over time, um, we are not able to serve more people. And in fact, we end up serving fewer. Can I ask another? Please. What, what happens to the people on the waiting list? Do they end up in nursing homes? Do, I mean, what are their resources as they're waiting for this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so by definition, the folks um, who are... Um, wanting to access our state funded programs are, are um, they don't meet the, the uh, financial standards for main care. So we know they're not going there. 
Um, often they are over on assets. Uh, and so it's likely that they're using some of their assets to purchase care if they can privately. Uh, but the real answer, Representative Perry, is we haven't studied that group, so we don't really know where they're going. Uh, Senator Baldacci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize if this is included in the materials that you provided yesterday to the committee. I haven't had a chance to read them, but I'd like to get an understanding of how much money has gone to the nursing homes uh, since we approved these uh, the budgetary changes and how much money is left to go. I Because I understand from my discussion with some nursing home um, those payments are, are not coming all at once, obviously, but how are they being broken up and how much has gone and how much is left to go? And when will it, and when will it be released? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna, uh, we'll have to get back to you. I know that, um, that our deputy commissioner man has um, all of those things racked up in terms of what each of the provider groups has seen for uh, payments in the over the last couple of years and what they're slated to get, but it's not not, not something I have at my ready disposal. I'm sorry. Okay, I'd also like the similar information about the direct care workers because is it my understanding that the retroactive increase has already happened or is it going to be implemented? has not been delivered yet or where, so where exactly are we with that retroactive increase? Yep, so the um, main care issued uh, uh, an update uh, yesterday uh, on those uh, increases. They have not been paid out yet. Um, they will be retroactive to January 1. Um, and this is the set of uh, payments that early on in the presentation I was noting that because inflation is uh, ended up being significantly higher than what was budgeted. Um, the minimum wage on January 1 ended up being higher than projected. And so uh, more funding is needed to top that off. But also um, the department is seeking to accelerate the cost of living adjustment for that, uh, for that group of agencies back to January 1 as well. Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director uh, Susia, thank you very much. Um, and uh, um, my question is re regards the, um, the statement you made uh, reporting um, the rate increase to 125% of minimum wage for identified LTSS services. Um, two, two quick questions. One is what exactly is the, what does it mean identified LTSS services? Because uh, we've heard about the PSS, the DSP, CNAs all performing similar roles. Um, the other is um, if the minimum wage is increased by 25%, what is the actual wage increase? In other words, were they all at minimum wage and now they're all 25% higher or where, how much do we know about what the actual augmentation was? Uh, so good questions. On the um, uh, indicated LTSS services, those were indicated in part quadruple A of the budget last year. And so uh, the ones that were that are slated for rate adjustments um, on January 1 um, are uh, primarily home and community based services. So um, uh, Section 12, the waiver program, Section 96, which is personal care, um, et cetera. Uh, and then other services were slated for um, an increase. Um, later, some of those are being um, accelerated and, and all of that is uh, in the message that uh, Main Care sent out um, last night. Um, second part of your question, I've already forgotten, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's fine. Um, I, the, the, actual, the minimum increased by 25%, what was oh, yeah. the actual increase? And so, um, in the, in the notice that Main Care sent out last night, um, there's a link to a rate table, which, which uh, tells the provider specifically what the new rate will be retro to January 1. Um, however, we don't really know what agencies pay their workers. So 
you know, we heard at the uh, agent caucus on Friday, for example, one employer said he's been paying 125% for the last couple of years. So it, that's to the, at the discretion of the um, employer. Uh, some are already there, some are not. Um, I think it, it depends on many factors, you know, how diverse their business is, what other sources of revenue they might have and so on. Okay, thank you for that. We're, we're learning more about that, by the way, though. One of the exciting things about our bonus uh, initiative uh, that we're doing is we're collecting uh, information from the participants uh, in, of that initiative on uh, 20,000 direct care workers that we have not had in the past. So that's going to really help us and you and uh, everybody in trying to understand and get a handle on what's going on out there. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I just forwarded that notice to the committee so that you have that in your inboxes. Thank you, Molly. Representative Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Saucier. This question is likely uh, directed more at Ms. Moore. Thank you for being here today. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the strength of uh, the connections between um, um, healthcare training for me, the healthcare navigators, um, um, the DOL and these efforts um, with um, the FedCap folks in the field uh, and that um, pool of um, potential uh, participants in these programs. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, through the Career Center Network, um, FedCap, DHHS are really strong partners in our Career Center Network. Um, that's federally legislated, so they have to be a partner, but also they are, they are a very good partner. Um, so career centers statewide have regional relationships with each of the FedCap offices. Um, some of them meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, customers, FedCap or Aspire participants um, who are active job seekers. Uh, we offer workshops, we offer information sessions, and then we collaborate around job fairs. Um, so there is an existing strong connection. Um, and I should, though, of course, it can always be stronger. Um, and then the other piece that I would mention is that um, healthcare training for me, unfortunately, has not quite launched yet. Uh, the launch will coordinate with the launch of um, both of the community college systems uh, funding opportunities and our tuition remission, um, which is, again, going to be probably toward the end of February, early March. Um, so the collaboration has been internal at first, getting the system designed, getting the uh, website working uh, as seamlessly as possible, uh, working on the information sharing and triaging form. Um, but yes, uh, FedCap Aspire uh, participants will be intentionally um, invited to participate in this system, whether it's through this training for me, whether it's um, being used as a tool, um, or whether or not they need to actually go through the triage system and get one-on-one -on -one support from additional staff. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, mine is just a comment, uh, Director Saucier, that it, I look forward to seeing that spreadsheet from uh, uh, Deputy Director Mann. Um, we, we get questions all the time about when are certain things supposed to happen, and it has to be quantitated in a way that we can understand it by section and along with a timeline. Uh, it, it's coming. It hasn't helped. Um, it's, it's helpful to know that it's coming, but it hasn't helped the folks who are struggling. So that's why I want to, to know as precisely as we can about uh, the different sections and how they've been um, addressed over the last year or two in terms of total dollars going to that area, those areas. So we look forward to that uh, and being better able to ask, uh, answer our constituent questions. Great, understood and fair enough. Complicated, complicated, complicated. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, so thank you, Director Schuster, for being here. Thank you, uh, Kim Moore, for coming along and joining us too and filling us in a bunch. So we will, uh, I guess Molly has the to-dos and uh, we'll expect, we'll look forward to getting that information back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes the um, learning session part of the morning. And um, I will check in with Anna so that I don't mess up the calendar again. 
Are there other items on the agenda that you'd like to get to now or you think we can get to now? Um, yes, we're expecting report backs on their reports from Representatives Jabner and Representative Sager. And how does that work today for Representative uh, Javner, since you're the first one I see in the... <laughs> Are you prepared for a report back this morning? Absolutely. All right. Welcome. Your floor is yours. Thank you very much, Senator Claxton. I appreciate that greatly. You guys can thank me because I actually had homework for you, but I forgot to let everybody know. So I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I have the Public Drinking Water 2020 Annual Report, um, part of the main Center for Disease Control and Prevention within the Department of Health and Human Services. They are responsible for making sure that Maine's public water systems comply with federal and state regulations. Their mission statement is they work to ensure safe drinking water by administering and enforcing drinking water and subsurface wastewater regulations and providing educational, technical, and financial assistance. The United States is one of the safest water supplies in the world. Over 286 million Americans consume tap water from public water systems. Um, the contamination can occur in source water and the distribu distribution system. Contaminations include naturally occurring chemicals and minerals such as arsenic, radon, uranium, local land use practices, fertilizers, which I think we're all very familiar with recently, uh, pesticides, manufacturing processes, sewer overflows and wastewater releases, some adverse health effects, um, gastrointestinal illnesses, reproductive issues, neurological disorders, and even some cancers. What is a public water system? It's delivered through pipes and other constructed conveyances to at least 15 service connections or serve a minimum average of 25 people for at least 60 days per year. There are community water systems, and those are the municipal water districts, apartment buildings, nursing homes, mobile home communities. Non-community water systems are transient, which are gas stations, parks, campgrounds, hotels, motels, restaurants, and golf courses. And non-transient are schools, factories, office buildings, and hospitals. Maine is a water-rich state. 4,537 square miles of surface waters, about 1,900 public water systems that use surface or ground water. However, um, in 2020, Maine experienced drought. So even though we're water wealthy, 2020 brought these conditions that was difficult to deal with at times. During this time, the drinking water program offered support to public water systems. They emailed updates and resources to aid drought preparation, response, and recovery. The drinking water system partnered with other state agencies during this time, which was led by MEMA. Regulatory highlights, PFAS. DWS partnered with Maine EPA to perform three rounds of PFAS testing statewide in select high priority areas. With the signing of LD-129, all community public water systems and non-transient, non-community schools and childcare facilities are required to sample finished drinking water for PFAS by December 31st, 2022. An interim standard of 20 parts per trillion, I believe is what it is, PPT, for six PFAS is in effect. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing much more about that. So lead and copper, LD-153 requires all schools to test their water use for drinking and culinary purposes for lead, which we just heard a very thorough report on the other day. And I hope everyone has looked up your district schools. It's a very important information. So some proposed revisions are that the EPA has proposed revisions to the lead and copper rule that are intended to identify additional sources of lead drive more lead service line replacements and require lead testing in schools and childcare facilities. The compliance deadline is October 16th, 2024. Affected public water systems are advised to begin working on a lead service line inventory for both the public and private portion of all system service lines ASAP. Cybersecurity, my favorite. Computer security issues can seriously impact daily operations at a drinking water or slash wastewater utility. 
Cybersecurity has become increasingly concerning, especially during the past year when more people are working from home and are on less secure networks. Yikes. Some tips for cybersecurity. One, implement multi-factor authorization. I hope you guys are all doing that with your own personal uh, devices as well. My IT son makes sure I have lots of uh, multi-factor authorization set up. Two, keep your software updated. Three, include a cybersecurity section in all emergency response plans. Four, check in with the CISA.gov for alerts and updates. I have to admit, I am not registered with them. Water systems that suspect they have experienced cybersecurity incidents should contact their public water system inspector and local law enforcement immediately. The DWS has four principles. Number one, source protection. Two is sampling. Three is the treatment. And four is maintaining pipes and storage tanks. And at that junction, I thought I was going to get credit for two reports because then they start talking about the state revolving fund, but it was just a simple mention. So I think Representative Griffin has that report for us later on in our session. So the end. (laughs) So this this has been part of our annual tradition to have uh, Representative Javna do the water report. And uh, I should have thought of that before I uh, put her first, because poor Representative Zager now has to follow that. But I'll go to Senator Moore first. Well, my only question, Representative Javner, what we have no quiz what, like we've had in the past. Wow. Yeah. I know you can thank my grandson for that because he's he keeps me very busy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that report. <laughs> we'll call that an excused absence. Um, then uh, then we'll ask, uh, we'll go to Representative Zager. Is today a good day for a report, sir? Uh, it is, um, and I could uh, accelerate, uh, I, could, uh, I could fit within the committee's uh, preference. I, I, have, I have two, two reports, um, they're, they're relatively brief. One is regarding this, uh, it's the, uh, the state treasurer's report on the tobacco settlement. Um, and the other is um, relating to um, stemming from LD48, uh, uh, the resolve to see what um, DHHS is doing uh, to um, reduce homelessness or fight the intersection of, of, uh, of poor health and homelessness and poverty and homelessness. We're going to have a couple of other chances to talk about the trust. So maybe that report could go with one of those and we hear about homelessness today. Okay, so um, this is um, uh, a letter from Director Ferbert um, re- uh, from the Office of Main Care, which stemmed from LD48, which was Representative Brennan's um, LD, uh, we heard last year, but also stemming from the 2019, uh, 2019 um, um, resolve. Uh, resolve. Uh, the Main Care has been working with a group of stakeholders. Um, housing advocates, uh, interest groups, community support, uh, care teams, main housing, with a couple of overarching goals. One is to figure out um, for the main care population, how to ensure service continuity. So people who are receiving housing supports, um, but then um, things improve and then they no longer qualify for one program. How do they, they might, they might qualify for another program and how can that continuity be maintained? Um, and the other is the uh, comprehensive um, uh, uh, you know, to make sure that um, there are um, transitional supports and, uh, and also access to primary care, behavioral health care, and community-based care services as they intersect with, um, with home, homelessness issues. Um, this reminded me, and it may remind other members of the committee, of, of the intersectionality that is implicit in the FUSE legislation uh, to see how housing and health and other other factors all kind of combine. Um, there has been uh, work with um, a federal home health authority um, that uh, enables achievement of these goals. And this model has been um, used here um, to help people move from dependency, dysregulation and fragmented care to one of coordinated uh, continuous uh, care and, and independence. Um, staffing models, 
um, they, they came to consensus on a staffing model um, to uh, regarding member ratios, um, also uh, figuring out different tiers from intensive to uh, stabilization to maintenance as people's situation improves, which is the intent of the program. And this is called the home program. Uh, Director Probert also referenced uh, rulemaking, which um, a la uh, Anna Broom, I, I, uh, I was able to uh, get my hands on and review. Um, as, and so I just got to give a shout out where give credit where credit is due. Um, so this rulemaking um, just had its the end of its hearing uh, or the its, uh, comment period end about a, 10 days or so ago. And um, it goes into detail on, on how the home, uh, pro, uh, the, the rules for the home uh, program uh, were made. Um, it talks about staffing as well as the function. Um, it, um, it, it, it basically more details of what I was just talking about, the, the principles I was just talking about. Going forward, stakeholders also expressed an interest in exploring options for developing an additional supportive housing services benefit, possibly including a 24 seven staffing for a shelter or support services tied to a specific location like in a housing complex. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I will um, conclude um, and see if anyone has questions or would like me to um, elaborate on anything. Thank you, Representative Zager. Are there any questions for the representatives? I'm not seeing any, which is puzzling, but thank you very much for, uh, for offering that up. Um, We've been well served by the uh, reports we got today. So thank you. It's, and it's good, to, it's good to close those loops and get some of that feedback. We, we, we legislate and then uh, this is a great opportunity to follow up and check on whether it's been impactful or not. So that's good. Anything else we need to accomplish this morning? Uh, I see a head shake from the person who knows most. So Anna has said that we could accept the nominee, accept the motion to adjourn until one o'clock when we resume with three hearings. We'll begin with 1729, uh, Senator Stewart's bill, and then we'll go to a consideration of psilocybin and uh, last will be a discussion about a syringe exchange program. So everybody comfortable adjourning until one o'clock. We will see you then.
Hi. Did you Hi. did you see the um Michelle, you need to mute yourself. There you go. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye
So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session on Health and Human Services uh, Joint Standing Committee. We'll be hearing three bills this afternoon in order first with 1729, then with 1582, and then with 1909. Let's quickly go around and introduce ourselves for folks who weren't there this morning, beginning with Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sam Zager, District 41, Portland. And uh, Representative Perry. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Perry. I represent House District 140, which includes the communities of Indian Township, Babyville, Bering, Callis, Charlotte, Robinson, Perry, Pembroke, and Pleasant Point. Senator Baldacci. Joe Baldacci, I represent Senate District 9, which is the city of Bangor and the town of Herman. Thank you. Representative Griffin. Good afternoon. My name is Abigail Griffin. I represent House District 102, which is Glenburn, Kodeskig, and Levant. Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Margaret Craven, and I represent House District 59, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Madigan. Good afternoon, I'm Colleen Madigan. I represent House District 110, which is part of Waterville and part of Oakland. Representative Javner. Good afternoon, I'm Representative Kathy Javner and I represent House District 141, which is located in Penobscot and Washington counties. Senator Moore. Good afternoon, I'm Marianne Moore and I represent Senate District 6, which is all of Washington County, as well as Goldsboro, Winter Harbor and Sullivan in Hancock County as well. Representative Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Michelle Meyer, serving Southern Maine's House District 2, which is Elliott and parts of Kittery and South Berwick. And I'm Ned Claxton. I am honored to represent Senate District 20, which consists of Auburn, Minot, Mechanic Falls, Poland, and New Gloucester. Uh, I see Representative Lemelin. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Lemlin. I represent House District 88, Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield, and half of Noblebro. Thank you. And our staff, Sam, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sam Seneff, uh, analyst with the Office of Policy and Legal Analysis. And Karen, when you're off the phone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Thomas. I am the clerk for the Health and Human Services Committee. My email is hhs at legislature.main.gov. Thanks so much, Senator. And so we'll have uh, Senator Stewart here. Welcome to introduce the first bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, good afternoon to my friends and colleagues on the Health and Human Services Committee. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Committee on Health and Human Services. I'm State Senator Trey Stewart. And I have the distinct honor of representing 51 communities in Aroostook and Penobscot counties. I'm here before you today to present LD 1729, a resolve to, access, to assess the feasibility of the production of insulin in Maine. Serving on the Health Coverage, Insurance and Financial Services Committee over the past four, uh, should say two years, sorry. Uh, I've had, I have heard hours of testimony uh, on the access to and affordability of healthcare. Many Mainers live on a fixed income 
and particularly now with inflation and energy costs on the rise, individuals have to make the very difficult decision of paying an electric bill or, a, or purchasing a life-saving drug such as analog insulin. Around 7.5 million Americans depend on insulin to stay alive and rationing is not uncommon. In fact, it wasn't too many years back that, that a Maynard uh, tragically died from rationing. When the insulin patient was turned over to, uh, sorry, when the in insulin patent was turned over to the University of Toronto in 1923, it was done so for around $1, which today would be about $14. Even from the 1990s, when a, when a vial of insulin was around $25, the price of analog insulin has dramatically increased. Certainly a type one diabetic paying 300 plus dollars per vial and they, were, uh, and they, and they require uh, multiple vials per month. While the purchasing price has dramatically increased, the manufacturing price remains very low. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this topic and have likely voted on legislation to address the, st the steep cost of healthcare. We have a copay cap in Maine, but that does not help people who are uninsured or with high deductibles. You may also hear, uh, you, you may also hear that there are programs in place to lessen the financial burden to consumers, but like every program, there are always individuals left out. While I appreciate the strides being made by insurance companies and some pharmaceuticals, I estimate 43%, uh, an estimate of 43% of 18 to 25 year olds in the United States are still rationing their insulin. According to a letter from Chairwoman uh, Maloney of the United States House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Reform, she said, quote, these drug companies have specifically targeted the US market for higher prices, even while cutting prices in other countries because weaknesses in our healthcare system have allowed them to get away with outrageous prices and anti-competitive conduct. An article from the Institute of New England Economic Thinking, uh, sorry, New Economic Thinking, established in September, 2020 stated, quote, the billions of dollars of public funding demanded by the private sector to pursue these products, referring to drugs and vaccines, vividly illustrates the industry's reliance on public funding for the development of products that address the public's most pressing needs, end quote. Let me be clear, I'm a capitalist and I believe in the power of free markets, but a market that's allowed to artificially inflate prices rather than let market forces dictate prices is not capitalism, it's exploitation. Capitalism necessarily requires competition balancing the price point through supply and demand economic principles, none of which exist today in the insulin market. So how do we address the cost of a life-saving drug that is less than $20 to manufacture? I believe we can do it right here in Maine. Here ago, I lead. In speaking with Dr. Chris Alvarado, the idea was formed to create a commission to study the feasibility of manufacturing insulin in Maine. Dr. Alvarado is very familiar with, this, with the issue of accessibility and costs associated with insulin as a medical doctor and as a father of a child with diabetes. He has a lot to offer to this conversation and you'll have the opportunity to hear from him later today. Over the last nine months or so, we have been meeting with individuals that have, had, that have an interest in this project and some of whom are, are, are already working to make insulin more readily available in other states. Thankfully, some of those folks are here with us today and I do wanna appreciate uh, the chairs rearranging the schedule this afternoon to accommodate their schedules as some of them are doctors with patients that they'll be seeing later today. As for the commission formed through this bill, it would, be, uh, it would be convened of individuals from various backgrounds and expertise and tasked with identifying the number of low-income insulin dependent individuals in Maine. It would also assess the feasibility of the University of Maine, state, uh, University of Maine system, state and private entities manufacturing insulin in Maine long-term co costs and savings to producing and, and distributing the insulin, potential regulatory and legal obstacles, and available alternatives to providing insulin to low-income individuals at low or no cost. The commission will provide a report to this committee based on their findings by January 1st of next year. Per the suggestions of the group, I am requesting that this resolve be amended to include additional areas of feasibility. These include copay caps and an analysis of their actual impact for insulin dependent Mainers, potential for the new state, uh, sorry, potential for the new state to engage in purchasing insulin in bulk, 
opportunities for an interstate compact with other New England states or other states, a model facility to manufacture and supply insulin to Maine residents, funding for this project specifically, opportunities to establish a, a, a public entity to manage insulin production and distribution with the possibility of eventual transition to a privately funded entity. I would ask that this committee also amend the bill to include a resident of the state of Maine who is insulin dependent and a representative from a diabetes advocacy organization who does not receive funding from pharmaceutical organizations within the state to sit on this commission. Additionally, I think a federal pilot project uh, might be a good starting point. So a letter from the legislature to the Centers for Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services and to the Federal Drug Administration expressing support for a federal pilot program focused on the domestic manufacture and distribution of low cost analog insulin would also be included with this LR. So here's what we know. Mainers are struggling to afford insulin. Taxpayer costs around the country are already paying a large sum of the billions of dollars being used uh, to research drugs. The actual manufacturing costs are minimal and type one diabetics in the United States are paying significantly more for their life-saving analog insulin than those in other countries. Lots of great ideas have come from this state and the University of Maine is already being recognized nationally for their projects uh, that have come out of the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. With your support, the commission will will have access to the feasibility of manufacturing and, distribu and distributing insulin here in Maine. And I believe, uh, and, and if believed to be feasible, it would create a model for the country with partnerships between the states, University of Maine, other research organizations within and outside of Maine, and private organizations to supply insulin for low income insulin dependent Mainers. Beyond that point, this problem impacts all insulin dependent Mainers regardless of income level, and has the potential to change the dynamics at play in this space for everyone with type one diabetes in Maine. People should not have to choose between keeping their home heated on a cold winter day or affording a drug that keeps uh, that their body depends on to survive. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions that this committee might have at this time. Thank you, Senator Stewart. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Yes, Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator. Um, do you know of any other states where a bill like this might, ha might be, have been successful and had some kind of impact um, on, on, on the costs for their state? Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, I'm aware of at least two out in the western part of the country, uh, California being one of them that um, attempted somewhat of a similar approach. Um, and I believe either Washington or Oregon, I can't remember which off the top of my head. Uh, I think that there's some others who are going to testify behind me that might be able to share um, some of that perspective on, on what's happened in those other states, where they're at in that process, because it's not a, you know, sort of wave the magic wand and, and it all gets done uh, sort of thing, but um, it's something that will take a significant amount of time um, and a long-term strategy in order to um, effectively accomplish. But I do think that partnering with other states and, and being better able, particularly in a small state like Maine, being better able to, you know, capitalize on economies of scale uh, is a smart way to, you know, go about doing it. And that's why we've included that in, in, uh, in the proposed amendment. And hopefully you all have a copy of that amendment in front of you. I know I work with Sam, uh, your committee analyst on that over the interim. Um, so uh, we're, we're working off of sort of both documents at the same time here. So, Mr. Chair, did you, uh, I might have blanked out there for a moment on my, my internet connection. Did you recognize me? Oh, oh okay. Everybody oh. seems to be muted. Yeah, Senator Claxton, you're muted. <laughs> yes, I did recognize you, Senator Zager, while I was muted. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Senator Stewart, thank you so much for uh, this. Is uh, would be phenomenal to uh, increase access uh, of insulin to, to Mainers. Um, I'm wondering why just insulin. Um, there's a lot of drugs that have that would fit the description that, that you've um, you've described of of there this being this this bizarre 
um, non-market market place that we have in with drugs um, sometimes. Um, and uh, so I'm just wondering as you formulated the, the bill, um, was it technical reasons? Was, was it other reasons? Um, uh, could you please share with us your thinking on that? Yeah, thank you, Representative. There's a variety of um, answers to that question. I mean, you're right that there are other, you know, necessary drugs to sustain human life that some folks are, um, you know, relying on. Um, I think several fold answer to your question. First being that there seems to be a desire within Maine to specifically address insulin, at least in the time that I've been in the legislature these last few terms. It seems to cut across party lines and seems to be a pretty good place to start. Um, I think there's a general acknowledgement there that uh, insulin is, is different from a lot of other, particularly more modern drugs, um, given the specific you know story around the initial creation of the drug and the patent around it about 100 years ago, um, and, and the idea that this was never intended from, you know, the, the, the creator of the drug, uh, more so than other, you know, pharmaceuticals that may have been developed since that time, this was never supposed to be a big money maker for pharmaceutical companies. This was supposed to be something that was sold and given to the world by the people that invented it. Um, and, and again, is really just more of a starting point with this. And I think, you know, perhaps if we can do this with insulin, there may be other opportunities to do so as well. And I think that um, what you'll find too, as time goes on, that there are some folks that are working on um, that exact dynamic, right? How do you get, particularly on the generic side, how do you get some, um, uh, you know, generic drugs that are uh, necessary to sustain human life um, into the hands of the people that need them at, at, at low or no cost to them and, and try to figure out a way to be creative in how you do that. Thank you. I appreciate your, appreciate the bill. Representative Perry. Yes, thank you. Um, and this may be for people coming forward as well. Uh, the development of the manufacture of a, any drug requires a great deal of science. And uh, it is a pretty big venture uh, uh, to do this. It will not be an inexpensive investment uh, to bring and start up something new uh, that requires the kind of um, sanitized work with the machines, keeping the machines going, getting the, uh, uh, there's a lot, my son works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer and I have been through it and have really seen the kind of work that has to be done. Um, and uh, I would like to know more about what other states are doing because we do have to make this affordable. Uh, but it won't be an inexpensive venture. And I guess that's really my biggest concern. You're absolutely right about that, uh, Representative. And, um, and I, I too, I've toured, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, and, and, and development plants before uh, and have had the opportunity to see the process that that goes through. Um, insulin is not one of those drugs, right? The reality is that there's not a tremendous amount of R&D expense um, because the patent is what the patent is. And, and um, you know, it's existed for such a long time. You're absolutely right. I think that uh, particularly on those cutting edge pharmaceuticals that, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, you know, cures for cancer and, and other serious, uh, you know, uh, illnesses and diseases. Um, what I've often found is that because of the, the heavy expense for those drugs, um, the ones that are more of sort of the cash cow often become used to, um, you know, sustain the R and D expense on those other pharmaceutical R and D, uh, sort of ventures. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of drugs don't ever make it to market, right. But there is an expense that is incurred by these companies. Um, and this is not meant to, you know, sort of disrupt, uh, that research and development because it's critical and modern medicine needs to be able to continue to advance if we are going to be able to, you know, one day find a cure for, um, you know, uh, cancer or for um, any other uh, disease that we currently don't. And so um, it, it is, however, more geared towards developing a plan to find ways to get creative about it, right? And to figure out something that it's been around for a hundred years, 
Uh, and if there is a single drug out there that we should be able to figure out a way to get in the hands of, of main people um, at a lower cost and in a sustainable way that doesn't make us dependent on you know, foreign countries or, or, or foreign uh, companies uh, to be able to do that, um, I think that's worth looking into. And that's effectively what this bill does, right? This is not say that overnight, we're going to just start manufacturing insulin, right? That's not realistic. But what it does put in motion, I think, um, is a set of proposals, a set of ideas that we could then march down the line and see what would actually work and what might not work. Are there any other questions for uh, Senator Stewart? I don't see any. So as is our tradition, we start with alphabetical order. So I'll hear from Anthony DeFranco at this point. If you'd like to unmute and share your thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Anthony DeFranco. I've had type 1 diabetes since 2005, and my parents and grandparents all uh, had or have type 2 diabetes. My mother uses insulin now, and my father relied on insulin until he died from complications of diabetes in 2004. Um, I'm also the founder and president of the Open Insulin Foundation, which is an effort to make open source means for producing insulin and to organize the production of insulin under the direct control of the users of the insulin. We found in preliminary studies that insulin can be produced safely and economically at a small scale using techniques similar to those that contract manufacturers use to produce biologic drugs for clinical trials, uh, academic research, and small commercial production runs and personalized medicine applications. The approximate cost of doing that is projected to be about $7 per vial, which is far below the list prices of several hundred dollars per vial that diabetics without sufficient health coverage face. Uh, also in collaboration with Roger Erickson of Interbiome, which is a nonprofit biologic manufacturer, we determined that small scale manufacturing facilities that could each serve the needs of about several hundred thousand insulin dependent diabetics could be established at a cost of about 10 to $20 million each, which includes the cost of regulatory compliance in the US uh, system, as well as the physical plant. And this means that uh, local or regional networks of production centers could easily meet the needs of many people going without, of the many people going without sufficient insulin now, and could also form a basis for uh, expanding such a production network to uh, meet needs uh, regarding other drugs. Um, worldwide, we estimate that around a million people a month die for lack of insulin, uh, which makes the insulin access problem one of the deadliest phenomena in history, uh, roughly comparable in scale to the Second World War. Uh, Maine shares in this burden and now has the opportunity to lead in solving this problem by carrying out a comprehensive and actionable study on local insulin production and distribution. So I would like to, uh, to say that I uh, support this bill and uh, yield to questions now. Thank you, sir, for that testimony. Are there any questions of Anthony DeFranco? I forgot to mention that there's a three, a three minute timer, but you didn't hit the, you didn't hit the mark. So Senator Moore didn't have to speak up and say 30 seconds. Um, so now we'll go to Cristobal Alvarado, doctor. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Claxton, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Meyer and, and other members of the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, my name is Cristobal Alvarado. I'm here to testify in support of 1729 to create such a commission. And I, I wanna emphasize what uh, Senator Stewart said before, you know, President Biden has emphasized several times recently that capitalism without competition is exploitation. And, uh, you know, there's really no better way to describe the situation that currently exists in insulin manufacturing pricing. Um, I submitted some written testimony because I understand I'm only limited to three minutes and I could probably speak for two hours on this. But in, in that written testimony, I, I refer to some graphs that show you uh, very explicitly that this is a relatively recent problem. This has really only started around the turn of the century. And over the last 20 years, prices have gone from about $20 per vial, which they were when I was training in surgery, to the th current $300 in, a, a vial that most people are exposed to in some way. Um, you know, Senator Stewart talked about Dr. Banting, and I just want to add that, you know, when Dr. Banting sold his patent for a dollar to the University of Toronto, he specifically said 
uh, that he, he was doing that so that no patient would ever be unable to afford insulin. And, you know, if we fast forward a century now, uh, there are just three companies that dominate the entire market and insulin prices have risen in lockstep uh, because of that control that they have over the price. I think it's really critical to understand that this is largely because even small changes in the basic insulin molecule allow the companies to use patent protection laws to protect what are now considered new insulins. Even though the cost of manufacture remains, as Anthony pointed out, in almost all cases, less than $10 a vial. So part of that tragedy in the recent explosion in insulin prices is that there's really been no comparable increase in quality. Um, when I was training, Lispro and Glargine were two forms of insulin that were used extensively. They're very safe and they're currently off patent and considered generic and could easily form the bulk of any needed supply. Um, you know, I want to applaud the Maine legislature for taking the lead nationally in addressing this problem and, and recently passing a law that caps insulin copays. That's a very encouraging and helpful first step. Um, but unfortunately, I think we still need to address the root cause of the problem. Um, someone is still paying exorbitant prices, and, and usually that's either through insurance premiums or through the government. Um, and so I guess what we're asking you for is authorization to create this commission to, to study the feasibility of a, a potentially definitive solution. Um, you know, simply put, if the insulin companies insist on constraining supply and inflating price, why not just give them competition and make insulin ourselves? Um, 30 seconds. Thank you very much. I, you know, I also want to point out that, you know, producing our own necessary medications fits well with the independence and self-sufficiency Mainers are known for. And, and I think we should consider this type of program as maybe providing proof of concept for other drugs, diuretics, beta blockers, anti-asthmatics. Um, as Senator Stewart pointed out, though, insulin really is in a class by itself. It's a life-sustaining drug, and it's very, very easy to make since we have 100 years of history. So thank you very much for the opportunity to address your committee. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for submitting the uh, written version. That's always appreciated. Are there any questions for Dr. Alvarado? I will note that we did have a couple of uh, suggestions in the uh, chat box, which we don't use during the meeting. And I'll ask Sam if he can't include those links that were offered by Anthony DeFranco and add those to Anthony's testimony. So they, they're findable for the committee and anybody else who wants to, to uh, uh, peruse them. Okay, so uh, next we'll go to Hillary Kosh. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, three minutes isn't enough. I, I sure hope you ask me questions. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Hillary Koch and I live in Water, Waterville. Um, I've had a lot of jobs in my lifetime. I've been a teacher, a college instructor. I've actually been a policy manager for the US division of an international company where I've worked on federal insulin bills. So I really hope that you'll ask me some questions. Um, but the most important job that I've ever held is actually being my son's pancreas. My youngest son was diagnosed with type one diabetes when he was two and a half years old. Um, type one diabetes, as you know, is an autoimmune disease. My son is insulin dependent and without artificial insulin, within hours, his blood will start to turn acidic and he will die a painful death within days. So my primary job now for 13 and a half years has been to be his pancreas. Um, when he was diagnosed, I learned very quickly that insulin was life-sustaining, but that it could also kill him. So it's this balancing act. If I give too much, he could die. If I give too little, he could die. So our job as parents, we know, is to keep our children healthy and safe. Now imagine learning that one mistake as a parent could also kill your child. Yet it's not enough to worry about managing diabetes. We now must also worry about how to afford insulin. On average, it costs $5 to make one vial of insulin, but without insurance, a three month supply of my son's insulin is $3,399.99. 
This excludes the supplies needed to get the insulin in his body and all of the other things that we need to manage his diabetes. Now, it's actually easy to believe Big Pharma when they tell you that things like PBMs drive up the prices or that they offer things like patient's assistance programs to provide those in needs with access to insulin. Also things that I hope you'll ask me about. But I promise you, this is simply not true. Eli Lilly, Novo Nordics, and Sanofi set the list prices. They've abused the patent system to prevent competition with cartel-like practices, and they've raised prices by over 1,200%. We know that one in four Americans ration their insulin because they can't afford it. Last year, with LD673, we heard doctors and patients testify about times that people couldn't afford their insulin. We heard from three people who lost loved ones due to insulin rationing, including Maynard Catherine, Catherine Began, who lives down the street from me, whose son died due to insulin rationing. I've even had to in ration my son's insulin when our insurance company tried to switch him to a different brand. My son also testified last year. He told um, the committee how he wanted to be a normal teenager who th thinks about things like basketball, yet he worries about what will happen when he grows up. My 15-year-old is afraid to grow up, not because he doesn't want to be an adult, but because he doesn't want to die because he's afraid he won't be able to afford his insulin. Now, I've actually passed, helped to pass several insulin bills here in Maine, including two emergency bills and a copay cap. I want to be clear, these are really important steps, but none of these has ever done anything to lower the price of insulin. Now, I'd love to talk about these bills, but I'm telling you that LD1729 is really essential in tackling the insulin price crisis. Now, my son also has something called hydro hydrocephalus. This is an incurable disease that has led to five neurosurgeries in his lifetime, four of which were emergency surgeries. So when I say the following to you, I really want you to understand the seriousness and the gravity of my words. There is nothing more important to me than making insulin affordable. LD1729 is similar to legislation adopted in two other states, and it is essential for Maine to take important steps to make insulin affordable for Mainers. I encourage you to support LD1729, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for that testimony, and you must be doing okay as a pancreas because he's uh, 15. Listen, truly, as a pancreas, he, he and I were rocking it. So that's that's the easy stuff. This is what I have time to work on. Representative Madigan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a question. I just want to welcome Hillary. And um, thank you also for mentioning uh, Kathy Began, who's a good friend of my family and uh, losing Nick, her son, because he was rationing insulin um, was just a travesty. It didn't need to happen. So well, thank you. At, thank you, Representative Madigan, because you're the one that introduced me to her. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel obliged to at least ask you a question about the uh, pharmaceutical support for people who are on insulin and how uh, porous and ad inadequate that is, he says judgmentally. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they offer, they, they, they love to tout their patient assistance programs for people who can't afford insulin. So here's the problem with it. First of all, they're not regulated. Um, they can be offered and taken away at any moment. Um, there's no guarantee of them and the requirements for them are constantly changing. So what they say are requirements to get into the program today can actually change tomorrow again, because they're not regulated. Um, the basis for our law that was just passed last year, LD 673, which was based on um, a, a law passed in Minnesota on Alec um, Smith. Alec was this young man who aged out of his parents' insurance. Alec was 26. He earned $35,000 a year. It's a pretty good salary. He thought he'd be fine. Um, within 30 days of aging out of his parents' insurance, he, he couldn't afford his insulin. 
Um, his mom, who was a friend of mine who actually testified here in Maine last year, um, she tried to get him on several of these uh, patient assistance programs. He was denied all of them. Um, he earned too much money for them. And um, within 30 days of aging out of his insurance, he died from rationing his insulin. So we have an example of all of these companies saying, we have this patient assistance programs. You guys don't need a law. In fact, we actually had a company write a letter to the state of Maine saying, we have programs like this. You don't need this law. This is precisely why we needed our law, because there's no guarantee, because if you qualify today, it can be taken away tomorrow. And because actually when you need insulin, you need it immediately. Like I said, within hours, your blood starts to turn acidic. When you apply for these, there's often a waiting period and you need your insulin right now. So they're, it's in theory, they're really great, but in practice, they actually don't work. And, and so um, that's the problem with, with a life-sustaining drug. And so if we talk about insulin, we often say it's like breathing air. It's like air to us. If you were told you suddenly had to stop breathing air, you know that you're going to die. That's what insulin is. And if you were told, well, you can get air, but you need to fill out these forms. And then there's a seven day or 14 day waiting period. Well, you're going to be dead by the time you're eligible. Um, so um, the reality is, and this is what I said last year, no one should need a coupon to stay alive. This is a problem if you need a coupon to stay alive. And when we know it's so inexpensive to produce and the, and the companies have raised their prices again in lockstep and the oversight committee report that um, Senator Stewart referenced, you know, the report reveals this. Um, these companies raised their prices in lockstep. The FTC is looking at a potential investigation of them because it's cartel-like practices, as I, I referenced. Um, all of this is, is, is plain to see, and the companies know this, the employees know this, but my child, Catherine Began's son, Nick, they are truly held hostage to these companies because they die. So, um, you know, they could raise the price to a million dollars it wouldn't matter what it costs. We have to buy it. So thank, thank you for uh, um, that additional information. I noticed it didn't look like you had submitted any written testimony. Yes, I'm, I'm going to submit it. I'm sorry, I'm going to submit invite, it. I yep. invite you to make that as inclusive as mm -hmm. you'd like. Yep. Um, I don't see any questions. So let's go to uh, Roger uh, Erickson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, also submit uh, any written testimonies that people are interested in offline. So for right now, I'll just have a quick summary. I'm representing the, uh, the side of uh, how we would actually do this and some of the plans we would make. And I'll tell you quickly how we uh, came to this and how uh, we met Anthony. Uh, I'd actually been working for several years since working at the NIH and meeting and being becoming good friends with the longtime director of the Office of Rare Diseases there. And so we got introduced to the whole world of rare diseases and, and um, drug shortages through that way. Um, but the part that interested me is that why we can't solve these things. Uh, we have plenty of scientists, we have plenty of engineers. And uh, I'll just quickly say, we can get back to this later, that in my view, this is largely a problem of just not being connected enough, not getting all the right people together. Even all the capitalists, the most ardent capitalists I talked to uh, would just say, we, we could solve this. We just need to find time to put our heads together. So uh, one thing I want to say is we started off uh, our own interest in making our foundation with the conviction that we needed a buffer capacity of drug manufacturing facilities for all sorts. And that field is changing rapidly, so there's no one type of drug facility. We need multiple small agile facilities. And what we immediately found was that uh, nobody wants to invest in those because they're in a little bit of a, what's called a valley of death between research development and commercialization. So it's a neglected area. It's a little bit capital intensive, but it's really no more so than uh, a hospital operating room or building a machine shop. Uh, you just need to get the right people together. Again, it's an organizational issue. 
Second thing is uh, that I want to stress is this is actually a not it's not rocket science. Uh, we don't need to take this to NASA and the National Academy of Sciences, but it is a little complicated. And so people tend to uh, people need to understand all the moving parts. And if you only hear one or two of the moving parts, uh, it's easy to get a little irate and, and go off on a tangent. And so I don't mean to defend pharmaceutical companies, but what I have learned in my own way is that pharmaceutical companies are all stockholder driven companies and they cannot just decide what to do uh, because their stockholders will vote them out or demand the optimal return. So that is a complicated issue that needs to be looked into, but it all, all leads to that uh, without actual production alternatives, you will never get the attention that and a uh, movement that you would like to see. So you can put all the, all the pressure on companies you want, but in the end, nothing makes a difference like uh, an alternative. And then uh, finally, we've talked with uh, Anthony quite a bit about how we would uh, do this. And I'll send in my testimony, a, say six or seven steps to get into FDA submission on uh, authorization. But my point is that the insulin uh, patients around the world want to see this happen. And there is tremendous opportunity to coordinate, not just with other states, but from countries as far away as Korea, Singapore, uh, South Africa. So they all want to use FDA guidelines because many groups don't have an FDA. So one of the ideas I'd like to plant here is to make, well, I'll caveat that by saying that uh, the past two years of pandemic have shown the fragility of relying upon international uh, supply chains. So there needs to be in-state or in-country production of many fundamental things. So with that in mind, the idea that we've uh, put our heads together on and come up with is making a ideal design for a small modular factory, doing it in the United States, uh, and open sourcing the, the, um, the design and the construction procedures so that this could be replicated, say, four or five places in the United States. You don't need one in all 50 states, obviously. But uh, with, in conjunction with uh, uh, diabetes associations around the world, we could do, for, say, $50 million, we could get the two products, short and long lasting, uh, through uh, the FDA submission process, actually build the two factories and then get have those things uh, able, ready to be replicated anywhere in the world. So that just gives you an Thank idea you. of the potential how this could be done. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Erickson. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any, so let's uh, hear from, oh, Representative Jabner. I'm so sorry. I have a new laptop and it takes me a little bit to maneuver and find my hand. Um, do we know approximately, uh, Mr. Erickson, what the cost would be to build a manufacturing plant such as you are speaking of? Yes, we've, uh, we've had practice doing that. Uh, and of course it depends upon the size, but say a 30,000 square foot uh, factory that had all the storage space you have to understand the details of how these things actually operate. You need a lot of storage space. You need, it has to be a controlled access facility to pass an FDA audit. So, but in the 20 to 30,000 square foot range, um, you, we have all the expertise here uh, to do that. And we have people willing to work on the regulatory side. So we estimate it would cost about $10 million to actually build and have the functioning facility. Uh, for one, and you need two separate ones because the short acting and the long acting are made in an entirely different way. One uses a yeast to grow the uh, the um, uh, the insulin, the long acting insulin, and the other one uses bacteria for the short. So those are incompatible. You can't use them in the same facility. So that's twenty million dollars, and say at the most uh, five million dollars a year to actually operate. So if you operated it at cost. Um, you have to pay the cost of the construction, the validation of the facility, and then it takes roughly two years to get all the, to have it built, validated, and, and then you, all your equipment installed and your trained workforce. 
So at the end of two years, you would pass, an, uh, if things go well, you would pass a uh, FDA audit and have a license to produce and distribute. Thank so you very uh, much. We, we estimate 10 million per facility to actually produce uh, a five-year operating cost, which if you were able to sell at, at that, um, and then uh, it's gonna be $10 million a piece uh, to get through the FDA uh, um, documentation and, and get the, uh, the license from the FDA to, to produce them. So we're talking in the range of 45 to $50 million to be successfully producing significant amount of both short and long acting insulin. I'm sorry, can I just clarify? Can I have you clarify? Did you just say that it's gonna cost $10 million to get the FDA approval? Yes, there's, Anthony's group has done, I'll send this in a, a document. Um, Anthony's group has done the remarkable work uh, reconstructing the invention and bypassing uh, the um, original patents for the, uh, the short and long acting insulin. But to get the right for the, uh, to get something through the FDA that is gonna be injected under the skin of millions of people, it, you have to absolutely prove it's going to be safe and repeatable and reliable. And that it's going to take a fair amount of animal studies to show that these things, uh, this open sourced versions uh, act exactly the same way in test animals. And then it's a question of how that goes. You may or may not be required to do some preliminary studies in humans just to make sure it's safe. Um, and then uh, along the way that adds up to a tremendous amount of documentation uh, mm -hmm. that has to be uh, submitted to the FDA. So it may not uh, go that high, but we've been, by our all the FDA uh, uh, regulatory specialists we've brought in, they say, be prepared, this could mount up to $10 million for each product. Okay, thank you. I'm interested in the information you're going to send. That'd be very helpful. Okay. Set. Okay. Let's go then to an additional supporter in uh, Samantha Warren. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, uh, Representative Meyer. She's there somewhere. I'm trying to find her on my screen. Uh, and distinguished members of the committee, I am Sam Warren. I'm Director of Government Relations for the University of Maine System. And I certainly don't have the technical experience, uh, ex expertise, or the lived experience um, that, you've, that you've heard so powerfully here today. Uh, but because the University of Maine System is explicitly named in the bill, uh, I wanted to be here uh, on behalf of the university to uh, make clear our commitment to participating in the commission proposed by this legislation if it passes. I also wanted to make clear that the university is very supportive um, or very appreciative that Senator Stewart and the co-sponsors of this bill recognize the important um, expertise and capacity at our public universities um, and specifically at our public research university, the University of Maine. Um, we appreciate the recognition that we are doing uh, very uh, real relevant work that matters to Maine people, um, including um, in, in kind of the um, in the healthcare space. And you heard recently from my colleague, uh, Ben King, he was uh, speaking with you about um, Representative Zager's bill. Um, but as Ben shared with you um, through the Institute of Medicine at UMaine, we're doing very exciting research uh, and um, to advance health and well-being, not just in Maine, um, but beyond. And that work is uh, funded by you as members of the legislature through the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, which is the state's investment in university R&D. Uh, and we return that investment um, at a, a more than five to one rate. Um, but we're also doing uh, important work with partners like the Jackson Labs and MDI Bio Laboratories um, that is supported by the National Institutes of Health and other um, federal entities who uh, share this commitment uh, to, to health research. 
I wanted to share with you some of the, the research that we're doing that may be relevant to the conversation today. Um, we are partnering with MDI Biolabs um, to develop new clinical therapies with people uh, for people with diabetes. And we've also done some really exciting research that I think you'll be very happy to hear um, about ways of um, lowering the incidence of diabetes. And why I think you'll be happy to hear about that research is because um, uh, it concluded that there is a value in uh, regular chocolate intake. So I've, uh, I've linked that uh, study uh, in my testimony uh, to give you all a bit of, of good news here today. And then also I'd point out that a biotech startup um, led by University of Maine alumni uh, research, it, the students were doing research and then when they graduated, they spun off um, a new company that is developing a device that will aid in diagnosing aging and diabetes um, uh, related uh, neuropathy, so disease management and treatment can begin earlier. So given all of this work, it really makes sense that your public university system is part of a conversation um, and is a key player in further efforts in Maine to control blood sugar and prevent diabetes complications. And we very much uh, welcome the opportunity to participate uh, in this important commission um, and others like it that um, look to homegrown solutions uh, for problems that plague so many of our friends and, and neighbors Neighbors, um, as well as people around the world. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for that testimony. Are there any questions of uh, Samantha? I don't see any, so thank you for being here. Um, as far as I can tell, that's the extent of the folks who signed up to testify, but I'd invite anybody who's in the attendee list to put up their hand if they have something to offer in support of this bill or in opposition to the bill or neither for nor against. I see that Molly Harris has joined us. Welcome. We're ready to hear from you when you unmute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for hearing all of us today. My name is Molly Harris. I am a resident of Camden, Maine, a registered nurse and I live with type one diabetes. I'm also the associate producer of a documentary film called Pay or Die, which is telling the stories of Americans whose lives are threatened and even taken by the outrageous price of insulin in America. And in fact, one of those stories we're telling may hit home for all of you here today. Um, it's that of Charles Booker, a former member of the Kentucky House of Representatives and current candidate for US Senate, who during his campaign for the Kentucky House, wound up on death's doorstep as a result of rationing his insulin because that week he couldn't afford both groceries for his wife and children and the insulin he needed to stay alive. I'm here to speak to the pervasiveness of this problem um, that this resolution seeks to address. When I was diagnosed with type one diabetes eight years ago, the realization that I was suddenly perpetually days away from death without the life support that is my insulin utterly terrified me. And that was before I even realized the price tag that it carried. But when I started connecting with fellow members of the type one community across the country, this was an issue that came up again and again. It was through that community actually that I came to join the team behind the docu documentary film that I mentioned. Um, and I volunteer my time to that entire effort in a desperate attempt to affect change on this issue. Um, again, to speak to the pervasiveness of this issue of insulin access, I follow an account on social media called Mutual Aid Diabetes, where diabetics across the country volunteer their time to field urgent requests for assistance in accessing life-sustaining insulin. Regular Americans are volunteering their time to keep their fellow Americans, most of whom they'll never meet, from falling through the cracks of our broken system. We're in a really dire situation. As a Mainer, a registered nurse, and a person with type 1 diabetes, I'm telling you that we cannot afford to not entertain all potential solutions to this crisis. It is unconscionable that the lives of my fellow Mainers are in jeopardy because of the inaccessibility of a drug that came to market over 20 years ago and cost $5 to manufacture. I urge you 
to support this resolution, we can waste no time in investigating the feasibility of producing insulin in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. And you said you'd be submitting written testimony later on? Yes. Great. Great. Are there any questions for Molly? I don't see any. So I would again invite anybody who wants to contribute uh, a testimony with respect to LD 1729 to put up your hand if you're on the attendee list. Other than that, we not seeing anybody. We'll uh, conclude the public hearing portion of consideration of this bill. Thank you for bringing it forward, Senator Stewart. And um, we'll see uh, if there are any questions for our analysts in anticipation of a work session on it. Anybody got anything that, yes, Represent Senator Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One thing that did get mentioned um, that I, I wonder if the committee is interested in this, and if so, we're happy to provide it for the work session is about what those other states are doing. Um, would it be helpful to the committee to bring that over for the work session? My guess is that Sam has already written that down on his to-do list, and he may be in touch with you. To, yeah, see? See, I told you. We're yeah. lucky here. We're really lucky here. Certainly. So he may be in touch with you, uh, Senator, about uh, getting those references. Representative Javner. Thank you, Senator Claxton. I just want to ask as well if um, Ms. Koch would be able to join us for the work session. Is that a possibility to ask her? Sure. Thank you. All right. So I think that'll conclude our consideration of LD 1729. Thank you for bringing that forward, uh, Senator Stewart. And we'll let you know when the work session comes up. Um, that'll take us to consideration of 1582. And that will be introduced by looking through Senator Bailey. Have we seen Senator Bailey yet? She's on her way. Okay, very good. And we have a number of folks who want to testify in support of LD 1582. We have uh, three who are wanting to testify against and two who are neither for nor against, just so you have a heads up about coming attractions. And that's the people who've signed up as opposed to uh, including those who may come in later. Welcome, Senator Bailey. You have thank a bill to introduce us too. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and esteemed members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Donna Bailey. I represent Senate District 31, proudly representing Hollis, Limington, Old Orchard Beach, Saco, and part of Buxton. <clears throat> Today, I'm excited to introduce my bill, LD 1582, an act to enact the main Psilocybin Services Act, which has been carried over from last session. In Maine, we take great pride in leading the nation on important issues and innovations, and I believe that we should add psilocybin therapy to that list. The history of psilocybin is fascinating and groundbreaking. Since 2014, the John Hopkins Center for Psychedelic Research and Psilocybin Therapy has discovered that it helps longtime smokers quit smoking, ease anxiety in patients who have life-threatening cancers, and reduce alcohol intake for those who struggle with substance abuse. We know that some people need help kicking the hazardous habits that harm their health and additional support to improve their mental health, especially depression, which can be debilitating and severe. The data behind the psilocybin therapy, some of which this committee learned about last month when Dr. Lynette Averill briefed the committee on the proven potential of psilocybin is compelling. Of particular interest too is the power of psilocybin therapy to help treat people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which includes survivors who suffered from domestic, physical, or sexual abuse, and veterans who served in campaigns overseas. In Maine, a domestic violence assault is reported every two minutes and 22 seconds. 
Maine also has the fifth highest percentage of veterans in the United States, with nearly 10% of the adult population identifying as a veteran. According to the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Maine veterans had a higher rate of suicide when compared to the suicide rate of the entire Northeastern region, as well as when compared to the general population in Maine, and once again, the whole Northeast. These alarming numbers for domestic violence survivors and veterans should urge us to explore all the ways that we can take care of and treat those who are healing from the emotional and physical scars of abuse or violence and our brave veterans who leave the physical battlefields and IEDs behind only to return home and wage another war. Now that I've shown the need for finding therapies and treatments, such as psilocybin therapy that can help people recover from mental health ailments, PTSD and substance abuse, I want to share some of the benefits of psilocybin from a medicinal point of view. First of all, the standard treatment for PTSD and severe mental disorders are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. However, with SSRIs, which must be taken daily, only about 30% of people being treated for major depressive disorder respond well. Moreover, SSRIs are slow acting antidepressants that take weeks, even months for patients to see improvement. For people who have thoughts of self-harm or suicidal ideation, that could be too long. SSRIs also have side effects like cognitive dysfunction and weight gain or loss, which can throw a patient further off balance. On the other hand, psilocybin therapy works rapidly and robustly within hours or days. That's immediate, quick relief. Psilocybin therapy also targets a broader spectrum of symptoms, unlike SSRIs. Finally, psilocybin is so effective and powerful that it's usually administered in single, double, or triple doses that provide relief for weeks and months at a time. These benefits are convincing enough that psilocybin therapy has been designated a breakthrough treatment for drug-resistant depression. As a result, psilocybin therapy is in phase three trials with the FDA with anticipated approval in 2025. Testifying after me, you'll hear some stories from people whose lives have literally been changed by psilocybin therapy and for the better. I hope that you keep an open mind and listen closely. I thank the committee for its time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator Bailey. Are there any questions of the Senator? I'm not seeing any. I'll ask if you had a particular order in which people should be heard. I noticed that, uh, yeah, did, did, you, did you have a particular order in which people are heard? We I do not. Go alpha, we would go alpha by first name. That's fine. I have no particular order. Thank you. Okay. So if that's the case, we'll go to BJ McAllister then. Excuse me, Senator. Yes. We, we may have a legislator here. But she wants Please. to testify neither for nor against. Okay, I see. Uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is BJ McAllister, and I'm the president of the Resurgum Group. And today I am testifying before you in support of LD 1582 on behalf of my client, New Approach. Academic research from John Hopkins University and many other universities across the U.S. has shown that psilocybin can be effective in treating depression, anxiety, and trauma. Thanks to the promise of these studies, psilocybin has been granted a breakthrough treatment status by the FDA, a status reserved for when research demonstrates a new treatment method is more effective than the current standards of care. In 2020, the U.S. Department of Defense granted the University of North Carolina a $26.9 million grant to research psilocybin with an aim to effectively and rapidly treat depression, anxiety, and substance abuse without major side effects. Considering these ongoing clinical trials and research, a categorization by the FDA as a breakthrough treatment, and the use of psilocybin by many communities for their healing properties, passing LD 1582 is more timely than ever. This bill will ensure that those most in need of treatment, including veterans, victims with PTSD, and those who are in need of end-of-life care will have life, access to life-changing therapies. Allowing the use of these medicines with strict guardrails will allow those most in need to access these treatments. 
It's why places like Oregon, Texas, and a growing number of states and municipalities on all ends of the political spectrum have advanced legislation to create a pathway for psilocybin treatment for their residents. As the committee works this bill, we provide the following suggestions for consideration. First, we'd encourage you to create language that would allow service centers to produce psilocybin. A limited amount of psilocybin is needed for treatment, and this means that production may be best suited for the treatment environment. Second, develop an opportunity for some sort of at-home treatment options for patients that are unable to go to a facility for medical reasons. This is particularly important for palliative care. Third, add protections for recommending physicians and licensed facilitators so long as they have other professional licenses. And fourth, adjust the language on the labeling requirements. This language currently mirrors marijuana re requirements for labeling and packaging. You may consider having the department determine different standards for psilocybin because it won't be available in the same way marijuana is. In closing, former Texas Governor Rick Perry put it best when he said, quote, these compounds are different than no other compound that we would have in our arsenal. If you use it properly, it can save lives. We ask you support LD 1582. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions uh, from BJ? I don't see any. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next, we'll go to, um, I think I saw Carlton coming in, or no? Okay. Then we'll go to Dustin Sulak. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. I'm Dustin Sulak. I live in Durham, and I have a medical practice in Falmouth. I'm a licensed osteopathic general practitioner, and I've devoted the last 12 years of my career to the use of experimental therapies in the treatment of patients who have failed to respond to traditional treatments. I'm most well known for my expertise in the field of medical cannabis and have gained international recognition for my contributions to the field, including authoring seven peer-reviewed publications and a textbook. As you know, psilocybin is a powerful and relatively safe emerging therapy that has been designated as a breakthrough treatment by the FDA. I think it's important for the committee to know that patients are currently using psilocybin illegally with remarkable results. I am currently following approximately 20 patients who are effectively using it to treat depression, chronic pain, and perhaps most importantly, in hospice care to provide compassionate relief of death anxiety and terminal depression at the end of life. These patients and their caregivers become criminals when they grow, purchase, or use a relatively safe and highly effective natural medicine. They often don't disclose this use to their other doctors, increasing their risk for drug-drug interactions. And furthermore, I see many patients who would be excellent candidates for a trial of psilocybin, but have no access to the drug, many of whom are nearing the end of their lives. I am excited for you to hear firsthand accounts of the use of psilocybin, especially in these end of life situations and in these severely distressed patients, because the results are profound. As uh, Senator Bailey mentioned, with often rapid reversals of these existential crises, uh, terminal death anxiety and depression. So I am very encouraged by the submission of this bill that endeavors to improve access to psilocybin containing products. I must, however, emphasize a few shortcomings of the bill and strongly recommend amendments. Uh, the first is the need to decriminalize the possession and use uh, and uh, growing for personal purposes of psilocybin, this needs to be done to protect our current patients. Uh, based on my experience working closely with the medical cannabis program since 2010, I know that these types of uh, bills take a lot of time, especially the DHHS rulemaking process. It's likely gonna be several years before this program is up and running if this bill passes. And a lot of these patients don't have several years to delay their treatment because they'll be dead by then and, um, or, or maybe uh, worse, severely ill and uh, in incredible amounts of suffering. I also uh, strongly Ten encourage the committee. Sorry, did you say seconds. time is up? 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. The need to authorize the use of psilocybin in outpatient medical facilities and in any setting in which hospice care is being administered 
for obvious reasons. It, I shouldn't have to travel outside of my office to a psilocybin treatment center in order to guide the patient uh, or other therapists um, could do so in their, in their clinic as well. And then also the need to expand eligibility to those younger than 21 years of age. A 20 year old with a terminal condition shouldn't have to wait till his birthday uh, to use this medicine. I think the way that we regulate medical cannabis under medical supervision for the for minors, the treatment of minors would be applicable to psilocybin. I'll be submitting a written testimony. I just found out about this last night, so I haven't gotten to you yet, but very thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't see any questions from, oh yes, Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to extend a welcome to Dr. Sulak. Um, I, I've uh, appreciated your, your um, um, academic and clinical work uh, for, for many years and I appreciate how you, you push the bounds of what we can consider effective and safe uh, treatments. Uh, but you as a scientist and a, and a physician are also um, aware of, you know, balancing uh, pros and cons and premium non necessary. Um, and so um, somebody, uh, it's already been brought up about using this um, is in a, in a palliative mode, um, maybe not in a traditional office setting or uh, you know, in, in, in the setting of where, where there's a, a whole package of, of services, counseling and, you know, or, or um, guided treatment. Um, can, can you envision, it, it, maybe not now, but may, maybe submit something to the work session, a way that if you think that that would be appropriate and if so, how that might work uh, and, if, and if there's any examples of, of that, um, that uh, um, um, setting for, for treatment. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to address that very briefly and then expand in my test, my written testimony. Um, but I believe that uh, when hospice is engaged in care, uh, there's usually training even for non-medical providers that are there providing care. The family receives some instruction on how to administer medications and support the, the dying patient. And certainly there's um, home health uh, workers that are uh, coming, including nurses and, and physicians to see the patient. I think that, that they should, um, they would be, uh, it would be safe enough for people in those roles that were administering other drugs to treat end of life symptoms to also administer the psilocybin in doses that have already been established to be uh, what we might consider psycholytic. So this wouldn't be like a a profound psychedelic journey. And I think it's you know, important for the committee to understand that there are ways of using psilocybin mushrooms that are completely non-psychoactive. Similar to cannabis, there's a low dosing range where people are experiencing pain relief and elevations in mood without any psychomotor impairment, without any cognitive impairment. And I think those doses could be established and then uh, authorized by the treating physician or clinician for the patient to use that. I hope that I hope that answers the question about hospice settings. Uh, it's, it's, yes, it certainly gets us a little bit more clarity. Appreciate you being here and uh, offering something in writing. Thank you so much, Dr. Zager. I appreciate it. Representative Perry. I think my question's along the same areas, uh, uh, Representative Zager's. Uh, and my concern is is this is a new treatment. Uh, this also is for psychiatric disorders as well, is that um, I guess the assurance that those who are choosing to use the, the, the uh, psycho, anyway, Phyllis. The stronger doses. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> is that they are well-versed in how to do this. That, you know, we're looking for a certain effect. We're looking for um, a therapeutic effect. And that therapeutic effect is going to be very important in how it's dosed. Um, so uh, uh, there's a way, I and mean, how could we find a way to make sure that those who are choosing to prescribe it have the training that's needed to really be able, because we are doing this off-label outside the FDA, even though it's going in through. So um, I think there are some real risks as a provider if you are not trained in doing this. Absolutely. And I think um, while training is um, more uh, easier and easier to come by all the time, there's now textbooks and uh, in-person training or online training in this topic. Uh, I, I believe uh, that this bill does a good job of recognizing that the stronger psychoactive or psychedelic doses 
of psilocybin will benefit the patients most when there's a lot of attention to preparation, the setting of the actual experience and the support provided during that experience, and then the follow-up, which is called integration in the bill appropriately. And, and so I, I agree that that, is, that has its place, but I wouldn't want that to um, discriminate against those who aren't in need of those specific effects of psilocybin necessarily. I have several patients that will take just a very small dose uh, in, in the morning and it controls their pain and they're able to go about uh, their day, um, you know, feeling a lot better without any impairment. Now, it, it does take some expert guidance to be able to achieve those careful doses. And of course, when we have standardized products available, that will be, um, you know, a lot more doable for patients. So I'm not necessarily suggesting that we broaden this to all outpatient use, even though I think eventually it would probably benefit from going there. But I think definitely we want to avoid discriminating against those that are in, um, in the hospice setting would be my primary concern, just because I've been so impressed by the results that this has in that patient population. I'd hate to have to take someone who's at the end of life to a treatment center in order to experience some of this relief, and then they're back home again, and now they don't have access to the medicine that helped them so much the day before. That that just that seems like it, it doesn't work. So perhaps um, the inpatient setting, the outpatient um, medical providers clinic, and any setting where hospice services are being administered would be a nice middle ground to allow this to be administered. Thank you, Dr. Select. I don't see any other questions. So uh, now we'll go to uh, Carlson uh, Spotsward. When you're unmuted, you, sir. Good afternoon. My name is CJ Spotswood, and I've practiced as a mental health for over 20 years. I'm currently a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Winthrop, uh, specializing in mental health issues. For about five years, I have researched, written, and presented both nationally and internationally on psychedelic medicine, including presenting at the American Psychiatric Nurses Association's National Conference twice. I've taught two master classes for psychedelics today's navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists. One of them was exploring uh, psilocybin, which throughout I covered the management of adverse reactions from uh, psilocybin use. I co-authored the psychedelic dot supports nine hour psilocybin module for healthcare professionals. And I'm the author of the microdosing guide book, a handbook that's going to be released next month for patients and medical professionals looking to learn more about microdosing psychedelic medicines, including psilocybin. I'm also uh, set to start at the California Institute of Integral Studies uh, certificate in psychedelic therapies and research in the Boston cohort uh, in April. While many may consider that psychedelic assisted therapy is a relatively new idea, it's not. During the 1950s and 60s, psychedelics were used by more than 40,000 patients. Several books were published, six international conferences were held, and over a thousand clinical papers were published on the topic. All this occurred before the 1970 passage of Richard Nixon's Controlled Substance Act, which effectively halted all psychedelic research and started the costly and ineffective war on drugs. Further, as restricted access to natural substances that have been the ability to impart positive change upon suffering individuals. I'm no way claiming that psilocybin is a panacea for all of Maine's problems. However, I'm strongly in support of the Psilocybin Care Act and encourage the passage for multiple reasons. Unfortunately, the most widespread current approach regarding the treatment of mental illness is merely an attempt to mitigate suffering while not actually curing anything. These conventional approaches include antidepressant medications, which was spoke upon before, which have a various downfalls. In fact, it takes a long time to have any uh, response from them, leaving patients either having intolerable side effects or questioning if the treatment is even worth it at all. Those who find relief are in the minority, as only about 30% of individuals with major depression find any relief from symptoms uh, from conventional medications. And tragic reality is the limited treatment options leave too many continue to suffer and end up ending their own lives. While there have been several studies conducted the use of psilocybin in therapy, there's only been one head-to-head -head trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year. Well, the people that had in the head-to-head, -head, the people that had used the psilocybin reported an ability to cry, feel compassion, emotions, pleasure, experiencing less drowsiness, and not feeling depressed, but actually feeling emotion, which may actually be much better than having some of these other side effects. 
Um, I wanted to add that there's bills to decriminalize psychedelics have been introduced in 11 states. In addition to four other states and 11 cities have already enacted decrim. In California, there's uh, money that's going to be paying to have treatment for psilocybin research for PTSD with uh, veterans. It closed my professional and personal opinion that the Maine legislature has a significant opportunity to make our great state a leader in the treatment of mental health. With many states actively exploring options and sponsoring workplace task research for the use of psilocybin, we have the unique opportunity to follow suit and become a leader in allowing not only a safe and effective natural substance that's been used in millennia. Mayors are known for their forward thinking and free thinking and is it incumbent upon you as the legislative body to allow this to join this social experiment in allowing individuals to pursue their own personal liberties and making their own health care decisions? I offer myself as a resource to you and consider this matter. Looking forward having other discussions. I have more, but I will uh, submit that for testimony. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of uh, Carlson? I don't see any. Uh, so now we can hear from Michael Cavetti. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Michael Cavetti, and I'm Policy Counsel for the ACLU of Maine, a statewide organization dedicated to advancing and preserving civil liberties. Um, on behalf of our members, I urge you to support this bill uh, because it will help protect the lives of many in Maine who struggle with substance use and mental and behavioral health disorders. One of the many detrimental consequences of the criminalization of drugs has been government interference with the exploration of alternative drug therapies that could help people with many debilitating conditions like depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. If enacted, this bill would create safety standards for trained facilitators to oversee psilocybin therapy in licensed facilities and approve licenses for facilitators, service center operators, and producers of psilocybin mushrooms and products. The bill does not allow home use of psilocybin and does not allow marketing of any psilocybin products. If this bill is enacted, people in Maine may consume psilocybin only, quote, at a psilocybin service center and under the supervision of a psilocybin service facilitator, end quote. In a state where lack of treatment for substance use disorders is killing hundreds of people every year, psilocybin therapy is particularly promising. A veteran psilocybin researcher William A. Richards, currently a psychologist at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, writes that, quote, there is an abundance of published studies that strongly suggest that the use of psychedelic substances may be of significant value in the treatment of numerous mental health conditions, end quote. Research has shown psilocybin to be extremely promising to treat opioid use disorder, alcoholism, and other substance use disorders. This committee and this legislature owe it to the thousands dead and the many hundreds who will almost certainly die from lack of treatment uh, supports to make this therapy available. This bill will save lives. It will ensure that Maine takes a very careful approach to the legalization of psilocybin. We urge you to vote ought to pass. I'm uh, uh, thankful for your time and attention and happy to try to answer questions. Are there any questions for uh, Michael? Yes, Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do you know what the process is or would be um, to treat to treat people with substance use disorder? Uh, you know, is it you know like daily dosing or is like um, I don't know uh, 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 like other forms of treatment that we have for substance use disorder? Um, whatever I say on the topic would be based on. Uh, very, very shallow expertise and uh, reading things like uh, what the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous said he did in order to defeat his own substance use disorder. Um, I think though that the doctors who testify to, uh, before me um, are in a much better position to say exactly what treatment would look like. Okay, next, thank you, sir. Next, we'll hear from uh, Stephanie Tribal. Hi there. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and dedicated members of the Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Stephanie Tribo, and I'm from Owl's Head. I'm writing to you in favor of LD 1582. There are great voids in the treatment of some mental illnesses, 
and current gold standard treatments are far from sufficient for many who suffer with lifelong illnesses that greatly affect the quality of life. Imagine a loved one with bipolar disorder. While there are some proven mood stabilizers available as treatment, a hallmark of bipolar disorder is that the loved one stops the use of medications, particularly when the individual begins to feel well. It's still unclear to medical professionals exactly what initiates a swing in moods for someone suffering from bipolar, but as soon as a loved one starts on that path of bipolar depression, there are few tools available that make a difference. Bipolar depression can be so stubborn that even high doses of name brand pharmaceuticals cannot dislodge feelings of absolute despair. Even for those with some level of success, it can take months for the drug to build up in one's system over time in order to even begin reaping its benefits. And many such pharmaceuticals can exacerbate suicidal thoughts and feelings. It's a helpless moment for families when they have to make a decision about how to help a loved one when there are limited tools available. One tool is to stick with the pharmaceuticals prescribed, hope they work, and just wait for time to pass, praying each day that your loved one will hold on long enough. Imagine this daily and monthly on end. Keep in mind, too, that there can be a cost to any benefits from the use of currently available pharmaceuticals in the treatment of bipolar and or depression, even if they are successful. For instance, while they may dull the feelings of despair with time, they can also dull feelings of joy, which is what the patient is truly longing for in recovery. Another tool, which is perhaps even more frustrating than the first, is to admit the suffering loved one to a hospital. Hospitals are often not equipped with the tools or time to treat these individuals and can only keep them safe for a few days in many instances before releasing them to again deal with the despair on their own. And that's if there's even a bed available. A final tool is to desperately research and experiment. There are already individuals in Maine who are experimenting with psilocybin, which possesses much higher legal ramifications than the medical risks associated with its use. Even riskier is obtained in the materials, but again, this is a risk that Mainers and others across the country are already taking as a result of the ineffectiveness of the first two tools. This drug is giving desperate families hope. Most recently, the University of California, San Francisco's Translational Psychedelic Research Program, TRIPPER, under the direction of Dr. Josh Woolley, put out a nationwide survey asking about the use of psilocybin, receiving hundreds, seconds, Stephanie. hundreds of similar results and stories as the ones that you may have read in, in the Portland Press Herald. This study will be published in 2022. Let's ensure Maine is poised to begin taking advantage of these medical advances that will benefit our residents so that families do not need to make guesses in the dark or face legal consequences for the ethical conundrum of trying to save a life by breaking a law. I want to add here uh, to the counter argument that this is medicine by politics. Suffering families need options and it's lawmakers such as yourselves who can help eliminate barriers that may be costing some families the ultimate price. Please ensure that there's a framework that lays the necessary foundation to provide more options for those suffering from mental illnesses as well as their families. For this reason, I strongly urge the committee to vote unanimously ought to pass. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of uh, Stephanie? I don't see any. So then we'll go to uh, Rudy Gonzior. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Rudy Gonzor, uh, and I'm here today to give my personal testimony uh, in support of developing a legal framework for psilocybin-assisted therapy. Uh, so I'm a lifelong Mainer, um, and I'm also a 19-year veteran of the U.S. Army Special Operations Community. Uh, I'm also an ambassador for psilocybin-assisted therapies, along with other etiogen therapies as well. Uh, my personal story, um, in 2019, after nearly two decades uh, serving multiple combat tours uh, in the global war on terror, I found myself uh, at the end of my life. Um, I'd spent years struggling with post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and suicide, uh, and it left me in a place that was very dark with almost no hope. Uh, I'd lost almost everything at that point in my life, uh, even working with some of the traditional modalities that we're very familiar with here in the United States, like talk therapy and pharmaceutical medicine. Um, it was in the late winter of uh, 2019 that through the medicinal use of ethogens uh, under the care and guidance of uh, practitioners that I actually began a journey of healing. Um, it's been three years now uh, since that time frame, And in short, all I can say is that I'm alive here today because of that experience. Um, it gave me back my family, my joy, my purpose, 
it gave me back my life. Um, unfortunately, to gain access to this therapy, um, I had to travel to a foreign country to do that. Uh, I ended up risking my entire career, my retirement, uh, even prosecution uh, under the UCMJ in order to achieve uh, the beginning of this healing. Uh, and this is also something that not a lot of us have uh, the means and access to get to. Um, and it's unfortunate because I've realized as I progress through this that my experiences are not unique. Um, just this last month, uh, we lost 12 soldiers in the Special Forces community um, to mental health crisis, uh, suicide. Uh, that's an astounding number for such a small community. And then again, these experiences are not unique just to that community either. Um, you know, when we look at the struggle and the health crisis of post-traumatic stress, addiction, depression, and anxiety, uh, this is a crisis um, that's not confined to one's vocation or their geographical location. Um, here in Maine, you know, we have an incredible crisis and the healing and the health of our mental being is a universal need. Um, so while treatments like uh, psilocybin assisted therapy may not be a silver bullet, um, it is definitely has the potential for us to begin healing in ways that traditional medicine is just not able to achieve. So developing and establishing a legal framework uh, in support of psilocybin assisted therapy here in Maine uh, it has the potential to give many of us Mainers uh, an option and a chance to fight to live in a way that uh, is just not possible uh, using traditional medicine. So again, uh, thank you for your time. Um, and I'm open to any questions if you guys have anything. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Counselor, I, I, first of all, thank you very much for your service to our country. Um, and uh, I, I am uh, heartened to hear that you are um, doing better um, than what you described in 2019. Um, also, thank you for coming today. Um, I was hoping you could share with us, uh, given your personal experience, um, the role that, the, uh, that any licensed uh, mental health professionals played as, as, a, as a, a part of the overall psilocybin treatment package. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, my experience was not here within the U.S. It was slightly different. Um, my experience was slightly different. However, I do work uh, in conjunction with nonprofits here in the United States to do that. And um, there's a, there's an incredible need to have like this structure um, for you know the a structure behind, I guess, like the therapy in itself, whether it's designated by kind of like laws and training, um, it's, it's incredibly important to, to have a space and container to do that, uh, especially the legal framework. As I said, uh, many of us are, are traveling abroad or we're doing these sort of things in, you know, in a legal context in order to try to achieve that. Uh, so the lack of that uh, for many of us has been very, very difficult. However, it's been so incredibly successful that many of us are still willing to risk their traveling or doing things um, that are not legal here in the United States. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, well, in, 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 in wherever you, you did the treatment, were there licensed behavioral health professionals that participated in, in your care? And if yes. so, what was your, what was your impression of, of their role in, in your overall treatment uh, um, package? Yes. Um, so um, where I did my therapy, there was, in fact, uh, licensed physicians there uh, within uh, those countries. Um, and it was a very critical piece. Um, you know, uh, it is it is the framework before and after uh, these experiences uh, when it comes to, you know, having like the guidance, um, like these parts of like the treatment are, you know, we talk about the psilocybin on uh, various esogens and such as that, uh, they're, they're just one part of the treatment. So the integration of uh, medical health professionals to help kind of guide uh, those, those times and places in which this is occurring uh, is incredibly uh, pivotal. Almost, I would say, it's equally important to the actual experiences that are, that are occurring, whether we're talking about microdosing, such as some people have brought up before, some what people for it was like the more uh, profound uh, experiences as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chair. 
Are there any other questions? Not seeing any, I too would like to acknowledge your service and uh, appreciate that. Thank you. So now we'll hear from a Yule Gardner. If you'd care to unmute and join us, we'd like to hear what your testimony is. Welcome. Hello. So Senator Kat Claxton and honorable members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Yule Gardner and I'm a resident of Casco. Um, I'd like to present, op, uh, present testimony in favor of LD 1582, the Maine Psilocybin Services Act. Um, I feel that this is very extremely important legislation and the information I'm gonna share is a great illustration as to how the citizens of Maine could greatly benefit from its passage. I would like to add as some others have, um, that the bill does fail to recognize, at least as far as I've been able to ascertain, the use of psilocybin via microdosing. Um, microdosing is the regular taking, typically every other day or four days on, one day off, um, of an imperceptible amount of psychedelic substance. The ingester experiences no mind altering effects, but receives many benefits of the medicine, noticeably over time in terms of neuroplasticity, uh, significant reduction in anxiety and depression, um, and also any issues involving cluster headaches uh, seem to be also uh, greatly relieved. If the consumption of psilocybin products is limited to on-premises on at a licensed psilocybin service center, uh, individual would have to travel to the center daily to take the medicine. Um, this is logically, uh, logistically prohibitive to many people, particularly those with disabilities. Um, and I'd like the committee to consider that as you move through the process. Um, I'm the primary caregiver to an individual um, and have witnessed what I'm about to describe in person. Uh, I did all the research for this person uh, prior to her deciding to undertake the course of treatment and have accompanied her to all of her medical appointments, which this was discussed with her doctors. My involvement in this is primarily because of love and in respect for her fearlessness in the face of death from a cancer that always wins. Uh, she couldn't do this alone, uh, particularly the research, because of the difficulties. Uh, one of the major difficulties from uh, which this person suffers is her loss of the ability to read, uh, making research obviously very difficult. Um, she'd never taken psilocybin or any psychedelic substances prior to self-treatment of this condition. Because psilocybin is currently a prohibited substance, I'm constrained from using names or being too specific, but everything I'm going to share with you is true, and everything this person did regarding treating herself was done with knowledge and encouragement on the part of her primary care physician, as well as her entire team of neurologists and oncologists. None of them advised against it, and all of them have stated their agreement on what a positive difference it has made in the quality of her life. They've equally stated how frustrating it is to witness the benefits and to be constrained by law and being able to suggest similar courses of treatment to those who they know would surely benefit. So my friend was, dosed, was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma in February, 2017, um, multiple lesions in the brain, um, and was told that only 17% of the people in her status live more than three years. Today, thanks to immunotherapy, radiation, two brain surgeries, and refusing to believe that this would be her demise, she's cancer free. Brain damage caused by tumors and resection surgeries left her with only 40% of her eyesight, very poor balance, neuropathy, particularly lack of feeling in her legs, no real short-term memory, facial palsy and the loss of the ability to move her left eye, the inability to read and expressive aphasia. Um, aphasia is when you can't speak the words that you wanna use, even though you can think them and write them down. Um, a very creative, athletic, and intellectual 52-year-old professional was affected to the extent of becoming someone who spent long stretches of time in hospital and was not thriving. She was able to turn this around um, through making some other treatment choices that went against standard protocols, and the choices always proved to be the right ones. Uh, her cancer stopped progressing, at least for the time being, and her general health leveled out, although she was still quite disabled from the eyesight, balance, memory, aphasia standpoint. Her neurological pathways, including much of her optic nerve, had been permanently damaged, uh, basically either disconnected completely or compressed by the growth of cancerous tumors, and the neurological impulses were unable to connect across the synapse network. After conversation with a psilocybin psychology researcher friend in Oregon, I started reading and researching about how psychedelics can assist with brain function and in recovering from brain injuries and certain types of mental illness. Along the way, I discovered information on psilocybin and the many therapies that were being researched about how they can help a brain overwrite old patterns and create new ones. Information abounds regarding people having great success, as you've heard today, recovering from PTSD, drug-resistant depression, drug and alcohol dependency, and other um, 
mental health issues. There's also a very small amount of information regarding TBI recovery. Psilocybin affects traumatic brain injuries and some types of tumor damage as part of the healing mechanism that appears to foster neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is defined as, quote, the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning or experience following an injury. I read, this to my, I read this to my friend and she immediately wanted to try microdosing. We took these articles to her doctors and asked them what they thought. Again, microdosing is a term used to describe a regimen of regularly scheduled doses, but in an amount that is subperceptual from a standpoint of psychedelic effects. Webster's defined microdose as a very small amount of drug used to benefit from its psychological action while minimizing undesirable side effects. Her doctors were all for it, some after having to do their own research, all agreeing not to recommend it and to keep it out of their notes. The common response was, and I paraphrase, contrary to the DNA, it is neither dangerous nor addictive. If you're careful, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose by trying it. She agreed to be careful, find a friend who could accurate, assess accurate dosing and report back whatever she experienced. She started self-medicating in April 2021 on a very carefully measured, non-perceptible doses of psilocybin every other day for three weeks with the fourth week off. By June, she could consistently form complete sentences. By July, her ability to string sentences together was improving. By August, it was very obvious to her doctors that her aphasia was completely gone. She was even beginning to be able to comprehend written words on a page, and her handwriting became clear and easy to read. Her left eyelid palsy had been greatly reduced and her ability to control directional movement of her eyes was also greatly improved, particularly her left eye, which had previously only looked off to the left. By October, she could carry on conversations that required depth of thought and reported feeling much more like a real human being. She's also an 80% winner of, da of daily Scrabble matches with her friends at this point, which is an unbelievable thing considering where she was. This is the only daily change in her medications. Um, she's always been classified as having significant drug resistant depression issues and anxiety. Those two have been greatly soothed and her fear of dying from cancer is dissolved. Pretty amazing for someone who has a form of cancer that always wins. Her doctors are very frustrated because they can see all this clearly and are truly amazed. If they cannot report on it or recommend it to other patients for whom they feel would create benefit because of DEA Schedule 2 status and the stigma still attached by the AMA who controls their licenses. I contacted them all regarding this opportunity to testify, and while they were all very supportive of one of us testifying, they said they could not. While a new state law may not correct these issues, it will help forge a pathway to eventually change the federal ban on psychedelics for medicine use. So I would just like to really say that this, this is a huge opportunity to help a lot of people. Um, folks like Mr. Gonzier, um, folks that you're probably going to hear from, uh, hopefully, you know, going down the road. This is significant medicine. This is not a joke. And I'm, I'm not a medical professional. I'm just somebody who um, is smart enough to be able to read and understand and, and uh, try to figure out how to help, you know, my best friend. So anyway, um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer any questions that don't involve names, dates, and places. <laughs> You're on mute, Senator. I don't see any questions. So um, I'll just comment that your friend is fortunate. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. So uh, next we'll hear from Tyler Farnham. If you'd like to unmute and join us. Welcome. Oh, oh. <clears throat> oh, hi, my name is Tyler. Um, I'm a father of one kid and I have another kid due any day now, actually. So I just uh, a little nervous here to be doing this, but I wrote down what I wanted to say. So, um, for over a decade, I have struggled with depression, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders all of which were severely interfering with my quality of life. I attempted to end my life on more than one occasion, after which I was hospitalized for extended periods at various mental health clinics. I was prescribed and offered a plethora of pharmaceuticals, all of which gave a very 
unpleasant experience. It's as if I was numb to the world and some of these drugs left room for abuse. I can see how when not given another option for treatment, many turn to abuse or harder drugs. I was struggling real hard, not getting anywhere with doctors, hospitals, shelters, support groups, and therapy. I even became a father and had to take time away from my daughter to be in a crisis unit for long periods of time to work on my mental health. Nothing was helping. As a self-studied nutritionist and herbalist, I became aware of the promising benefits of psilocybin. My strong interest and knowledge of history and culture also taught me how psychedelic plant substances have been used around the world for thousands of years for medical purposes in ethnic groups that have little to no mental health disorders. So I approached a friend who at the time was growing psilocybin mushrooms, of course, doing so in fear of the law. I started small and worked my way up to several grams of mushrooms. I don't wish to go into detail about the experience. It was lengthy, but it was very positive. The real point I wish to convey is the result. After all my failed attempts to improve my mental condition, it's as if a switch was flipped and a light was turned on inside of me. I went from wanting to end my life to loving life so much that I am now days away from having my second child. Now is a time more than ever with the pandemic in full swing and mental health crisis at an all time high to welcome new therapy for those struggling. Psilocybin is safe and proven effective time after time. If our lawmakers decide to reject this proposed bill and deny doctors and patients the right to seek new treatment for debilitating conditions, I feel they are not representing the views of main state citizens nor acting in our best interest. The war on drugs has hurt more than it has helped. I would like to have faith in my legislators that they can be pioneers in the highway to mental health. I support the use of psilocybin for medical purposes and would like to see this bill passed. My views are consistent with many others who suffer the same conditions as myself. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tyler, for your testimony. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any. So um, is, if, is there anybody else who'd list, like to testify in favor that we haven't called on already? If there is, please put your hand up. Not seeing any hands going up, we'll go to uh, Representative Hymanson, who I hope will forgive me for uh, not putting her in the proper order when I had my brain cramp. So uh, she's here to speak neither for nor against. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Claxton. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable and hardworking members of the Health and Human Services Committee. <clears throat> I am Patty Hymanson, representing House District 4, parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Ogunquit. <clears throat> and I'm testifying neither for nor against LD 1582, an act to enact the Maine Psilocybin Services Act, in order to add information. This bill presents a regulatory framework, and I would like to testify in support of the therapeutic possibilities of psycho psychedelic assisted therapy. I say psychedelic assisted therapy because psilocybin is not the only one. There are um, several other compounds that are used similarly. <clears throat> a, a psychotherapist colleague on the seacoast in a specialized VA clinic in the Seacoast treated veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder related to their deployments. As a neurologist in practice, I would converse with him about how in intractable the symptoms of PTSD were and how devastating, as you heard in just prior testimony. A variety of treatments would come and go, even ones given during employment to try to prevent PTSD, but none really helped cure or prevent, only manage. Something about the brain had been altered by the traumatic experience and it could not always be reset. Psychedelic assisted therapy has the chance to reset the brain so that the person's attention 
either conscious or unconscious, is diverted to other thoughts that have a neurochemistry attached to them that is happy rather than fiercely scared. One of my best friends from college, a bright, accomplished woman, developed major depression and PTSD. Five years ago, she was suicidal. Years of group and individual therapy, crisis management, multiple medications, story you just heard, kept her afloat, but not truly functional. Living in the Boston area, she explored using psychedelic assisted therapy through a talented group of medical professionals. The therapy has been slow and deliberate with a stable group of people, a well-trained therapist. The group was meeting by Zoom weekly, once a month together to discuss what they intended to bring out, take the psychedelic with guidance, then the next day integrate what they had experienced with what their intentions had been. Slowly over time, my friend has transformed. She is joyous to have let go of the depression, not beating it back every day. Her mind and her body are no longer suddenly forced back to the old memories or feelings. Now she uses microdoses, which you've heard about, that do not produce the psychedelic experiences. I have to say, I watched this process with someone I truly love, one of my best friends, she went, uh, that she went through with, I, I had trepidation and skepticism, but knew she was working with clinicians with integrity and nothing else had worked for her. It worked. My purpose for testifying is to validate that psychedelic assisted therapy holds promise for treating intractable PTSD and depression, maybe other main mind body brain disorders. It seems that the psychedelic assistance assists the therapy and the therapeutic structure I described is important to the successful treatment. That being said, there are research pharmaceutical companies that are looking to create a medication that works on the brain in similar ways to the psychedelics, but does not produce the alterations in perception. Exploring this issue for the state of Maine might start with a task force panel to look at this therapy, what other states are doing, what a regulatory framework should look like, and then next steps. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions as I'm able. Thank you for that testimony. Are there any questions of Representative Hymanson? I don't see any. So thank you for being there. And, um, next, we'll go back in sequence to those who are opposed, and I see we've been joined by Dr. Bark, and welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairs Claxton and Meyer and honorary members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Jeff Barkin. I'm president of the Maine Medical Association, and I'm a practicing psychiatrist and a five-year past president of the Maine Association of Psychiatric Physicians. I'm here to testify in opposition to LD-1582. Hearing the prior testimony, I wanted to share with you some facts it was said that only 30% of patients with major depression achieve improvement. That's not true. 69% of our patients achieve clinical remission, which is defined as the complete absence of symptoms. And that's from not a pharmaceutical study. That's from the sequence treatment alternatives to relieve depression. The largest trial that included psychiatrists and primary care doctors and didn't take a penny from the pharmaceutical industry. So we can already achieve close to 70% fix cures for patients with remission. And that certainly leaves a strong unmet need. The good news is that rapid acting antidepressants such as ketamine, esketamine, have already attained FDA approval and drugs such as psilocybin and MDMA, so-called ecstasy when used with, psych with psychotherapy, particularly with two psychotherapists, do show promise for the treatment of major depressive disorder, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. The work at Johns Hopkins, and in particular, the uh, Carhart-Harris paper that some folks have mentioned published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy was non-inferior, no worse than Lexapro, generic escitalopram. And that's great. We're open to new treatments, but we're not open to the widespread legalization until some sense of harms and benefits are, are known. The good news is that particularly given the early positive information on psilocybin, that 
well-designed clinical trials are currently being performed. They are being sponsored by the Multidisciplinary uh, Association for Psychedelic Studies. They have very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria to make sure that the people who are getting treated actually have benefit and actually get us a sense of what is the risk profile. Psilocybin is associated with clinically meaningful increases in risk of blood pressure increases, pulse increases, and we're particularly concerned right in the middle of a drug crisis in Maine with an ever-increasing rate of overdose deaths in a state that's rural, icy, and known for inclement weather, that the psychotogenic effects of psilocybin, particularly at high doses, are only going to put more Mainers at risk. Given that there are well-designed clinical trials going on now, we ask that you guys wait and let's see what the results of the COMPASS trials and the MAPS trials that are undergoing rigorous analysis by the FDA is. And that way you may not even need any legislation. It might be that positive trials and input from the DEA as well will lead to the regulatory process that we would want for a, a novel treatment. But in the meantime, the main Medical Association is taking an ought not to pass for LD1582. Thank you for your time. And I'm ready, willing, and able to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Barkin. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Griffin. Thank you, Dr. Barton, for um, being here today. I was just wondering if you submitted your testimony. I didn't see it, your written testimony. We will submit written testimony. Okay, thank you. Certainly, thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Barkin, for, for being here. Um, your, your expertise, uh, not only, um, well, in, in, in psychiatry is, is, uh, is very, uh, very helpful. Um, so do, I've heard twice the the uh, um, the, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, study Carhart and Harris um, referenced. Um, is that really the only head-to-head -head trial that, that that you're aware of? It's the yes. It's the most rigorous head-to-head -head trial. The other trials have been placebo trials, and the history here actually dates back further than 2014. It dates back to 2006. So we have a, a good amount of open-label naturalistic research, which began at Hopkins in a cohort of patients with terminal cancer who were given psilocybin really for existential end-of-life anxiety, many of whom responded and had a positive response, but it was only later until we got the well-designed clinical trials to help answer the safety and efficacy issues. Okay, thank you. Sure. I'm not seeing any other questions, Dr. Barkin, so thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging in. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Next, we'll go to uh, Kate Dufour. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton and Representative Meyer and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm going to try to be brief so I don't have uh, Senator Moore coming out at me at some point. <laughs> uh, but our opposition to this bill is twofold. Uh, the first is with respect that communities continue to grapple with the adult use and the medical marijuana uh, policies that the state has um, in, adopted. And uh, whether or not a community has opted in or opted out, every municipality is dealing with um, medical marijuana and the, the, the issues associated with regulating or to the extent that we can regulate. So we have a lot on our plates right now with a new therapy. And we would ask that we have an opportunity to figure out all the problems before we subject municipalities to yet another um, new, new therapy or a new proposal in, in the state of Maine. Um, the second concern is with respect to the limitations that are placed on municipalities uh, for local control to regulate this new industry. If a community, if the state is gonna bring something new to, this, um, to the state of Maine, uh, communities want the right to regulate. And if you look at the section of the proposal that focuses on municipal regulation, it is incredibly limited and challenging and full of hurdles. It, it starts off with an opt out approach where it's deemed that the services can be provided within municipal boundaries unless the, the legislative body and the electorate says no. 
So it's a two-step process for getting out of it. First, the legislative body, which is either town meeting or the town or city council has to say no. And then that has to be validated at a November election by uh, the electorate. So you're, you're nearly giving, depending on when your town meeting is, you're nearly giving this industry a year, a year and a half head start before the residents can actually say no. And then to the extent that we are, we get to that point, um, if you look at the underlying law, the extent to which municipalities can regulate uh, the industry within their, their boundaries is also incredibly limited. So to the extent that the legislature thinks this is a good idea and they would like to go down this path, we just hope that you will give us the regulatory authority that we need um, to do what we do for the adult use, which is we opt in when we're ready to do so. You know, the process of adopting ordinances um, is timely, it's expensive, and we really would like the authority to decide whether or not this is good for our communities. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Are there any questions for uh, Kate? I don't see any, so you're off the hook there. Thank you for being here. Thanks for that testimony. Um, I think we've heard from everybody who's here to speak against. If that's not the case, there's Molly's hand. I wondered where you went. The floor is yours, Molly Bogart, when you come off a of mute. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. I'm Molly Bogart, Director of Government Relations for the Department of Health and Human Services, um, and just wanted to draw your attention to a letter that you have from Director Shaw um, on this bill with some concerns from Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and these were also developed in partnership with our Office of Behavioral Health. Um, there may be early evidence for use of psilocybin to assist treatment in refractory depression and PTSD, um, but that research is ongoing and there are not currently clinical practice guidelines or FDA approved treatments um, that would ensure uh, safe and appropriate use of the therapy. Um, and we have a number of concerns related to the structure set forward, um, specifically that the psilocybin service centers um, would seem to function more like recreational use facilities than medical treatment facilities. Um, and there are significant limitations on the department's ability to regulate safe use um, and incorporate sufficient behavioral and public health input into the structure. Um, for example, there's uh, no requirement for certified or licensed behavioral health professionals to be on site to endorse or administer um, the use of the um, therapy. And in fact, there are explicit limitations in the bill that would require um, the department uh, or would not allow the department to um, require that a facilitator would uh, has a degree from an institution of higher education. Um, and we don't believe that there should be any limits on the ability of the department to ensure appropriate use and oversight of psychedelics for treatment of mental and behavioral challenges. Uh, we have concerns about the lack of structure around who can or should use um, the substance therapeutically and what conditions it should be used to treat. Um, specifically, the bill prohibits the department from setting parameters around medical conditions that qualify um, and without clinical indications or oversight. Um, again, we are concerned that these service centers would function more like recreational use facilities. Um, if this is indeed a clinical treatment, it should be appropriately administered in a medical office with appropriate oversight. Um, and there's not a, um, a, a manner in this bill that's established with, uh, in which patients with behavioral and mental health conditions can receive clinical treatment um, for those health conditions. We also um, wanna point out if you're interested in moving forward with the bill, um, the psilocybin advisory board that's established has two members from Maine CDC, the director and the state health officer. Um, those are the same person and there's no recommendation for an inclusion of someone from the Office of Behavioral Health, which we would strongly recommend um, were you to, to move forward. Um, and so we recognize that there's some promising research here and, and certainly um, support that effort nationwide, and um, but think that before Maine moves forward with any sort of structure, um, there should be more uh, research and development done to understand um, how this should be structured and implemented. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that I can um, in my uh, limited knowledge, but also make sure that we bring folks to the work session um, if that would be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any questions from Molly? Yes, Representative Zager. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Molly, thank you so much, uh, uh, both to you and, and to Dr. Shah for, for weighing in. This is, this is a really difficult issue, as, as I think everyone in the, in the virtual room can appreciate, uh, trying to uh, balance benefits and, and potential, potential benefits and harms. Um, my question is, uh, for the work session, um, could, could the department um, offer a, an opinion about uh, use um, in, in uh, hospice settings or, or, other, or other circumstances where an in-office um, uh, location might not be in the best interest of the patient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was also something that um, occurred to us as we were looking at this bill, limiting the use to a service center would, would prohibit some of the uses that it's sort of most um, uh, touted as being uh, beneficial for, such as end of life care. Um, and so I'm happy to have our folks uh, develop a more thorough answer to that, but, but it is something that we had identified as a concern as well. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So thanks for being here, Molly. And uh, the last person to testify, neither for nor against, is Jonathan Fellers. Good afternoon. Hello, um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Fellers, and I'm a triple board certified physician with clinical expertise in the diagnosis and management of co occurring mental health and addiction disorders. As an addiction psychiatrist, I work with patients, families, and our healthcare system to promote high-quality evidence-based screening, assessment, and treatment for substance use disorders and co-occurring mental disorders. I have over a decade of clinical experience in a variety of settings, and my experience is sought out widely, and I've been honored to provide education and leadership at the local, regional, and national level. I'm also a resident of South Portland. Research into psychedelics has seen a resurgence. There is a growing evidence base for these powerful substances. Current active clinical trials are investigating psychedelics for use in depression, PTSD, and substance use disorders. The fields of mental health and addiction could well benefit from new treatment options as our current pharmacopoeia has little to offer many of people who suffer from debilitating conditions. The preliminary work has raised high hopes for the future and now psychedelics are gaining mainstream acceptance. Several cities and states are in the process or have already taken steps toward legalization or decriminalization of psilocybin for therapeutic or recreational purposes. I worry that LD 1582 would prematurely approve the use of psilocybin prior to necessary investigation into its safety and efficacy. This is a substance that has not been fully vetted by the FDA. The FDA explains that Evaluation not only prevents quackery, but also provides doctors and patients the information they need to use medicines wisely. The center ensures that drugs, both brand name and generic, work correctly and that their health benefits outweigh their known risks. I am also concerned that LD 1582 provides inadequate oversight for psilocybin and psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. Psilocybin is a Schedule I controlled substance, the most restrictive in terms of regulatory oversight. Current psychedelic research sources psilocybin from approved chemical suppliers where its purity is assured. LD 1582 looks to cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms as the source for psilocybin. Manufacturers appear to have minimal oversight compared to what is needed for a Schedule I substance. This arrangement means that both the quality of the psilocybin as well as the protections in the supply chain from diversion are very different. Psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy follows a specific protocol in these research studies. The FDA evaluates requests taking into consideration the qualifications and competency of the applicant as well as the merits of the protocol. These studies have been able to proceed because of the reputation of the respective institutions, the quality of the personnel, and the thoughtfulness of the protocols. There is oversight by an institutional review board to ensure fidelity to the protocols. There are established exclusionary criteria to reduce potential risks to, substance, to subjects. The sessions are performed by two facilitators who are at least an LCSW or a psychologist, along with physician oversight. LD 1582 fails to provide commensurate medical supervision. The oversight is by a psilocybin service facilitator. This individual needs only be a high school graduate with unspecified training. 
And LD 1582 actually prohibits requiring a degree from an institute of higher education. Psilocybin is not without risks. The most likely risk is overwhelming distress during drug action, otherwise known as a bad trip, which could lead to potentially dangerous behavior such as leaving the site. Less common are prolonged psychoses triggered by psilocybin and the relatively rare hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. Let us make sure that proper medical safeguards are in place. Please do not permit the practice of medicine without physicians. Thank you, Dr. Fellers. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any. So thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging in. And um, based on that, I think everybody who wanted to testify on this bill has had a chance. If that's not the case, I see Selma Holden put up her hand. So let's put you in the room here and see. It's on the way. Okay, let's see what she has to say. And then when we hear from the last of the testimonies, we'll take a break. It's been two hours. Um, Yes, thank you for your patience and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My Welcome. name is Selma. Oh, Welcome. No, thank you. My name is Selma Holden. I moved to Maine almost 15 years ago to train in family medicine fellowship up at Maine Dartmouth within Maine General. <clears throat> I did, did a postdoctoral research fellowship at Harvard in integrative medicine research, where I looked at the association between lifetime psychedelic use and the risk of developing opioid use disorder and other mind-body modalities. <clears throat> I'm now currently an assistant professor at UN University of New England's College of Osteopathic Medicine, where I teach the medical students there and also operate within this, their center of excellence of public health, where I direct HRSA grants that assist federally qualified health centers in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, with custom quality improvement projects focused on screening and prevention and treatment of opioid use disorder. <clears throat> also, my clinical service is as the director of research at the Riverbird Clinic in Portland. We're a group of licensed physicians and mental health providers who offer legal psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, just using ketamine at this time within a supportive building framework and community health center. We are expanding to other research substances such as MDMA. As Dr. Barkin mentioned, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, I am a principal investigator for our local clinic and the Schedule One license holder for MDMA. Within our clinic, we use ketamine, which is a well-known anesthetic at a lower dose that generates a non-ordinary state of consciousness that can be considered psychedelic, yet it's not the same pharmaceutical mechanism as a classic psychedelic such as psilocybin mushrooms um, at, and other ones such as LSD peyote. The, um, <clears throat> the issue that's going on here is that, oh, well, let me just put it, my position here is I put it as neither for nor against. Um, it's a tricky one because I appreciate the amendments suggested by Dr. Sulek and the points raised by Dr. Barkin and others. Psilocybin therapy is very important. The evidence continues to emerge from the best medical research centers across the country that it is safe and effective. And I'm so grateful for these groups doing this meticulous work to follow these guidelines. However, this current bill regulates psilocybin, thinking of it as an extract, and it does it to the details that isn't necessary compared to riskier substances such as ket ketamine, MDMA, opiates, and RX medications. So let me just to clarify, I'm trying to discern that extracted psilocybin is different than psilocybin mushrooms that are grown at home. So on one hand, psilocybin mushrooms that are grown in people's home own houses has a much, uh, the medical safety margin is much less compared to the social risk margin that happens to people who are using it illegally for therapeutic purposes. Dr. Sulak and others have testified to their personal use and of their friends, and that creates a risk of incarcer incarceration, social stigmatization, and other issues. Naturally growing psilocybin mushrooms isn't associated with problematic use or to use the stigmatized language, it, it has a substantially low risk of addiction, even less so than cannabis. And other risks such as hallucinogenic persisting perception disorder, AKA known as flashbacks are extremely rare. And the benefits that people are gaining from it in responsible use are, are notable. And so, I think that a plan like this um, 
isn't necessary at this point because it's it, having all these details into it that would maintain the social risks of those who are currently using it illegally. And to implement a program like this could take years. While we also have this ongoing work with Johns Hopkins, New York University, other, other places in the, in the country that are researching the effectiveness of extracted psilocybin. So I'd suggest to shift the conversation into the decriminalization of those substances, the naturally um, occurring ones that uh, have no risk in, or a minimum risk in the medical sense and a greater risk in the social sense. So I'm so glad that this conversation is happening. I really wanna encourage it. I want it to go on. I think that within our place in the Riverbird Clinic, we, where we are offering legal psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, um, we've learned a lot about how to implement this within Portland, Maine, and feel that the bill that is being proposed right now actually would impede our ability to offer the level of service that we're doing at this point. So I, that was my brief point. I really thank you again for your time. I'm open to questions. Are there any questions of uh, Dr. Barkin? So just, just to be clear, the, the, the use, your, the uh, prescription use or the, uh, the given use that you're overseeing is as part of a research protocol? So one of them is a research protocol through MAPS, and that's the MDMA work. The okay. work using ketamine is mm -hmm. off-label use, using, using ketamine in a psychedelic model. So we have dual therapists, we have integrations, we have preparation, we have medicine sessions, we have integration sessions afterwards. We have community integration sessions that happen on a, a, a routinely twice a month and other services available, such as um, acupuncture, direct primary care, massage therapy, ongoing talk therapy. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, clarifying that. Um, are there any questions that anybody has for the doctor? I'm not seeing any, uh, and you'll be submitting written testimony when you have a chance to catch your breath. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think that concludes the public hearing portion of our consideration of 1582. Are there questions for Sam to look into before we? meet for a work session down the road. You may think of, yes, uh, Representative Perry. Thank you. My hand's not fast enough, I guess. Um, now, I think when we had talked to Poor, when we had talked to you, and I can't remember her name from uh, Johns Hopkins, that hey, yeah, she was going to uh, give us a study if we've received it, I haven't seen it. And could you see it, send it to me again. And if we haven't, uh, I, I would like to uh, see that work. Uh, I haven't received it yet, Representative, but I will follow up with her. Thank you. Any other requests to Sam? Okay, let's take a break until um, three about a 10 minute break, 326, and we'll come back here and we'll start the last bill. Thank you, 326.
Okay, so we'll resume uh, this afternoon's uh, public hearing schedule. And now we're going to hear consideration of LD 1909. And there are quite a few, quite a few people who want to speak to that. So uh, who is going to present the bill? I'm sorry. Representative I McDonald. She, ah, she's, good. That's right. I she's knew in that. the room. She's in the room. I should have known that. Welcome, Representative uh, McDonald. You're up. Thank you, Senator Claxton. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. I am Representative Genevieve McDonald of Maine House District 134, and I am testifying before you today as the sponsor of LD 1909, an act to remove restrictions on syringe service programs. Harm reduction saves lives. LD 1909 is drafted, would provide a model of care for Maine syringe service programs, SSPs, excuse me, that allows registered participants to receive the care and supplies they need to help prevent life-threatening diseases and lifelong illnesses. This model, often referred to as needs-based, is in alignment with best practices recommended by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and reduces negative health outcomes by decreasing the transmission of blood-borne illnesses such as HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis, soft tissue infection, endocarditis, and other preventable conditions. A needs-based model for syringe service programs is a public health response to our growing rates of infection and bloodborne illness. The Maine Center for Disease Control's 2019 Vulnerability Assessment reported Maine as having the second highest rate of acute hepatitis B and the 10th highest rate of acute hepatitis C in the United States. LD1909 directly responds to the fiscal and human impacts of substance use disorder by decreasing the risk of negative health outcomes that result in increased hospital visits and costs to the state and our communities. This public policy has the overwhelming support of Maine's medical community. The American Medical Association, US Centers for Disease Control, and Northern New England Society of Addiction Medicine all define a needs-based model of care as meeting best practices for public health policy and provision. The Pew Charitable Trust recently published recommendations for state governments that include the prevention of local limits on syringe distribution by requiring unlimited access to need-based syringe service programs and preventing municipal limitations on distribution. The study shows this reduces infectious disease and overdose rates and increases the use of treatment. Currently in Maine, registered participants of SSPs in our state can only obtain one syringe if they return one. There is no reason a person should not have safe, sterile supplies because of an arbitrary limit or cap. The medical community recommends that individuals use a new syringe at each injection, and a needs-based model allows individuals to identify the number of syringes they need in order to follow safe use recommendations. There are a number of reasons why a person may not have a syringe to give back. Given the rural nature of Maine, many participants struggle with transportation and geographic isolation from their nearest SSP. A needs-based model allows for participants to access the safe use supplies they need while eliminating additional barriers due to lack of transportation or transportation costs. LD1909 also supports overdose prevention. This bill increases access to life-saving harm reduction and safe use supplies that decrease the risk of infections. This access decreases overdose risk because it helps individuals maintain their health. Making syringe service programs truly accessible for safer use supplies means individuals are also more likely to access supplies like naloxone and fentanyl test strips. The opposite of addiction is connection. And SSPs often serve as the first place someone who is using drugs connects with harm reductionists, recovery support services, and treatment providers. Syringe service programs also build relationships with local medical providers, support services, and medication assistant treatment providers. This unique position allows SSP providers to connect people to those services when they are ready for them. These connections can and do lead people to long-term recovery. The CDC reports that people who access a syringe service program while in active addiction are five times more likely to enter recovery than people who do not. While a needs-based model that eliminates the cap entirely is ideal, I recognize the necessity of compromise. I'm proposing an amendment that replaces the bill. 
The amendment removes the proposed language allowing for a needs-based exchange and proposes language that allows the main CDC to limit the number of hypodermic apparatuses provided by a certified exchange through major, oh, sorry, through routine technical rulemaking. Section 1B is unchanged as there is no intent to prohibit the number of syringes that can be possessed, transported, or exchanged. While this amendment will not eliminate or establish a cap in statute, it will provide a pathway and the flexibility for the cap to be changed through rulemaking. 2021 was the deadliest year in Maine's opioid epidemic. This crisis requires a sharper focus on harm reduction and treatment. We can and must do better for the people struggling with addiction for their families, children, and the people who love them, and for our state and communities. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Are there any questions and follow up to that uh, testimony? I'm not seeing any, so uh, thank you for bringing that forward. Before we go any further, I wanna check with Senator Moore. Had you wanted to testify, Senator? Yes, thank you, Senator Claxton. If I could, please, that'd be great. Go right ahead. All right. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and fellow distinguished members of the Health and Human Services Joint Standing Committee. As you know, my name is Mary Ann Moore, and I proudly represent Senate District 6, which includes all of Washington County, along with Winter Harbor, Goldsboro, and Sullivan in Hancock County as well. I am here in support of LD-1909, an act to remove restrictions on sy syringe service programs. Uh, thank you, Representative McDonald, for your very thorough um, present or your testimony and the submitted of the amendment. I think that will be a very good workable one. I just wanna say just a few words or a few comments. While none of us want to encourage the use of illegal substances, the use of hypodermic apparatuses such as syringes goes beyond substance use disorders. Historically, we have seen the success of hypodermic apparatus exchange programs in preventing life-threatening infections. Prior to the pandemic, I always supported the one-to-one -one exchange of syringes. With the stay-at-home orders under the state of emergency we experienced starting in 2020, I soon realized that SSPs did more than provide clean syringes. They actually became a point of contact for agencies such as the Health Equity Alliance and main access points to go where the folks who were in need of clean syringes were actually located and provided additional information about available resources to help them with their substance use disorder, harm reduction at its best. Executive Orders 27 and 33, due to the emergency situation we were under, actually lifted enforcement of statutes such, such as the one governing SSPs. Upon their termination on August 31st, 2021, we find ourselves experiencing a devastating public health crisis in Maine with increasing mortality rates of people who use drugs, thus the need to lift the limiting of hypodermic apparatuses distribution or requiring the exchange of used hypodermic apparatuses. I, I wanna share the story that I think bothered me the most as I was listening to all of this. Um, in so many of our areas, uh, the communities have disposable containers and they've been having those containers broken into, whether it be at the Irving gas station, whether it be at a community center. And it was just so people will have syringes to exchange and get the clean ones they need to keep themselves as safe as, as possible. This is a huge safety risk. The programs have also started uh, stated they no longer feel comfortable telling people to use those community boxes because then they have nothing to bring back. So in summary, I think supporting 1909 is supporting recovery, something near and dear to our hearts. I urge you to vote all to pass on LD 1909. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of our colleague? I'm not seeing any at this point. So I think uh, we'll go to Gordon Smith as representing the department. Uh, representing the governor's, governor's office. Uh, Senator thank Claxton, uh, Representative Meyer, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I want to compliment uh, Representative McDonald and Senator uh, Moore on their testimony. They laid out very well some of the, the problems that uh, lead us to seeking um, legislation. Uh, I am Gordon Smith of East Winthrop, Maine. I serve as the Director of Opioid Response in the Governor's Office. 
uh, position I've held since February of 2019. I am really pleased to be able to support uh, LD 1909 today, but with the amendment presented by, by Representative McDonald, I think it's quite important that I make clear on the record that, that uh, we do not support a needs-based exchange as the bill was drafted, but we are fully in support of the, uh, of the amendment, and I'll explain to you uh, why. Um, we really believe that the amendment is a reasonable compromise between those advocates who support a law allowing for an unlimited number of syringes, a so-called needs-based exchange, and those opponents who support the existing rule allowing for the distribution of only as many syringes as a participant return. That one-to-one -one exchange has been in the rule since 1998 when the first exchange uh, opened in Portland. Um, the only time that it was not in place was, as you've heard, the period of the, uh, the uh, public health emergency when I had drafted for the governor executive order 27 that was designed to give more leeway to the participants and the service providers uh, in order to keep participants safe from uh, COVID. That executive order, as Senator uh, Moore said, expired on August uh, 31st, 2021. Um, our support for, the, for a cap, which the amendment uh, proposes, is premised upon the following argument, that, that the service, syringe service providers, and you'll hear from a, a number of them, um, they provide far more than syringes. Uh, I really prefer to call them service, syringe service providers and not needle exchanges. Um, so this is now how we meet that community that is still using drugs. Uh, we give them Narcan or intramuscular naloxone, fentanyl test strips, condoms, all kinds of things to keep them safe. We screen them for infectious disease. We refer them to treatment and, and for other, other social services. And you will be receiving the annual report that shows the 12 months uh, of experience. Um, you'll have that, I would guess next week, definitely before the work session. And I have some data from that report. Um, so our support of wanting a limit, and frankly, our, the, the, what we will propose in the rule is a limit of 100, 100 syringes or the number that are returned, whichever is greater. We don't want to diminish at all the ability of people to bring back needles. And if they bring back 250 needles, they would get 250 just as the rule is today. But if there are no uh, needles to expand, to, to bring back, then we think 100 is a reasonable limit. Again, that hinges on our desire to encourage program participants to visit the program sites in order to receive harm reduction services and products such as naloxone, fentanyl test strips, et cetera, and to establish a trusted relationship with the staff there. Uh, studies sh show that the participants in a syringe exchange program are five times more likely to seek recovery at some point than people who don't use, uh, who do inject drugs and do not participate in a uh, in a syringe uh, uh, exchange program. Um, so uh, in addition, we do think that establishing a reasonable limit may have a positive impact on the number of syringes that are not properly disposed of. These improperly discarded syringes pose a public health hazard and have led to significant concerns in some of our largest cities, including Portland, Lewiston, and Bangor. These are frequently complaints that come into my office. Um, they also, when a family goes out to Deering Oaks or Kennedy Park, at, at Kennedy Park in Lewiston and finds discarded needles, frankly, it also hurts our attempts in Maine to destigmatize harm reduction and to destigmatize, um, you know, uh, harm reduction in, in specific, specifically an SUD treatment generally. A um, couple things from the annual report, and I know I'm running out of time. Um, the report covers 
10 months under the executive order and two months under the one-to-one -one exchange. There were 2.7 million needles exchanged in, the la in, in, in that 12 month period that ended October 31st of last year. That was about a million more uh, syringes than the year before. So our efforts to expand these services, there's now 18 certified sites across the state, uh, is working. Um, there there were, all, were also 2 million syringes returned. So there were 700,000 that were hopefully disposed of in shops, containers, or otherwise properly disposed of, but we know that that doesn't always happen. The average number of visits by a participant was 3.8 and the average number of syringes distributed, and I find this to be really interesting, the number of syringes which, uh, that were distributed in a, uh, in a single event was 99. Uh, so pretty close to our proposal to cap, have a cap at 100. Um, Okay, um, I'm going to just close right now with, with just a bit of history that when we started in February of 2019, there were seven certified programs, and they were receiving a total of $75,000 in state support for all of them together. Um, beginning in 2019, through the efforts of Senator Linda Sanborn at that time, and our office, we now are providing about a million dollars a year in support in the aggregate to these sites, which is one of the reasons why they've expanded to 18 sites. Some in rural areas, there's two in Washington County, uh, as Representative Perry and Senator Moore know, we've been able to get one in Aroostook County. Um, and, uh, and, and I think if we're going to expect people to come in more frequently, then it, it continues to be our obligation to expand the number of sites under the current rule. Um, so I think with that, uh, I, I will tell you too, that we have a million dollars in the prevention and treatment fund that, that we talked with you about two weeks ago. Uh, the first million dollars in that fund will go to support these programs because they are such an important part of our work with our li options liaisons. And when you think, and this is the last comment I, I, I will make, I appreciate that I've had extra time um, when you think about the position that I'm in, and I really need to communicate messages and, and meet and find the people who are at most at risk, where am I going to find people who are injecting uh, drugs? They don't advertise in the paper. I can find them anonymously at our, 18, at our 14 existing sites. There's over five over 5,000 of them. And those are the people that we try to message, don't use alone. Here's NACAN for you, call 911, um, be, be careful of fentanyl, be safe. We want you to be alive and to have a chance for recovery when you are ready for recovery. Thank you for the testimony, the opportunity rather to testify. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Director Smith. Rep uh, Senator Moore. Thank you so much for your testimony, Gordon. Will you be submitting written testimony? Oh. Yes, I meant to make that clear. I had beautiful written testimony for you last night, but um, we pivoted a little bit in, in our discussions with Representative McDonald. And so I did not have time to rewrite that testimony. I will get it to you within 24 to 48 hours uh, because my testimony on behalf of the governor gets reviewed by people as it, as it should. But uh, I've given you the gist of what we're gonna say. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to support. We really appreciate that Representative McDonald has been uh, willing to change her draft considerably by presenting that committee amendment. And we, uh, we also uh, moved away from some of our previous uh, drafting and are happy to support her amendment. Great, awesome. One other question, if I may, Senator Clarkson. Please, please. Is, the, is the syringe report posted on the website? I couldn't not, find no. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it, it's not. Um, it is in the hands of uh, the commissioner 
and who is committed to making sure that through Mo Molly that you'll see it. We tried to get it for you today, but it, it is six, over 60 pages. Um, <laughs> and we, we want you to have the highlights of it. There's an, a little executive summary. Um, and it, it is, there were some edits that were being made and that held it up. But we, uh, it's absolutely, you know, 99% done. And I have every expectation that it will be with you by early next week. Hope, well, well before your work session, I hope. Because that, that data does inform our position. And, and you'll want to have access to it. It's an excellent report, I Absolutely. I agree totally. Thank you. Welcome. Very good. Thank you again, uh, Gordon Smith, for being here and presenting your testimony. Now in alphabetical order, the way we do these things, we'll go to Brian Townsend. Welcome. Hi, my name is Brian Townsend. I'm a constituent from Scarborough. Um, I should say Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, members of the Health and Human Services Committee, thanks for letting me attend and, and offer public comment. Um, I'm the executive director of Amistad, which supports Mainers struggling with substance use disorders in Cumberland, Saginaw Hawk, and Lincoln counties. And since the middle of 2020, we've run a, uh, an SSP, a syringe service program in Greater Portland, which operates at 103 India Street, which is the former site of the city of Portland's public health center. Amistad's operated substance use focused recovery centers in Bath and Booth Bay Harbor since 2018. And we run recovery residences that support individuals who utilize medication assisted treatment like Suboxone and Methadone in support of their recovery. And through these services, we've gained an intimate knowledge of the needs and risks of people who struggle with opioid use disorders, including those who are housed in rural settings and those who are homeless in urban settings. Amistad applied to the CDC for our license to run an SSP in Greater Portland at the height of the pandemic. With hundreds of unhoused people displaced from services and treatment, we were seeing the spike in overdoses and the transmission of HIV and Hep C before the data started telling that tragic story. The community was fortunate in that we launched our program while the governor's executive orders allowing for needs-based and mobile distribution were still in place. We were able to go directly to this scattered population and discern their real needs and their real barriers to accessing those needs and to build our program to maximize the impact of the resources. We started to build a system of support that actually worked for our under, underserved and most vulnerable community members. And we started to see reductions in non-fatal and fatal overdoses and infection reductions among the target population. We also saw firsthand how effective harm reduction programming supports recovery as we were able to leverage our connection to support many individuals with accessing treatment, entering recovery residences, and connecting to recovery resources. The resumption eventually of quote unquote business as usual following the expiration of the governor's orders stopped this progress in its tracks. This was an example of something our state should always be looking to avoid, a regression to a failed approach that's been rendered obsolete by new research and the establishment of new best practice methods and standards. Restrictions placed on healthcare services to underserved populations result in unnecessary deaths, increased costs and strains on other public systems, and an erosion of community strength and spirit. By resuming needs-based distribution practices and the removal of arbitrary limitations on SSPs, LD 1909 offers communities the hope of recovery and the chance of finally turning the curve on this opioid epidemic and its most unacceptable outcomes, overdoses and infections resulting from barriers placed on the skilled delivery of care and support. I would ask this committee to please support LD 1909 and act to remove restrictions on syringe exchange programs. This legislation will liberate SSPs to engage effectively and impactfully with underserved populations, reduce the number of fatal and non-fatal overdoses, reduce the number of HIV and Hep C infections, align our state's rules and programming with established best practices, and build a bridge to recovery and treatment for our state's most vulnerable community members. For all these reasons, I also endorse the idea of, of removing any sort of cap on, the, on, on this when, when that comes to discussion, um, really for the same reasons that healthcare offered with restrictions um, generally impact those most vulnerable and underserved the most. 
And please reach out to me through the contact, through the contact information I provided, or if I can answer any questions now, I'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Are there any questions of uh, Brian? I'm not seeing any. Thank you for your work with Amistad. Glad to hear you've had some successes. Next, we'll go to Chastity Tool. Welcome. Hi, uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. I am Chastity Tool. I am testifying in favor of LD 1909 as a person in recovery and the director of a syringe service program in Washington County for main access points. I deeply understand the direct impacts that 1909 would have on the safety of our neighbors and community members in Maine. The programs I run in Callis and Machias were fortunate enough to get up and running in July during the civil state of emergency when the executive orders were in place that allowed programs to provide a model of care that were praised nationally by places like the American Medical Association and are considered to be best practices because we truly met people where they were at. Part of this was eliminating the one-for-one -one exchange requirement to be needs-based distribution. It provided participants with the autonomy and choice to decide what they truly needed, keeping themselves as safe as possible, when so often people who use drugs, their voices and needs are not heard. Going back to one-for-one -one after 15 months operating under a needs-based model has been devastating in rural Maine. In Washington County, we have no public transportation. I think a single taxi service and lots of miles in between anything and everything. It's not feasible to expect people can get to their closest exchange multiple times a week to bring used syringes for new ones. Therefore, they can't make decisions based on safety and they're forced to reuse syringes anyways <laughs> until they can get to an SSP. Traveling 50 to 100 miles multiple times a week to get supplies is just another barrier that Mainers don't need. We already have so many and this is a simple one that would increase access to care and the support they need. No other service related to substance use prevents the spread or contraction of many diseases, HIV, hepatitis C, and you'll hear that over and over and over again, or meets people where they're truly at in a non-coercively way, non way like an SSP does. Few programs can build relationships, safety, and trust in the ways that an SSP can and being forced back into an antiquated model of care. Besides the physical cost to individual health, it also has impacted participants' trust with our programs. Seeing people more often does not always mean you're building a trusting relationship. Actually hearing and meeting people's needs do. 1909 ensures that all Mainers have the opportunity to dignity and respect and prioritizes the needs of rural Maine. I ask you to vote in favor of 1909 and stand in support of public health in Maine. With that, I'd just like to express my gratitude to not only Representative McDonald and all the co-sponsors of 1909, but especially to the Washington County lawmaker, Senator Moore, Representative Perry, and Representative Toole for seeing the immense need and importance of supporting syringe service programs ability to provide services in a meaningful way. Please reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions or I can answer anything now. Thank you for your testimony. Are there Thank any you. questions for Chastity? I don't see any. So continuing alphabetically, we'll go to Courtney Allen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Claxon, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. It's so nice to see you. It's the first time I've gotten to be in front of your committee this session. Um, as you all know, probably my name is Courtney Allen. I'm the policy director of the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1909. I do wanna start by saying that we are going to support the amendment proposed by Representative McDonald's, but supporting this amendment is, is really an effort to compromise with the governor's office and to, can, to support the work that Gordon Smith's been doing to bring everybody to the table on this. Our support of the amendment, it is no way an agreement that creating a cap on syringe services programs is best practices or really the policy that we support. It's really an effort to come to a compromise. We are still in support of a needs-based model of care for syringe service programs because we believe that harm reduction is a valid pathway of and to recovery from substance use disorder. Often when I say that, people think that I believe that the primary mission of harm reduction is to lead people to recovery. 
And that's actually just simply not true. Um, we believe that the primary mission of harm reduction services is to reduce the harm of drug use. And putting a cap on the number of supplies that syringe services programs can provide to people who are using drugs is counter to that primary mission. People need access to the number of syringes that they need to stay safe. And that's really the bottom line. We believe that arbitrary caps on the number of syringes that syringe pro programs can give to people who are using drugs is really a way for us to make the public a little more um, plausible to harm reduction. But in reality, we hope that the government would set public policy based on science and best practices. And the needs-based model is the policy that is for best practices. So again, we wish that the policy could be passed as it is, but we'll um, support the amendment in the effort to compromise. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions of Courtney? I'm not seeing any. So now we'll go to Hillary Eslinger. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Hillary Esslinger, and I'm speaking on behalf of Maine Access Points. It is a privilege to be speaking in support of 1909, a bill that would ensure a needs-based model for syringe access in Maine. A needs-based model allows participants of syringe service programs, SSPs, to receive the necessary amount of syringes to maintain safety in their use, resulting in decreased negative health outcomes and overdose. We saw this model embraced by the state through Executive Order 27 that temporarily ended one-for-one -one syringe exchange during the beginning of the pandemic. That was a really meaningful time for us. Um, during the executive order, we embraced a needs-based model. SSPs had the opportunity to explore with participants how we could best meet their needs in regards to the amount of supplies that they needed. Um, I wanna take a minute to discuss what these conversations look like and how we collectively determine how many syringes someone needs at their visit to our program. So we ask them how many times a day they use and how many syringes on average it takes to successfully inject at each instance of use. Public health best practices have determined that an individual should use a new syringe at every instance of injection. That means if you take three attempts to inject during one instance of use, best practices would encourage you to use three sterile syringes. With that in mind, if an individual uses 10 times a day, they may be utilizing 30 plus syringes to ensure their safety. We explore what drugs the individual is using. So different substances result in someone using a varying amount of syringes each day. We know that a fentanyl based supply is fast acting and without the longer lasting effects we see in a heroin based supply, this would result in someone needing more syringes. We inquire on their access to transportation, how far they are from an SSP and what their schedule looks like. We want to make sure they do not run out of supplies before they're able to make it back to our program. A needs-based model allows us to have a personalized approach to each interaction we engage in. In practice, when we're required to work within a one-for-one -one model, participants have to count each syringe that they are looking to dispose of in front of staff. This puts both parties at risk of a needle prick and the transmission of bloodborne illness. At MAP, we provide participants with bio-waste disposal containers. Um, a one-for-one -one model discourages individuals from safely disposing of their syringes prior to exchange. To count their syringes at the exchange, participants either have to empty their syringes out of the safe disposal container or put their hands into the container or just not use a safe um, disposal option prior to that exchange. And this is just really not safe for anybody. Um, LD1909 and a needs-based model promotes public policy that is based on the dignity and respect of people who use drugs in Maine, recognizing them as active participants in their health care. To be clear, we support the amendment. We do not support an arbitrary cap and do not recognize that as a needs-based model. We will continue to see our neighbors die from overdose, infection, and other negative health implications associated with the one-for-one -one model until we pass public policy that ensures their safety. I ask for your support um, of LT, LD1909 and your commitment to best practices in public health policy. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions. So let's go to uh, Julia Gustafson. 
Hello there. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative, or Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Committee of Health and Human Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julia Gustavison. Um, I am from Orono, and I am testifying on behalf of HEAL in support of LD1909. I am a social work intern from University of Maine with two years prior experience working in HEAL's syringe service program. I am not in recovery and I've never used injection drugs, but I speak to the effectiveness of these programs and the ethical value moving forward with this act. Syringe service programs work to reduce the risks of negative outcomes from use of injection drugs by collecting used syringes, offering tools to prevent and reverse overdose, providing safer use supplies and education, and acting as compassionate support for a particularly vulnerable and stigmatized community. This collectively reduces the risks of unsafe disposal of supplies, injuries from use and or damaged hardware, fentanyl exposure and overdoses, the transmission of life-threatening infections, and the feelings of isolation among people who are injecting drugs. We were able to see the increased potential of these programs during the early stages of COVID-19 when the Executive Order 27 allowed for the true needs based model until its expiration in the end of August. Said needs-based model is supported by the US CDC and medical community, not only as an evidence-based best practice, but also as a model that reduces total emergent medical costs related to injuries, infections, and overdose for the state as a whole. The CDC has also found that the needs-based model leads to no increase in unsafe syringe disposal. This means no increase in syringe litter. Um, I'm sorry. Um, and it is effective in connecting individuals with the resources for recovery as they deem themselves ready. With all of this information, it is the ethical decision to reinstate best practices by supporting and moving forward with LD1909 for the collective benefit of our main community. I would like to thank the Committee on Health and Human Services for listening to this matter and for their continued service to improving the lives of all Mainers. Thank you. I can take any questions. Representative Zager has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, is it Gustavison? Uh, yes, Gustavison. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, testifying today. Um, something that you said um, connected to something that, that um, Director Smith said, um, and this has to do with uh, um, the the, the uh, amount of syringes that might be unsafely left in, maybe in a public uh, place, which could present a hazard. He connected that uh, to the, the concern about um, about uh, the, the, the the issue of stigma. Um, that if, if you have a, uh, members of the community who see that as a threat to their children or uh, like that, that could harm the destigmatization process. You, you presented testimony that, that the number of uh, inadequately disposed of needles does not increase with a, um, a non one for one or more, more um, um, free flowing uh, distribution needs model. Based. Yes, uh, needs based the CDC model. does support that the needs-based model does not increase syringe litter. And I in fact would also add that the increased trust that a needs-based bottle would provide for the community would also increase the amount of syringes that people are trying to bring back. So okay, I guess does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the CDC's uh, recommendations. That's a, it's a national, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a national approach and um, where there's Different prevalences of HIV and, and, and hepatitis C and so forth. Um, so I, I'm just uh, I, I, I guess I was trying to figure out where where what you were basing your testimony on. Is I was you're saying it's based on the national um, recommendations, not 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 what you're finding in in, in the local area or in where you uh, operate or in Maine. Well, so the CDC did find. Um, sorry. Um, yes, that was a CDC finding that a needs-based model would not increase unsafe syringe disposal. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of what I was going to say. Uh, that's fine. No, it, it gives me. I, I I very much appreciate it because um, yeah. uh, I, I think this is this is great. I'm I'm a, I'm a co-sponsor on this bill, um, and and you know certainly looking for ways to um, to address 
um, not only the intent of the legislation, but also to prevent uh, on, on, on uh, um, uh, you know, adverse effects that we wouldn't intend. Unintended yeah, consequences. further risks, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? So thank you for being here and we'll go to June Evergreen. Thank you, um, Senator Claxton, Representative Mayor and the distinguished members of the Committee on Health and Human Service. My name is June Evergreen from Bangor and I'm testifying today on behalf of HEAL in support of LD1909, an act to remove restrictions on the syringe service program. I've been with HEAL for over two years as a harm reduction coordinator. I'm also a person in recovery and I'm alive because of the very Narcan that we provide. My son still has his mother. I share that because I am lucky that my extremely risky choices during my substance use didn't create repercussions to follow me into my recovery. A feat so many cannot celebrate. Maine has lost so many loved ones to something preventable. LD1909 is a radical act of love and support. In Bangor last year, we safely disposed of 659,957 syringes. We served over 1,500 people with a total of 7,490 total exchanges. Of those people, 786 were successfully revived from our Narcan. This is reflecting only the number of people actually reporting these reversals. These numbers represent a people from a variety of different backgrounds, barriers, needs, capabilities, and different experiences. I regularly hear of people that are sharpening the syringes until there's nothing left, people marking their syringes so that if the only option is to reuse, that they know that they're only using their own. I've been told by an unsettling number of people of how they've reused one syringe upwards of 35 times. And I would ask you to Google a magnifying view of a syringe after six uses. This image is what we're forcing people to utilize, causing a number of costly health issues. A common theme is being thanked for being treated like a human being before their substance use. I see their ability to attain new supplies. Um, I see relief in their ability to attain new supplies and gratitude for each vial of Narcan. Trust is built and with this trust come stories of struggles you would not believe. These people are so strong and inspiring and above all brave. And you must be coming in to ask a total stranger for rigs to shoot a drug that you cannot escape the grips of. The world being so unkind to people battling with substance use, people in agony from a burn within the depths of their soul met with a world saying, well, you shouldn't have touched the fire, huh? All this stigma is creating a culture without hope. Meeting basic needs is how we refill that hope. Um, these beasts that is substance use is a challenging one to tame, but as I see many people here who have, and I bet if you ask them their secret, they would tell you about the supports they had, the love they received, and how they weren't fighting to meet their basic needs. Basic needs can look like shelter, food, transportation, clothing, to name a few, but basic needs for injection drug users is safe supplies. This is why HEAL supports LD1909 without a cap, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I don't see any questions, but thank you for being here. Next, we'll go to Katie Stevenson. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and committee members. My name is Katie Stevenson. I'm a fourth year medical and public health student at Tufts University School of Medicine program at Maine Medical Center, and I'm a constituent of Cumberland County. As a future Maine physician and a future health public health professional, I'm here to testify in favor of LD1909. I've worked with and seen patients from Sanford up to the county and from Portland out to Princeton. I've seen clients with abscesses that threaten their limbs and infections in their spines and in their hearts that threaten their lives. I've seen people learn that they will now be living with HIV for the rest of their life. I also serve as a hospital chaplain. In that role, I sat with children as they say goodbye to their, to their parents who have finally lost their fight with the disease they almost certainly contracted after using a non-sterile syringe. Removing restrictions on syringe exchange programs is a simple and effective strategy for reducing the rates of diseases like HIV and hepatitis B and C throughout this state. 
The American Medical Association and the CDC define needs-based models of syringe exchange as best practice for syringe distribution and the most effective model for reducing the transmission of infectious diseases. Over the past two years in this pandemic, we have stretched our public health workforce beyond what we could ever have imagined. Therefore, it is impractical to continue to ask our public health professionals to also continue to track and treat our growing rates of hepatitis and endocarditis when a policy change has the potential to address so much of this problem. And this problem is not cheap. The majority of individuals that I see who need care related to the use of a non-sterile syringe are recipients of main care. This means that any investments we don't make to ensure their access to ser sterile syringes now, we pay as a state later in the form of funded hospitalizations and treatment. In public health, we have a parable about someone standing at the edge of a river where they see person after person traveling downstream drowning. They stay for a while, pulling person after person back to safety. However, they eventually become tired of pulling people out of the river, and so they walk upstream to discover why people are falling in in the first place. It's a poor use of our state's resources to keep pulling people out of the river when we know how to stop them from falling in. I have one year, year, more year of medical school remaining, and yet I'm already tired of seeing patients with infections that we know how to prevent. I'm tired of watching neighbors get into recovery only to die of these diseases they contracted years ago. I'm tired of watching people grieve their loved ones, lost to diseases we could have done something about. Removing restrictions on syringe exchange programs is a simple and effective strategy for reducing the transmission of infectious diseases throughout this state. And as a future main physician, I support removing restrictions on syringe exchange programs so we can do what we can to keep our communities, friends, and families healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and perspective. Uh, I don't see any questions, so let's go to Katie Robbins. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I have children here, so um, <laughs> I'm begging them to be quiet, but they will probably not listen. Good luck um, with that. <laughs> so good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Mayor, and esteemed members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Katie Robbins. I represent myself and my organization, Rising Grind Recovery. Um, I do support 1909 before the amendment. Um, I can't decide if I support it with the amendment quite yet. I know I support it without. Um, I am a person long-term recovery and I am also a person who has four kids that have a mother, thankfully, to Narcan. Um, and I just wanna discuss a little bit of the reality of being an intravenous user. Um, I used IV heroin for five-ish years, maybe six. And in that time, I can tell you that I never had access to a syringe service program. I didn't even have access to anyone that knew what recovery was. Um, and I had reused needles I mean, up to probably 30 times, if not more. Um, I have shot up with bent needles and shared needles and like broken ones. I've had abscess in my arms. I mean, I've had pretty bad experiences because I didn't have access to these supplies that I so desperately needed to keep myself healthy. Um, and as somebody that was using, I used, minimally about 12 times a day. Um, and that was on a day where it was rough to get money and it was rough to get by. If I could, I would have definitely used more and I did. And someone prior was saying something that people use up to three sometimes to get um, a correct shot or something to that effect. So, I mean, even just in one day, say it takes you three times, the majority of the time that's 20 to 30 needles a day. Um, and I currently live down in Southern Maine, but I was living up in Aroostook County where there is no transportation. There is no general acceptance of this at all. So getting somewhere to get syringes was nearly impossible, let alone if you only got a hundred. I mean, I can't even imagine you, like it was said, you would still be reusing um, syringes, which kind of defeats the purpose. 
Um, also, I love being um, part of the state of Maine. I love that we're very forward. We're doing a lot of work in recovery. It is really amazing. Um, but to have something that was an executive order and then to backtrack that, it just doesn't make sense. Um, especially because there was so much success and there was so much, you know, like pride and that we were doing what was needed and that we were reaching people and that we were getting supplies out. And now we just reverse that and we leave all these people that had made that connection and they can't have that connection anymore or they do, but it's stipulated. And then just to reiter reiterate, um, the one of the girls before me said that if we trust people, they're going to likely bring back more. And that I cannot emphasize enough. If you treat people with dignity and respect and you trust them, you are so much more likely to get in return something positive than if you restrict them and put all these guidelines on them, um, especially if it is something that is shown to work. I just think that it it's necessary, we need it. And um, I, I still don't like the cap. I mean, a hundred needles is not that many if you're using a bunch of times a day and in the event you have a friend over, you know, I just, we really need 1909. Um, we need our public policy to be focused in health. And that's, that's my cue. So thank you guys. Thank you for hanging in there so you could give your testimony. I don't see any questions from the group. So let's go to uh, Kina Takara. Hi there. Hi, Senator Hi. Claxton and Representative Meyer and members of the committee. My name is Kina Thakwar. I'm here to support LD1909. I am an infectious disease and addiction medicine specialist. I'm here on behalf of Northern New England Society of Addiction Medicine and also Maine Medical Association. Um, I also happen to serve on the Infectious Disease Society of America National Task Force for Substance Use. And I've presented nationally and internationally on harm reduction. Um, so I'm supporting LD1909 because I treat many patients with complications from injection drug use, including HIV, hepatitis, and other serious complications such as endocarditis, which are heart infections. For those with serious infections, some of them have to stay in the hospital for six to eight weeks on IV antibiotics. They may require new heart valves, extensive surgeries, and these are costly admissions. The median cost, as we calculated here in Maine, was about $175,000 per patient. And as you may know, Maine has one of the highest rates of acute hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And this is largely due to unsafe injection practices. And these are infections that we can easily prevent with less restrictive during service policies. We also know that people can substantially reduce their risk of getting HIV and other serious infections by using new needles and new equipment every time they inject, as you've heard. Many of the patients that my colleagues and I see have been forced to reuse or share their equipment because of lack of access. And the one-for-one, -one, as you've heard, restricts the amount um, that, of new equipment that people can obtain. Um, you know, just recently I saw a patient in the hospital who said, she couldn't access the equipment that she needed and she had to reuse her needle, ended up with a bone infection and spent several weeks in the hospital. So we are seeing this every day. Our research specifically here in Maine during the pandemic has shown that expansion and farm production services through mobile delivery, mail delivery, elimination of the one-for-one -one exchange were effective ways to improve access to harm reduction. And in this past year, as I mentioned, I've seen countless patients admitted to the hospital with Lost her. We just lost your audio. <laughs> it looks like you're unmuted. The video is good. We can't hear you, though. You want to try? You want to try and say something? Here. There can you, you hear go. Me now? Yeah. now we can okay. hear you. Sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, sorry about that. That um, uh, I think with our hospitals being overwhelmed here in Maine, uh, you know, supporting this bill is really important, and it really be, brings us back to a needs-based model, back in line with CDC recommendations, IDSA recommendations, 
And I think LD1909 is gonna be crucial for the health of our community. And I'm very encouraged to see stakeholders working together uh, to make a workable solution. So thank you for your time. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm here for any questions you might have. <laughs> That's not exactly the first time that's happened today, so don't feel <laughs> bad. <laughs> Thank you for your expertise. I'm not seeing any questions. Um, let's go now to Mallory Shaughnessy. First, Welcome. During that time period, Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. And then the Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Senator uh, Claxton, Representative Meyer, uh, members of the um, HHS committee. Um, I, you know me. I, my name is Mary Shaughnessy. Hang on a minute. Oh, yep. We're, we're hearing something else. I'm not sure if it's you, Mallory, or not. Oh, it could be. I'm on. I'm on multiple. No, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'm. I, I was on multiple different devices, and I hadn't fully muted the other one. Oh, I've okay. been muted. No, I unmuted you so that okay. you could see if can you, you were the source. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I had multiple multiple uh, hearings and, and things going on, so I've muted everything else. Sorry about that. I appreciate that. you doing that for, uh, for Kina, and so she won't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Mallory Shaughnessy. Um, I live in Westbrook, and I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services. And on behalf of our 35 members, I'm here to speak in support of LD1909 and act to remove restrictions on syringe exchange programs. Um, the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services is a statewide membership association for community behavioral health organizations. And with our 35 members, we represent the majority of Maine's licensed community mental health and substance use disorder treatment agencies, especially those working within the safety net across our state. Um, and we advocate for the implementation of policies and practices that serve to enhance the quality and effectiveness of our behavioral health care system. LD1909 is such a policy. LD1909 would provide a model of care for main syringe service programs that would allow registered um, participants to receive the medical care in an adequate supply of hydro, high, I can't even speak it, hypo, hypodermic <laughs> apparatuses <laughs> to stay safe from overdose or life-threatening disease. Um, and I hear that there's been some change in the amendment um, which in some ways I feel like may be unfortunate because the needs-based model is in alignment with best practices recommended by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, and is regarded to improve public health by decreasing the transmission of bloodborne illnesses and other preventable conditions. Um, this needs-based model allows also for the participant to access sufficient supplies um, while avo avoiding multiple trips, which in a rural state like Maine is, is a, a critical barrier to overcome. Um, you know, unfortunately, this bill does not increase funding for access to treatment for substance use disorder, but it does bring the participant into contact with the recovery support services and treatment providers. And that information can lead them to seek treatment as you've been hearing. Um, this is a harm reduction approach and it is proven to create connections and often opens the new doors and new directions for somebody to follow. Um, the Alliance always, um, uh, as you hear me often, encourages the committee to support uh, enhanced treatment funding and expanded access to all forms of substance use treatment and recovery uh, supports. Um, and as you've heard already, the CDC does say that those that have accessed this are five times more likely to enter recovery than people who do not. Uh, but there needs to be an adequate network of treatment providers available when somebody does step down that new path and does seek treatment. Um, we do feel this is a harm reduction method that is um, uh, well, well respected and very much needed um, to expand access here in Maine. So, on behalf of the alliance, I would urge you to um, vote not to pass on this today, thank, or when you come back. <laughs> thank you, and I'd be happy to get you any information. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions from the committee, so uh, we'll go to Marshall Mercer. Good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right then. Dear Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee, my name is Marshall Mercer. I'm an organizer for Maine Recovery Advocacy Project and a volunteer community naloxone distributor for Maine Access Point. For years, I have been an advocate for those who are still using, those who may be looking for recovery and haven't found what recovery looks like for them. Oh. <laughs> as well as those in recovery pathway and their families and friends alike. I have lost many friends, 
and many family members to this disease, most because of the stigma, shame due to the, how we are treated when we're asking for help. When I was in active addiction because of the shame of not wanting to purchase a needle because of how we were treated when we were tried to, often I resorted to sharing needles, which led me to contract an hepatitis C. In recovery, I was able to access treatment, although that treatment cost $90,000 for 90 pills. Um, at the time I was on main care, that payment came from, at the time I was on, on main care, but that, that payment came from taxpayers' pockets, which I'm forever grateful for. But it would have been a lot cheaper and a whole lot safer to be able to have a safe supply of needles that could have been exchanged safely. My point behind all this anyways is, um, all script aside is, I've been on the front lines and I've been using it for years. I've been clean for five years now. A lot of my friends never came to ask for help because of the way we were treated. A lot of them are dead now. They're not here no more. They're no longer with us. Um, I respect Lee and behind and I'm cool with the amendment, but like a lot of people just said, um, it, it doesn't really help. I guess my biggest ask for you, um, my main people is to um, listen to what the people who are actually using, the people who have gone through it, um, the people that, that's still alive and that watched all of our friends and families died, listen to what we got to say. We might know a few things. And um, here here for any questions as well. Thank you, Marshall. Are there questions? Thanks for bringing your story. Thank you. And your perspective. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Michael Cavetti. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Cabetta, Policy Counsel for the ACLU of Maine, a statewide organization dedicated to advancing and preserving the civil rights and liberties of our state and federal constitutions. On behalf of our members, I urge you to support this bill as it will remove barriers to health care provided by syringe services, uh, service providers in our state. For more than two decades, our organization has worked to remove barriers and increase access to syringe service programs or SSPs across the country. Last year, we worked with a broad coalition to undo one of those barriers by decriminalizing the possession and exchange of syringes. Removing criminal penalties helped move our drug laws away from punishment so that people were less afraid to seek out the healthcare they needed. We support this bill for similar reasons. The rules that currently govern SSPs are outdated, arbitrary, and not supported by science. They also lead to worse health outcomes. The federal CDC points out that, quote, restrictive syringe access policies are associated with higher injection risk behaviors and higher rates of HIV and other bloodborne infections, end quote. The CDC calls Maine's one-for-one -one requirement, quote, the most restrictive approach to syringe distribution, end quote. This most restrictive approach erects unnecessary barriers to care and endangers lives through the transmission of bloodborne infections. We can see the result of this approach in our state's bloodborne infections disease, disease rates. Maine's rate of acute hepatitis B infection is more than twice the national rate. In 2020, Maine saw a 69% increase in acute hepatitis A diagnoses over the previous year. And in 2019, Maine saw a 51 0.3% increase in hepatitis C diagnoses over the previous year. People in our state are getting sicker and our outdated rules are standing in the way of they're getting better. Intravenous drug use is a highly individualized experience. The number of syringes needed to consume drugs safely varies from person to person, as does the ability to access SSPs regularly. The people who work at SSPs are in the best position to decide in consultation with their clients what their clients' needs are. Arbitrary caps, on the number of needles that can be distributed or one-for-one -one exchange requirements unnecessarily impede the ability of people uh, to obtain the health care they need. In order to remove arbitrary barriers to health care that so many people in Maine need, we urge you to vote that this bill ought to pass. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll try to answer questions if you have any. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I don't see any questions, so let's go to Wendy Smith. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and the members of the Health and Human Services Committee. 
My name is Wendy Smith. I'm the Young Adult Diversion Program and Policy and Advocacy Lead for the Restorative Justice Institute of Maine and a person in long-term recovery. I'm here today to testify in favor of 1909 on behalf of RJIM. We believe this bill will reduce the harm we see in our communities by reducing the transmission of infectious diseases, deadly infections, and overdoses. Thankfully, when I was in active use, I didn't contract disease or infections, but that was by the grace of God. Many people I know haven't been so lucky. One of my closest friends is currently in the hospital clinging to life by a thread. She currently has had three blood transfusions and lost her leg due to a blood infection. All this is due to the lack of availability of clean syringes. Another young woman lost her life due to an infection that went to her heart. She was 21 years old. She hadn't even had a chance to find her place in life, have children, finish college, or be walked down the aisle at her wedding. As a harm reductionist, I went with her to the needle exchange to get clean supplies, only to find her turned down for not having used supplies to exchange. She was struggling to find recovery, but was making progress every day. She died a week later, alone in a hospital room. What if that was your loved one? This young woman, like so many others out there, deserves to be protected by the law and receive safe supplies. I strongly urge you to vote to pass this bill, as is. We've lost enough people. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee at this point. Uh, we've been joined by Rob Garobkin. Welcome. Hello, um, my name is Rob Karapkin. Um, I'm the owner operator of the Courage House. It's a 20 bed residential program in Gorham for survivors of substance use disorder and incarceration. I'm also a master's student at the BU School of Public Health and a person in long-term recovery from mental illness. As somebody working on the ground every day with men who are trying to rebuild their lives after periods of problematic drug use, I can tell you for a fact that making a new life as a law-abiding citizen is hard. Doing it with hepatitis C after watching people you love die, not only of overdoses, but also of preventable infections, is harder. My guys are telling me about having used what they call fish hook needles because they look more like fishing supplies than surgical supplies. Surviving drug use is hard. Surviving and recovering from that is harder. So much of what Maine is doing around drugs right now simply isn't working. Again and again, our criminal justice system is spitting people out worse than when they came in. In so many ways, we're failing to help people who use drugs and our families stay safe and healthy. However, there are things that we know do in fact work. In this book, it's called Undoing Drugs by the historian Maya Solovitz. She recounts how in the 1980s, both Liverpool, England and Edinburgh, Scotland had significant rates of intravenous drug use. Liverpool opened one of the first syringe service programs in the world. Edinburgh did the opposite, refusing to even sell syringes to anybody who looked like a drug user. When the AIDS epidemic hit, Edinburgh was pummeled. Liverpool didn't report a single locally contracted case of HIV among injectors. These programs work. That's why former president Mike Pence voted to fund syringe service programs in Indiana in 2015 when he was the governor. Not because Mike Pence supports people who use drugs, but because these programs work. I ask that you simply be as progressive as Mike Pence. Today, our state's rates of intravenously transmitted hep C, endocarditis, and other blood and skin infections are beyond alarming. Unlike so many drug policy interventions, we actually have a solution to this problem that will work. I encourage you to vote to eradicate hepatitis C in Maine. In a world of so many failed models, I encourage you to do something that will actually work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any, any questions of Rob? I don't see any, so let's go to Jennifer Christian. Hello, my name is Jennifer Christian, and I actually I um, reading this testimony for Catherine Ryder, who is the CEO of Tri County Mental Health Services. Um, and she isn't able to be here, so I hope I can do justice to her very passionate um, testimony. 
Esteemed committee members, I submit this written testimony in support of LD 1909. My advocacy is premised in research, ongoing experience in the field and personal experience. I believe supporting this bill will ensure the most optimal care for those we serve and maintain critical safety nets for the health and welfare of our main communities. I have served in this field for some 40 years now. Passionate about mission-driven work and meeting the needs of those most marginalized, disenfranchised, and often voiceless. I've also been blessed to witness many recovery journeys. Over the 30 years I've worked at Tri-County Mental Health, or TCMHS, the level of risk in our client population continues to rise. Those seeking services from our programs are more complex and, more, and many are dealing with histories that include significant trauma with resulting co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. We've watched overdose deaths grow exponentially over the years, most notably during the COVID pandemic. Clients report feeling isolated, disconnected, and anxious. TCMHS successfully stood up for up its first ever syringe service program, SSFP, during the early days of COVID. Each contact, and I can't say this strongly enough, each contact is an opportunity to make a connection, plant seeds of contemplation, and potentially facilitate someone's choice to move toward recovery. Even if that is not the case, we are building relationships, providing education and clean supplies, all of which bring the hope of another day of life. Our values of harm reduction promote an environment of no judgment, an opportunity to talk openly about how life might or could be different, all when the individual is ready. The CDC reports that people who access the syringe service program while in active addiction are five times more likely to recover, enter recovery than people who do not. And here at TCMHS, We've seen this bear fruit often as a direct correlation to the relationships of trust that have been nurtured over time. TCMHS is deeply invested in collaboration. We can connect dots to organizations, resources across the community to include EMS, primary care, behavioral health, and other basic needs. 30, in the face seconds. Of 30 seconds, okay. In the face of a pandemic, we've had to develop new pathways to care and through well-established partnerships with community leaders have been able to move the needle on creating a recovery ready community. The flexibility has afforded us during this pandemic have proven invaluable. And as an example, many of our clients have no ability to drive and rely on others to pick up clean supplies. If we revert back to one-on-one -on -one exchange, that will no longer be allowed and we may result in, and may result in practices that facilitate the transfer of disease and far worse death. This simply cannot happen. It is my greatest wish to ensure the highest quality of care for individuals we serve whenever possible support and facilitate their journey to recovery and hope. But most importantly, to save another family from experiencing the tremendous grief we are now living with. Your support of this bill is one way we can continue to provide life-saving interventions and opportunities. Um, and there was a bit more about uh, her 35-year-old son, Colin, who died recently due to an accidental overdose. Um, and she feels as though his ability to exact, uh, assess local SSFP was critical in sustaining his life during that time. I will wonder forever if his outcome might have been different had he been able to test his drugs for fentanyl before using. So she talks about uh, fentanyls. You can look at it in the uh, actual written testimony since I don't have time to do that here. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that testimony. Hmm. Um, I think that concludes all of the folks who wanted to speak in support of this bill. If I've gotten that wrong, please put your hand up if you're one of the folks in the attendees room. I'm not seeing any hands. So uh, let's give uh, Sheriff Bill King an opportunity to testify against. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Claxton, uh, Representative Meyer, and esteemed members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Bill King, and I'm the Sheriff of York County and also the second Vice President of the Maine Sheriff's Association. Maine Sheriffs discussed this bill at length, and we voted unanimously to oppose LD 1909, an act to remove restrictions on syringe service programs. 636 people lost their lives to drug overdoses in 2021, 
This number reflects an unacceptable increase of 23% over the num number of drug overdoses in 2020. We can and must implement responsible solutions to reverse this trend. Unfortunately, we do not believe LD-1909 is the answer to this crisis. Currently, Maine's beaches, boat landings, and public parks are frequently adorned with discarded syringes. Andrews Garden County Sheriff Sampson has identified that Kennedy Park in Lewiston and um, Bonnie Park in Auburn are typically littered with discarded syringes. York County boat launch in Waterboro is a dumping ground for syringes as is uh, the roadway in Lymington, right by the uh, Little League field. And if you're from Penobscot County, the former YMCA building is where you'll always find syringes carelessly discharged right in downtown Bangor. Christine Washington County reports that Pike Peak, Pike's Peak and Callis, each and every sheriff gave, gave examples of places that are just, um, where they're constantly, people are calling because they're finding uh, needles and syringes. And there's just too many to list, the Kennebec Land Trust, the Peanut Butter Park in Chelsea. There's just a lot. The US Food and Drug Administration warns that infectious diseases and serious health problems can result from the result of exposure to used syringes. They indicate the most common infections are Hep B, Hepatitis C, and HIV. These statements are supported by the Canadian National Center for Biotechnology Information in their study of children exposed to discarded needles. The results of their study is of 66 youth exposures, 75% of which occurred from in public locations where they touched uh, needles. This conclusion summarized that enhanced public health interventions in community settings I needed to reduce childhood risk exposures to needle sticks. Maine sheriffs applaud LD-1909 sponsors for submitting the bill to stem Maine's tragic and alarming increase in overdose deaths. Unfortunately, we believe that ignoring the requirement to return used syringes creates another public health issue that we cannot ignore and we, we urge you to vote no on the passage of LD-1909. We appreciate the opportunity to present here today. I'm available for any questions if you desire. Thank you, Sheriff King. Thank you. I see a question from Representative Zager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for Sheriff uh, King, I, first of all, thank you so much for your, um, your work in, in law enforcement, um, performing a tremendous service to the people of Maine and your county. Um, I no doubt uh, that uh, that um, needle litter is a threat. Uh, you know, it's a potential threat. Um, do you have any data that shows that it increases with a, a needs based exchange? Uh, the CDC has has shared. And this came up in earlier testimony. I've since uh, been able to see the CDC's. Um, uh, reporting, um, th they're citing research that shows that it does not increase um, the, the amount of litter um, to have um, a needs-based approach. Um, do, are, you, are you, is there any data that's collected in the sh by the sheriffs of, of Maine that contradicts that? Dr. Zega, that's an excellent question. And I heard that same, that, uh, th that same testimony. Um, I, the subject is very challenging for me because I, I don't, I don't understand how, if we don't require it, I, I kind of liken it in my own way to um, returnable bottles. If we didn't give people money for returnable bottles, they'd be <clears throat> all over the place. So I, I just wonder, um, what, what, I, what I would submit to you is that we'll do some research to see if there is any, and I'd, I'd like to have the opportunity to present back at the, uh, at the work session but I, I don't have any of that information right now. But logically, it would tell me that if it was needs-based, that there would be, that would increase with the litter. I, I understand what you're, you're hypothesizing there. And I appreciate if you do have more information to offer at, at, the, at the work session, that, that would help, help the committee. Thank you so much, sir. I'd be honored to do that. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions? Representative Javner, you have a couple. 
actually just <laughs> one this time, Senator Claxton. Thank you. Um, Sheriff, are you also opposed to the amendment that has been presented? Now, I, I read the amendment during that. Uh, I think the thing with the amendment is I think it's 1B that just doesn't require the exchange. I, I, I do want to see the used needles be exchanged. I think that's a key thing. And I understand, and again, I learned a lot here. I didn't realize we'd be giving out 100 and that many at a time, and I didn't know it took 30 in one day, but I, I think that there must be some mechanism that when a, a needle is used, that they can put it back in a container or just a jar or something to, to bring it back. I, I think there needs to be some responsibility there. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Stover, did you have your hand up there? Okay. I did, but Representative Jabner just asked the question. Thank you. Very good. All right. I don't see any other questions, and we have uh, one more person to hear, hear from. Katie Schneider is here, neither for nor Pardon. against. Thank you, uh, Sheriff King. I, thank you for having me. Great. Thank you so much for having me here today. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Kate Snyder. I am the mayor of the city of Portland. And on behalf of the Portland City Council's Legislative Committee, I'm testifying today neither for nor against LD 1909, an act to remove restrictions on syringe service programs. The city of Portland recognizes and strongly supports efforts to improve treatment of substance use disorders. And we are grateful for legislators consideration of how this may uh, be effectively tackled at the state level. However, as it is written, we believe LD 1909 may have unintended public health, community safety and fiscal consequences. First, we're concerned that requiring hypodermic apparatus exchange programs to provide clients with as many needles as they request may result in an increase in needle waste in public spaces. Today, even with the current limitations in place, Portland residents regularly encounter needles on the shoreline, in parks, on trails, and on the sidewalks. In 2021, city staff collected a total of 10,602 needles, only about 55% of which were disposed of properly. The remaining 45% or 4,750 needles were found on the ground in public spaces, including parks, playgrounds, sidewalks, trails, on the floor in public restrooms, et cetera. We have strong concerns that this bill as written would add to this already significant total, as well as result in an increase in costs related to staff cleanup and biohazard disposal. Second, we believe that prohibiting staff discretion in the implementation of an important public health program may negatively affect the program's outcomes. City of Portland Public Health staff are highly trained professionals committed to serving their clients with fairness and compassion, and the changes proposed in LD 1909 could hamper their ability to effectively work with and treat their clients. Again, we appreciate legislators' efforts to address this pu pu pressing public health issue. We look forward to working with you to, de to develop alternative solutions and or amendments to L LD 1909, improving community safety and eff effective service delivery while still expanding access to and the capacity of drug treatment programs. Thank you for your consideration and I'd be happy to any, uh, answer any questions that I'm able to. Thank you, Mayor Schneider. Those are some of the first numbers we've heard related to needle recovery. So I appreciate that contribution to this conversation. Are there any other, any questions of Mayor Schneider? I'm not seeing any. So thank you again for taking the time to be here. It's been a long afternoon waiting around. I hope you got something else done during your day. <laughs> <laughs> Some email catch up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Representative Zager, you want to make a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a welcome and uh, appreciation to Mayor Snyder um, and, and the, uh, um, the rest of the council. I know there's been a lot of deliberation, a lot of work uh, to try to uh, protect the health of, of uh, people in the city, uh, people who come to the city from many parts of the state um, and get a lot of services there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. So I think that uh, concludes uh, testimony from anybody who had something to say. If I, if we're wrong, please put your hand up if you're one of the attendees. 
if we've missed you somehow, but it looks to me that most of everybody there has had a chance to say something. So that'll conclude the public health, <laughs> the public hearing portion of consideration of uh, LD 1909 at the end of a long afternoon. And um, now's the time when we can ask our analysts to do some more homework, if uh, we have any. Oh, oh, Representative McConnell, McDonald. Oh, I was just saying goodbye and thank you. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well, thanks for being here through the, through this and taking that feedback. So, Sam, any questions for Sam? Yes, Representative Stover. For the work session, um, I'm not familiar with other New England states and what they're doing around this. So maybe I don't want to look at the whole country, but even if we could look at New England states and see if there's any other precedent um, around syringe exchange. I only know the bubble that I live in, I guess. Representative Javner, what's your one question? <laughs> it's a request this time, Senator oh, Claxton. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, obviously, I think, you know, we need access to the report that um, Director Smith was talking about with the numbers and also data sets, if possible at all, from the other service center towns that Mayor Snyder just shared about Portland. I think that's going to be critical as well. Um, I don't know how to obtain those, but I know our analysts are amazing. See what I can grab. Um. And we've heard reference to a couple different studies on the impact of on-demand and uh, probably better need, uh, needs-based. It'd be nice to have some better sense of what the literature in that arena showed um, to help us make this decision. Sure. Thanks, Sam. All right. I don't see any other questions or comments. So that would conclude our work that I'm aware of for the afternoon, unless Sam says otherwise. And um, yes, Karen, did you have something you wanted to contribute? I did not. Thanks for okay. asking. Them. Okay. So uh, that concludes um, today's activity for the Health and Human Services Committee. We'll be back tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock for a work session and one o'clock for a public hearing. So uh, thank you all for being here and have a good rest of the evening. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn until tomorrow. So moved, seconded, all those in favor, back tomorrow. Take care all. <laughs>